dirt on my shoes I don't mind climbing eight more floors Cause these stairs are all hidden
Danish Institute in Athens is an academic institution with a mission to carry out and promote the study of Greek, archaeology, history, language and culture from ancient times to the present day. As an academic institute, the Finnish Institute at Athens is classified in Greece as an archaeological school. This status allows it to carry out archaeological field work in Greece. Current projects focus on Agia Paraskevi of Arakamitai, Potike, Retimnon, Naxos of Sicily and Melitaya. The institute also provides education. During the autumn, we organize an introductory course on ancient Greek culture for Finnish undergraduate students, traveling with the students for approximately five weeks around the sites of ancient Greece. Courses for teachers are also regularly offered, as well as courses for more advanced students. The Finnish Cultural Institute for the Benelux is based in Brussels. The institute builds bridges between cultural practitioners and institutions in Finland and the Benelux. We foster new creative collaborations and our program is infused with contemporary, sustainable and cross-disciplinary cultural initiatives. We work with artistic projects as well as societal themes aiming for equity, anti-racism and sustainability. Highlights include commissioning a dance performance for the first ever EU Sami Week organized in Brussels and supporting the work of Netherlands-based visual artist Arnold Murphy. In the next year, we will be developing our Masculinities program, bringing the Dutch theatre piece Boys Won't Be Boys to Finland and supporting a permanent sculptural work by a Finnish artist in Belgium. For Together Again, the Institute has collaborated with Pehme Collective, aka The Soft Collective. Their workshop, Safer Spaces for Unhad Conversations, held in Amsterdam in May, is a continuation of their previous work in London. The work, created together with Zulu Green, a black queer rapper, singer and songwriter from Amsterdam, references community caring. Fin Agora, the Finnish Institute in Budapest, works to create and promote connections between Finland and Hungary in the fields of culture, science and economics. The Institute's goal is to strengthen and create connections between Hungary and Finland. This is done by events, seminars, professional collaborations and projects. This year's highlights are the annual Finnish film festival Finn Film Napok and the launch of a new artist residency collaboration. This autumn, Finagora will focus on creating new collaborations with art organizations in Budapest, organizing a workshop on minority languages and facilitating Finnish authors and artists visiting Budapest and being part of festivals and exhibitions. The Finnish Cultural Institute in Denmark is located in Copenhagen. The institute offers Finnish expertise in the fields of contemporary art and performing arts, creating and nurturing dialogue between Finnish and Danish professionals and audiences. All of the institute's projects are executed in collaboration with Finnish and Danish partners. The institute works with cultural exchange through exhibition projects, residency programs and other artistic projects. One of the highlights in the recent years has been a long-term collaboration with the artist Jenna Sotela and a Copenhagen-based artistic platform Primer. This autumn, the Institute will be focusing on our residency programs for visual artists, as well as bringing Danish and international arts and culture professionals to Finland and introducing them to Finnish artists and the local art scene. The Finnish Institute in the UK and Ireland is located in London. The Institute enables progressive personal and societal change through art and culture by enriching and diversifying connections between cultural professionals in Finland, Ireland and the United Kingdom. The Institute runs two programs, Arts and Society. Recent highlights include Finnish Art Prize Below Zero, won by Nastya Sade and a festival celebrating Tuva Jansson's 
queer heritage. This autumn, the Institute focuses on bringing British and Irish arts and culture professionals to study visits in Finland and producing an exhibition in London showcasing underrepresented Finnish artists and designers. For the Together Again project, the Institute worked with the artist Minna Henriksson. Her work focused on the Finnish Writers Association Kiila and its largely forgotten feminist writers from the 1930s. The work was originally shown earlier this year as part of a larger exhibition called Editorial Tables, Reciprocal Hospitalities at the Showroom Gallery in London. The Ibero-American Institute of Finland is Finland's cultural institute working in Spain, Portugal and Latin America. Its main purpose is to promote Finnish culture and arts and dialogue in the areas where Spanish and Portuguese are spoken. The Institute's projects focus on visual arts, architecture and design with a basis on human rights, gender equality and social inclusion. Recent projects include Sofia Arngrud's social art installation in Uruguay with 223 footballs and teenagers, as well as art exploring new AI technologies. The Cultural Center and Art Gallery are in the heart of Madrid in the so-called Literary Quarter. The Institute works closely with local partners partners like festivals, museums and galleries. Like earlier this year, Klaus Harpen and Co's exhibition was held in Spain's National Design Museum. The Institute also collaborates with Nordic and European networks, especially in projects related to literature and film. For the Together Again project, the Ibero-American Institute worked with the Finnish-Nigerian photographer Uwa Idoose in Portugal, Spain and Finland. During his six-week residency in Oporto, Uwa worked with and photographed local children. Through his portraits, Uwa addresses the intersection between dreams, aspirations and community in the growth process of young people. Uwa's works were exhibited in Oporto, Madrid and now are in Helsinki. The Finnish Cultural Institute in New York is located in New York City in the United States. The Institute worked across the fields of contemporary art, design and architecture, creating dialogue between Finnish and American professionals and audiences. The Finnish Cultural Institute in New York organizes residency programs, projects and events that foster critical dialogue. Recent highlights include supporting EU Sosilaya's solo exhibition at MoMA PSI 1 and the program Exercises in Togetherness, showcasing Finnish and American artists' work through notions of care and intimacy. This year, the Institute collaborates with the renowned Performa Biennial in realizing a Finnish Pavilion Without Walls program, which presents several new commissions by Finland-based artists working in the intersections of visual and performative arts. For Together Again, the Finnish Cultural Institute in New York has commissioned a work in the form of a public seminar and a video piece by visual artist Matti Aikio in collaboration with Vera List Center for Art and Politics and Frame Contemporary Art Finland. Aikio's work explores intersections of modern Western society and indigenous cultures, the Sami culture in particular. The Finnish Norwegian Cultural Institute promotes cultural exchange between Finland and Norway. Our aim is to strengthen cooperation, dialogue and mobility between professional art and cultural practitioners. The Institute is based in Oslo but has activities throughout Norway. Currently, the Institute runs the program Nord, Cultural Bridges. The objective is to strengthen networks and activities between cultural practitioners in northern Norway, northern Finland and Sami. This includes collaboration with Hiljaisus Festivali at the multidisciplinary festival Festspielen in Nord Norge and community arts project Vadsø Megacity. This autumn the institute focuses on bringing Finnish artists to residences in Norway. In September, a performing arts group will attend a residency in Dabli, Center for Performing Arts in Hammerfest, in collaboration with Svenska Kulturfonden. For the Together Again project, the Institute commissioned a third season of a podcast, The Middle Eastern Blog, produced and directed by the Post Theatre Collective. The podcast reflects on the global pandemic through the eyes of people belonging to cultural and linguistic minorities. Writers for the new season are Norway-based Nelly Winterhalden and Finland-based Louis Arvas. The Finnish Institute in France is an independent and multidisciplinary platform between Finland and France. 
In collaboration with different international institutions, academia and creators, the Institute engages actively with critical discourse through its on-site and off-site programming. In the most recent exhibition, called Imagine Every Day, Outsider Art Finland, the Institute presented a group of outsider artists exhibiting for the first time in Paris. Since 2022, the Institute also showcases Finnish gastronomy in the heart of Paris by offering a program of culinary events at the Café Ma. This autumn, the Institute's gallery has the honor of presenting the creations of an exceptional duo of designers, Yushlin Maumua. The Institute continues its collaboration with Art University by organizing a showroom during Paris Fashion Weeks. For the Together Again project, the Institute continues to work with the artist Arbon Ikkonen, whose project looks at the ecological issues of garment production. Arbon Ikkonen worked with Lea Dominguez in a multidisciplinary project where they delve into the challenges of the fashion industry through discussions, workshops and artworks. The project's first forum, called Have Need, was held in Paris in June. The Finnish Institute in Estonia maintains, develops and strengthens Finnish-Estonian cultural cooperation in different fields of art, education and society. The Institute also keeps track of the societal developments in Estonia and participates in it through its programs. Recent highlights include Elina Simonen's exhibition From Word to Image, which combines poetry, fashion design and photography. The exhibition was shown in eight different places in Estonia, Latvia and Finland. We also work on establishing the Finnish timeout Eratauko method developed to advance more constructive dialogues. This autumn we are excited to tell you about our new Erasmus Plus project which aims to give a chance for the youth of Helsinki and Tallinn to wrap together in workshops organized by two suburban youth centers. The Finnish Institute in Japan, located in Tokyo, promotes Finnish science, culture and higher education and the collaboration of these fields between Finland and Japan. The Institute identifies cooperation needs and opportunities and helps potential partners to find each other. The program consists of seminars and lectures, exhibitions and residences, just to name a few. The Institute's current research project compares Japanese Sansu and Finnish artists' homes. And in May, we held the 150th anniversary exhibition of Vivi Learn, one of Finland's first female architects, both in collaboration with Waseda University. In the autumn, the Finnish Institute in Japan continues with the ongoing series of AI seminars and is co-organizing a large-scale exhibition of a prominent Finnish ceramic artist. Autumn is also the time for the traditional Finnish-Swedish week. Hello, Tokyo!
Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to this moment of being together again. And welcome to the Central Library audience, uh, Central Library Audi, dear audience, and welcome also all of you joining us online. We really do appreciate that you've taken the time to be part of this day that is very important to us and hopefully important to all of you. May I even say that it might be a historical day of coming together with arts and creativity, different kind of identities and also different cultures and countries coming together. While I was preparing for the moment, um, I realized that I'm a bit nervous, feeling a bit shaky and my hands are a little bit sweaty and my throat feels like a little bit of stuck. I'm a performer and I'm used to performing, but I'm also a person that's very sensitive to different kind of moments and very easily I still get nervous. I've been going around in schools for many years meeting students and I feel this need to tell them that I'm still very nervous many times even though I am a professional performer. And how I try to explain it to them is that usually I think maybe we should not look at us being nervous that it's a mistake in us or some kind of a fault that we should get rid of but maybe it's actually a sign telling us that we are part of something meaningful to us, something that we want to be part of or where we want to succeed or room that used to be far away from us, but now we actually get to be part of the room and the moment and the conversation. So if there's anybody in the audience or any of the talkers or artists feeling nervous, so maybe this might even help you. Uh, my name is Jani Toivola, and it's great honor to serve as the host today. Uh, it feels very important also, on a personal note, being an artist, a uh, writer, and an actor. And if I think about the theme of the day, it also feels very meaningful, personally. Because for me, that period of time when the world was closing in, and we were separated from each other, I was also by myself in my own apartment, going through a very big transition, personally. I had just left politics after eight years, serving as a first black MP in the Finnish parliament, being by myself in my own apartment and trying to remember who I was as an artist before becoming a politician. And why did I want to be an artist? Or what kind of artist would I like to be in the future? Who was that artist? How did he talk? What did he want to say? How did he want to create? Or what kind of words did he want to use? Or how did he move his body? So somehow I feel like this moment is a continuation of that journey that has brought me also here today. And I think maybe all of you also in the audience and online have similar kind of stories that you can somehow maybe connect to also this moment of coming together again. And at the same time, hopefully looking uh, far away into the future and all the things that we can do as a community of artists and creative people. So one more time, welcome. Maybe we should give like a big round of applause for the moment. Um, we have a very full program today, so, so I, will be, I, I will try to be very quick with all the details and information so we can get to the speakers and conversations and presentations. But few details before that. So Together Again is a two-year-long project built together with six Finnish cultural institutes and more than 15 uh, artists. At the heart of the project has been the exploration of a new post-pandemic togetherness. The Finnish Cultural and Academic Institute Network has been pondering on what coming together now means in the midst of all these crises and big changes. How can we come together now and at what cost? We want to welcome you all to think, discuss and share your visions of togetherness of today and also tom tomorrow. Together Again is organized by the Finnish Cult Cultural Institute for the Benelux, the Finnish Institute in the UK and Ireland, Finnish Cultural Institute in Madrid, the Finnish Cultural Institute in New York, the Finnish Norwegian Cultural Institute and Institute Finlandes. The project is supported by the Finnish Institute in Germany, <laughs> the Finnish Institute in Japan and the Finnish Cultural and Academic Institutes. The program takes place in collaboration with Biennale 23, Fotografia do Porto, Foto Espana, Frame Contemporary Art Finland, The Showroom, Vera Lis Center for Art and Politics, Helsinki Central Library Audi, Ricardinkatu Library and the Embassy of Portugal in Finland.
Together Again is made possible thanks to the art grant of the Finnish Cultural Foundation and supported by the Jenni and Antti Vihuri Foundation. Maybe a round of applause for all these collaborators. And on a more practical note, please uh, familiar, familiarize yourself with our safe space guidelines. You can find them. We should have some posters here, so you can find the guidelines there, but you can also find the same guidelines online. And please approach our safer space support persons regarding any harassment, bullying, or otherwise belittling behavior. And all the personnel should be wearing some kind of a badge. Maybe you can wave your hand. So these are all people that you can approach today if you, if you feel the need for that. And please, please do if, if, if there's anything going on. You can also give anonymous feedback to the organizers via our online. Uh, you can use the QR, QR code that you can also find in the poster. So using the QR code, you can also give anonymous feedback, whatever it is. Live captioning is in English and will be available on our live stream, which is available to watch at togetheragain.fi. A uh, reminder that our online audiences can send some comments and questions via Instagram at togetheragain2023 using the question box in the stories. Or you can also use WhatsApp and the number is plus three four six six seven. 609244. I feel like a lottery or something going on. <laughs> so I think that's all the practicalities for now. If I forgot something, I will, I will get back to it uh, later. Like I said, we have a full program of talks, discussions, presentations, keynote speeches. Um, so let's enjoy the program and the day. And now it's my great honor to welcome on stage to give the opening, uh, opening speech Uh, Susanna Pettersson, the CEO of the Finnish Cultural Foundation. Please welcome on stage. Thanks, Jani. And thanks for the beautiful words. You talked about the journey. And I thought that before I start my opening speech, I would say some words about my journey. Why am I standing here today? Um, Today I'm here as CEO of Finnish Culture Foundation, but I'm actually really, really new in this particular role. I started only in June. Before that, I worked as a museum director in Stockholm, in Helsinki. At some point I was a director of the Finnish Institute in London, and much more. So I've been looking at the scene of arts and culture and sciences from many, many perspectives. And therefore, I'm more than glad to share this moment with you today, because I, I know what it takes to make this project happen. And I thought that I would actually, I would begin with um, an experience from Rovaniemi, from where I came back to Helsinki yesterday. I was there to meet the local, local professionals related to arts and culture, and I was there to talk, to innovate, to imagine the futures. In the evening, I had a discussion with the local uh, professional who is uh, experienced in hosting tourists traveling to Lapland. And I heard that many of them are actually afraid of dark and afraid of being alone. And because of this, he asked me that, are you okay to walk alone to your cottage after the dinner? It was like nine o'clock in the evening and I started laughing. I said, yes, of course I, I can walk alone to the cottage. And he said that you, you have to understand that not everybody feels the same. And that was the, the thought that I, I thought that I would bring to this moment, that even though that we think that we know each other, that we know each other's cultures, behaviors, patterns, wishes, uh, whatever it takes, we don't actually know. Some of us might enjoy the silence and the darkness, and some of us 
might be afraid of it. And this small example from a daily conversation, it's all about encounters. It's about being open to be able to listen to the others and getting together like today, today means just those encounters, but it also, also means clashes and risk taking between us and between different cultures. To foster these encounters, the ideas, I think that's the, the most important thing that the culture and science institutes all around the world can do, together with all the other stakeholders. Um, for Finland, the structure is very unique because, as you might well know, all the institutes, institutes are independent, making them very agile, quick, and also they are able to use their strong voices in a very different way than, for instance, let's say, British Council can. And that is a strength that has to be used uh, in the best potential way. Um, then, when thinking about, let's say, the future of the Finnish institutes all across the world, what should be done to make the network stronger? Definitely to plan ahead. Uh, we talked earlier this morning about the necessity that the government should be granting the funding, not, for, not just for one year at the time, but for a longer period, like three years minimum. That's one thing. Another thing is that we should all uh, be brave and even bold in order to present big ideas. Because that's the way to go forward. And as uh, a new CEO of the Finnish Culture Foundation, I'm of course very, very curious concerning all the, all the bold ideas. I actually, I wrote a script, so I'm so sorry that I'm actually doing something completely else what I, <laughs> I sent to you. Um, the thing I, I plan to say, and I'm going to say, is related to building bridges. The bridges between institutions, between bridges between individuals, and those bridges are definitely needed in our polarized societies, where people do drift apart to their own bubbles. And art and culture, as I see that, is vital for us and our societies. My academic background is in, in the 19th century. And when I was uh, researching that, it was so clear, crystal clear, that Finland at the, as a nation at the time understood the value of culture in the society. Culture was the superpower that created the backbone for the nation. And I think that is something that we should all remember, even today. And art and culture, from today's perspective, they create a very valuable platform where even the trickiest topics can be discussed safely. And during the course of the day, you will be able to dive into the discussions from the respect, respect, respective groups. I encourage you to listen carefully every single discussion and please make note of all those great ideas that you will get once listening to the others and take them forward, either with your friends, your colleagues, and build projects, approach different funders, 
such as Finnish Culture Foundation, such as Jenny and the Fihuri Foundation, and many others, Svenska Kulturfonden, because we are all here for you and the future ideas. So best of luck. And then I, I, I will finish my little talk by also encouraging that you that talk to the ones that you don't know in the audience, because that's also the best way to ensure that there will be new beginnings. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna Peterson, for these beautiful and wise words. You, in the beginning, you were talking about the darkness and how do we approach it differently. And I had a similar discussion um, last night with my nine-year-old daughter at home when I was taking her to bed. And she was asking me like five times that how long are you still going to be awake after I go to sleep? And I was wondering, like, what is this? Why is she now so interested? Like, how many breads am I going to eat? And do I take a shower? And what's going on? But then she said that, no, I need you to be awake until I fall asleep. Because then when I'm asleep, I'm not afraid of the dark anymore. But before that, I am and I need somebody to be awake. <laughs> so that was our discussion about darkness. But yeah, thank you for this opening speech. Uh, let's move on. Now it's my great privilege to welcome on stage from the Ministry of Education and Culture, welcome Rita Heinemann. Uh, thank you, Susan, also on my behalf for the very wise words. It was really lovely to listen to, to your uh, experiences and what you had to say. But uh, dear audience, uh, on the behalf of the Minister of Education and Culture, I would like to thank the Finnish uh, Cultural and Academic Institutes and all those who participate in the organizing of the Together Again Arts Festival. Working in networks sets its own challenges, but the result as a whole can be very interesting and rewarding, as we will soon see and hear. I'm very glad that this festival is open for all and free for all, and I am also very glad that it's located here in Audi and, it's, and that it's possible to follow also in distance. Accessibility is an important issue in which uh, the Ministry pays a lot of attention. So again, warm thanks to all the organizers and all the artists. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rita Heinama. And uh, to give our third uh, opening speech, speech, welcome on stage, the director of the Finnish Institute in the UK and Ireland. Um, I think we're going to also hear a few words about the Together Again project. So please welcome on stage, Jaakko Nousianen. Good morning, everyone. Um, it is my job to talk about the uh, initial beginnings of this project, the initial spark and reason. And that reason, as we know, is very, very small. Indeed, it's microscopically small. We will soon enter into the fourth year of our new reality of living together with the uh, COVID-19 coronavirus. Many of us have lost someone to the virus and all of us have been affected by it in one way or another. And the pandemic, it stretched our ability uh, to adapt to new things and new situations. And that, of course, happened to the network, the global network of the Finnish academic and cultural institutes as well. Still, throughout all of this, our uh, mission um, remained unchanged. Our job is to advance uh, international mobility and the visibility and collaboration of Finnish professionals in the arts, culture and science in our all respective countries and areas. And that's what we kept doing all through the pandemic. At the start, our uh, greatest concern was to help those who were hit hardest, artists and especially those who were the most vulnerable 
uh, in that group, the self-employed freelancers whose livelihoods were swept away in an instant. There was an urgency to act really quickly. Uh, and so quite soon after uh, all the borders were closed, um, in March 2020, the institutes published an open call for collaborative art projects, seeking artistic, pro artistic proposals related to this new state of emergency, the radical change it caused, and the resilience it brought out, out in all of us. This call was open to all Finnish and Finland-based uh, professional artists and their international collaborators who had lost uh, their work opportunities due to the pandemic. And when we started this project, we had no idea that we would be working on it basically until now. As the pandemic continued, uh, the need for the project expanded and all in all, we arranged three different rounds of artistic commissions. And today, marks the end of this long road. And the body of work created over these three iterations, uh, it has traced and documented what can easily be said is the biggest social upheaval of our time. The project has given its participant art, or, or the participating artists an opportunity to reflect this global shift through their own practice. And then for the Institute Network, this has been a time to learn and grow as well. We've listened to the feedback we've received from the artist, and we have adjusted, we've had to adjust our own way of thinking too. Being more inclusive and more accessible is a constant learning process in our, let's say it, predominantly white and able-bodied institute network. Uh, so we have had workshops and trainings on anti-racist and non-discriminatory practices within the cultural sphere, as well as inclusive communication strategies and accessibility. Then the pandemic also gave us an opportunity to think about other pertinent issues like the effect of the uh, climate crisis in our sector. And we have begun to redefine the future of mobility in a more sustainable manner. And now we're taking all these learnings with us as we move into the post-pandemic future. Whatever it will be, we will see. So on behalf of the Cultural and Academic uh, Institutes Network, I want to thank um, all our participating artists, all our collaborators and other partners, as well as, of course, the funders. Uh, between 2020 and 2023, they have been the Finnish Cultural Foundation, the Swedish Cultura Cultural Foundation in Finland, Jenny and Antti Viuri Foundation, and of course also the Ministry of Education and Culture. Without all of you coming together, none of this would have been possible. So today is all about the artists who have trusted us, their creativity. And today we celebrate their resilience, their artistic practices, all the communities they work in, and the impact that their work has created and continues to create. I wish you an inspirational day. Thank you. Thank you, Jaakko. And like Jaakko was saying, the whole day is about artists. So now, dear audience, it's time for some art and artisti artistic presentation. Um, we will see a screening of an interview with uh, Uva Idoze about his work, Not Yet, But I Like Painting. Idoze's project, Not Yet, But I Like Painting, was developed during a six-week residency at the Cerco neighborhood in Porto, pairing portraiture with Google Translate conversations he had with the youth of Cerco. This project explores spaces of dreaming, imagination and community, and the ways in which they intersect with the concept of growing up in an environment of economic and social precarity. So please enjoy uh, the interview. Here we go. 
Mä pyydettiin residenssi Portoon, Portugalissa. Mä olin kuusi viikkoa sellaisessa naapurustosta, minkä nimi on Bairro de Cerco, mikä on siinä niinku kaupungin laitamilla. Se on semmoinen aa, aika pitkälti niinku kaupungin vuokra-asuntopainotteinen aa, naapurusto siinä niinku laitamilla. Ja sitten pyydettiin kehittää siellä jonkinlainen projekti, siellä on sellainen iltapäiväkirjo, niin on siellä kaarte. Ja sitten mä niinku heidän kanssa yhteistyössä kuvasin paljon naapuruston lapsia ja nuoria ja sitten niinku tutkin mun projektilla vähän niinku sitä, että millaisia unelmia nämä nuorilla on, miten he suhtautuu itsensä, miten ne näkee itsensä suhteessa tähän ympäröivään yhteiskuntaan ja sitten miten nämä niinku linkittyy siihen kasvukokemukseen ja niinku sellaiseen aikuistumisen prosessiin. Tämä projektin nimi on siis suora lainaus yhdestä Google Translate-keskustelusta. Me keskusteltiin niin kuin yhden lapsen kanssa hänen tulevaisuuden haaveistaan ja siitä, mitä hän tykkää tehdä, mitä hän haluaa ja yleisesti vaan kaikesta hänen elämässään. Ja sitten tämä oli niin tämä lause, siis käännettynä englanniksi, not yet, but I like painting, niin sitten niin tuli tässä. Monet niin sanoivat mulle, että nämä lapset täällä naapurustossa joutuu aikuistumaan nopeammin kuin heidän ikäluokkansa muualla Portugalissa ja muualla Portossa, ja että he ei unelmoi. Ja tämä oli niin sellainen asia, mitä toistettiin tosi paljon silloin, kun mä sinne saavuin. Siis se tietenkin niin herätti mun mielenkiinnon, että mitä se tarkoittaa, että niin kuin lapsi ei unelmoi missä vaiheessa. Sä niin kuin lopettaisit unelmoin, ja tietenkin se totuus on se, että totta kai niin kaikilla lapsilla on unelmia, mutta sitten se Aa, niin se on suhteessa siihen, että mitä se ympäröivä yhteiskunta sulle sanoo sinusta itsestäsi. Ja tosi usein mä nyt törmäsin siellä näiden porto- muiden ei-sirkossa asuvien portolaisten kanssa keskustellessa semmoisiin niin tosi negatiivisiin stereotyyppeihin ja aina niin kuin yksulotteisiin näkemyksiin siitä, että millaisia ihmiset sirkossa on. Ja totta kai sit nämä asiat on sellaisia, jotka vaikuttaa siihen, koska myös nämä lapset kuulee niitä. He tietää, miten heistä ajatellaan muualla. Ja tietenkin ne vaikuttaa siihen, että miten sä näet itsesi, miten sä näet sun potentiaali, miten sä näet sun mahdollisuudet siinä ympäröivässä yhteiskunnassa, koska sulla kerrotaan tietyllä tapaa, että sä oot vähemmän kuin tai että sä et ole tervetullut. Niin nämä olivat sellaisia niin asioita, mitä mä olisin kiinnosti ja lasten kautta se oli niin jotenkin kiva lähteä sitä tutkimaan. Tämä projektihan oli yhteistyössä tämän niin iltapäiväkerhon kanssa, jossa siis nämä lapset, jotka tässä niin kuin, näyttelyssä esillä olevissa kuvissa, niin kävi. Ja mähän vietin siellä tosi paljon aikaa. Et, et koska mulla oli sitä yhteistä kieltä, niin mä sitten päätin, että et mä niin korvaan se tämmöisen intensiivisen läsnäolon. Mä kävin siellä joka päivä ja mä niin kuin, vietin kameran pois. Mä halusin niin kuin, tutustua näihin lapsiin ja niin kuin, heidän vanhemmat sitten, kun tulit sinne käymään hakemaan niitä, niin mä sitten tietyllä tapaa niin loin näitä suhteita ja niin luottamusta. Tämän, tämän, näiden lasten ja sitten sen heidän yhteisönsä kanssa. Ja sitten tietenkin sitä kautta, että aa, mä sitten tutustuin näihin vanhempiin myös, niin sain sitten kuvata, kuvata heidän lapsiaan, tulla heidän kotiinsa tekemään niin tällaisia potreettisessioita, joka oli niin kuin, ainoastaan mahdollista, koska mulla oli ympärillä se, se niin kuin verkosto, joka auttoi mua toteuttaa tätä. Koska mulla ei ollut sitä yhteistä kieltä, niin aa, se oli tietyllä tapaa niin kuin sellainen asia, joka niin hankaloitti tätä projektia aika paljon ja muutti sitä tapaa, miten mä työskentelin ja hidasti aika paljon niin kuin sitä, sitä keskustelua, jota mä kävin ihmisten kanssa, koska siinä oli sellaista tiettyä turhautumista siihen, että sä et voi välittää informaatioista nopeasti, kun sä ehkä oot tottunut välittämään varsinkin lasten, niin kuin kesku, lasten suhteen, kun tietyllä tapaa sun pitää niin kuin istua alas. Ja niin kuin, et, et mä en ehkä ymmärrä kaikkea, mitä sä yrität mulle kertoa, ja sitten kun sä kiertää sen ylös, niin siitä puuttuu paljon asioita. Ja tää oli niinku yksi syy myös siihen, että mä palataan siihen, että et minkä takia tää näyttely nimi, ja minkä takia mä halusin nimenomaan valita sen sellaisesta niin Google Translate-keskustelusta, oli just tää, että mä halusin niinku tiedostaa sen, että miten, niinku, miten mä ulkopuolisena kuitenkin olin tässä yhteisössä, miten mun puuttu sellainen niin kulttuurinen ymmärrys ja kieli, Siinä. Ja sitten miten se vaikuttaa siihen, että miten mä tulkitsen näitä näiden lasten unelmia ja niin kun, a, miten niin kun, jos valokuvaus yleensäkin on tosi niin kun, monitulkintainen ja tulkinnanvarainen medium, niin miten se sit lisää sitä suurta niin teknologinen väliporras siinä, joka niin kun, muovaa jo, jo itsessään sitä kanssakäymistä. Et, niin kun, se oli mulle jotenkin tärkeä asia tuoda, tuoda esille. Ja myös niin kun, se menee tällaiselle alueelle, joka on Uh, niin kun, siellä esiintyy paljon köyhyyttä ja siihen liittyy paljon niin lieveilmiöitä. 
Joten ja mä oon tosi tietoinen siitä, että mikä on se valokuvaamisen kolonialistinen historia suhteessa siihen, että ulkopuolinen ihminen tulee johonkin tilaan kuvaamaan ihmisiä ja tietysti välittää jotain hänen tulkintaansa niin kuin totuutena tästä. Ja siihen liittyy siinä paljon niin kuin negatiivisia vaikutuksia, on tosi, tosi monen niin kuin yhteisen ihmisen uh, niin kuin ihmiskuvaan ja arvomaailmaan ja miten tapaa, miten ne hahmottaa maailmaa, joten sitten haluaisin tietyllä tapaa ymmärtää sen mun vastuun myöskin siinä, että kun mä en ymmärrä tätä kontekstia, mä en, mä en niin ole kasvanut tässä ympäristössä, että mun on vastuu ottaa mahdollisimman paljon selvää siitä, mitä tämä on, ja samalla tiedostaa se, että vaikka kuinka paljon ottaisin selvää, niin se mun tulkinta tulee aina olemaan vajavainen. Että mä en tule ikinä ymmärtämään sitä täysin. Että mä voin ainoastaan tarjota jonkun mun oman tulkinnan siitä, että miten mä näin heidät, ja niin kuin mitä mä halusin siltä viestiä. And I still want to mention that Uva Iduose's commission for Together Again is realized in collaboration with the Finnish Cultural Institute in Madrid. And there is still an opportunity to see the exhibition here in Helsinki at the Embassy of Portugal during the festival and later in September also at Europa Sali, the Europe Hall. So please do take advantage of those opportunities. And now, dear audience, it's uh, time for our first talk, Making Art with and Through Communities. The talk focuses on the process, processes of making art with and as part of communities, presenting projects created as part of Together Again. And the discussion will be led by Julian Ousu, and the speakers joining him are Luis Armas and Nelly Winterhalder from the Post Theatre Collective, Kiheba Endale, and Armando Tranquile from Kairos Collective, Aapo Nikkanen and Lea Dominix. Please, speakers and moderator, welcome on stage. Welcome everyone on my behalf as well. My name is uh, Juliano Wusu. Thank you. I am a Olu-based dance artist and I will be moderating this panel today. I am very grateful for these artists that I get to share this space with. Um, I want to mention before we start that it is really amazing listening to the list of <coughs> collaborators that have come together to make this possible. Literally coming together and bringing us together. Would you like to do a short introduction and share who you are? Mm -hmm. You can start. I can start? Yes. All right. Um, I am Lois Armas. Um, I work together with, with Nelly in a podcast that we co-wrote. I am a writer and I work with community <coughs> building writing projects now for a few years. Thank you. My name is Nelly Winterhalder. I am a Norway-based playwright and director and collaborated with the Lois um, by the Post Theatre Collective on the podcast. Yes, my name is Armando Tranquil. I work with Alex in Kairos Collective. I'm quite newly joined, but it's been very exciting. My background is in graphic design originally. Uh, hi, my name is Alex and uh, Kiwa Andala is my artist name. Uh, I mostly do like painting and poetry, and I uh, also started this uh, Gairos uh, project, which is now turning into a collective. Hi, I'm Aapo Nikkanen. I'm a Paris-based multidisciplinary artist, and um, we initiated uh, the What Do We Have, What Do We Need project with uh, Lea Dominguez. Uh, which is uh, mostly based on research, and through this research uh, we produced workshops, a uh, public forum that's interdisciplinary, and also artworks. Hello, uh, so my name is Lea Dominguez. I have a background in fashion design, and I've been working for brands that are mostly independent and emerging, as for example, Faustin Steinmetz uh, or Marine Serre. And actually, after pandemic, I wanted to work as a freelancer, and I'm now splitting my time with research projects, 
uh, fashion still and uh, also education in fashion school and uh, high schools or kids sometimes. And our fever pop. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. As you all hear, we have a very broad variety of different art forms, different ways of working, working together, and also different geographic locations. Um, just as an initial question, I found it very intriguing when we had a very short Zoom discussion to get to know each other that you all have very different perspectives and you have approached your work very differently on a very concrete level because, for example, visual arts and writing and fashion do not work with the same logic. Would you like to share some, some approaches that you have, you have used to get into your work with, with your couplings? Would you like to start? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, writing is usually a quite solitary um, business, so um, it's very unfamiliar <coughs> to be on a stage. <laughs> and uh, usually I'm not co-writing as well. Mm -hmm. um, so um, when we first met on Zoom in the beginning of this year, um, we had to figure out some principles how we could um, create a story together, which both... Um, is um, um, giving space for the artistic voice of each other and the writing process of each other, which could be different, and creating at the same time something <coughs> which uh, is coherent and interesting from different perspectives from more people than the two of us. <laughs> mm. Yeah. So um, I think we started at a point with uh, some safe space rules very similar to the guidelines for the festival about active listening and respecting each other and um, creating a safe space for bad ideas. Yeah, mm. <laughs> we were very explicit about that. Uh, bad ideas are welcome and we're not going to show what we're writing to the person who has commissioned it until we feel sure enough that we are at a good place so we can just be free to, to create. Um, yeah. It was really special to just uh, meet on Zoom during all this um, creative process because I used to work with a lot of actors and directors um, writing plays, but always meeting in person. Mm -hmm. um, so this was really special. Yeah. And mm -hmm. um, we just met in person here like half an hour ago. I was almost <laughs> crying <laughs> <laughs> because I know her, but I don't know her. Yeah, <laughs> same feeling. Yeah. But it became intimate quite quickly. Like we would then discuss, like, ah, how was your morning? Ah, oh, I'm tired today. So, <laughs> you know, um, it's been quite quite a special journey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's also interesting with with working online how you sort of are very distant, but then you're also very close because you're literally in each other's homes. Yeah. So it, beca it becomes a very new kind of relationship that we haven't really known until recent years. True that. Yeah. Would you like to share as well some of your process? Mm. <laughs> maybe I can start if you want to fill in or something. But uh, maybe I'll start by explaining like the name of Kairos. If anyone is from Greece, I know I'm pronouncing it very wrong. <laughs> 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 maybe you can help out with the... Keros. Um, so yeah... Mm -hmm. So, Keros. Keros. Okay, so Keros. <laughs> um, basically, I read online that this, um, the meaning of this word means this perfect, delicate rightness of time and circumstance so that certain actions and movements can happen. And I felt like while I'm like creating these spaces, I feel like I can't control all the things that happen or that people feel good or like things get like expressed and stuff but I can just like make the initial conditions mm. so that was like my approach towards like when I make the workshops or um, the open mics and now also exhibitions um, and the reason why I like started it in the beginning was because I had just started spoken word before the corona happened and I felt like during that 
uh, process of using my voice, I found so much freedom, and I had this like feeling of like a farmer that has a really good harvest, and you just want to give some bread into the river or like to the rest of the village. And I just wanted to like share poetry with everyone around me, basically, and that's how it started. And now it's just developed into a different form. And yeah, the end. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you yeah, I mean, um, yeah, there's what's been really interesting about working uh, with you and like in general in a collective is this idea quite similarly of accepting mistakes, encouraging a space that is safe, that is open, that is like where you're able to actually say something and not worry too much. It's accepting, it's nice. It's how it should be when you're mm. creating something, which I really appreciate. Yeah. Mm. Thank nice. you. Yeah. Shall I go first? Yeah, go. Um, I guess what uh, join, joins us together with Lea is that we both approach art and design or fashion design um, more as uh, social and political tools, meaning that... Um, I don't really see the difference in a way. Maybe there's an aesthetic difference. But if the conceptual starting boys point is similar, then we both just have a little bit different tools that we use together. And for example, um, we organize as a part of the project a forum, um, which was a series of uh, discussions and debates and also uh, performances. And while the maybe the aesthetic results would have been a bit different had we done it alone. I think that the idea that underlines it is, is, would be still very much the same. So I think in our case, the, the, it's the approach that actually joins us and doesn't separate us. Mm -mm. Yeah, and as uh, you were saying, to also accept what comes, and I think that's something um, uh, in a personal journey I've also learned through work, uh, not really in design, but because I also do sourcing, is like to see what's around and see what you can do do with it. Um, so yeah, just to work with an existing pre-material. And I guess the forum is not, even if we don't talk about a tangible material, it's like the content too, and like mm -hmm. the discussion that happens. So kind of like articulate it, but let it free as well. And uh, yeah, be there more to put things in a certain way. So it's... Um, shared then. Mm. Yeah, thank you. I find it very interesting how, how in all these discussions, uh, community comes up in very different ways when you think about the space that you're holding or take participating in. I imagine that a space like Keros, <laughs> hope I got it right, <laughs> a, space like, a space like that where you actively create the space Whereas, for example, uh, in your case, where it's more of um, joining a space or creating for a space, so then it become the the approach is very different. Um, how do you see community building through your practices, and how do you see like um, the social aspect of the art that you do? Since you've been working together, and that is social, but it's also been linked into broader communities around you. How do you, for example, understand fashion as a social or, as you said, a political movement? Mm, do you want to go? Or is it yeah, I can. Um, um, so fashion is really, really big in France. And a lot of people work for fashion. And um, I personally also experienced uh, working in a company. Mm. And uh, soon we also realize that uh, people are together in a space, but they don't really like can work together or like they don't really know each other in a deep level there. So it's like being in the space, but it's maybe not like being part of something together. Mm -hmm. um, and also in between the companies, actually, there's like uh, they don't really connect for a purpose. So, yeah, that's uh, one thing. And then on our on the case of the project, like fa fashion can be really um, social because it touches so many uh, workers as well and like so many uh, different people. So it's, and the construction of 
identity as well. So it's like so full and there's like a lot of stories. So I guess it was more about listening also to these mm. people. That was our first focus. We <laughs> interviewed the people working there and then we it extends from it. Mm. And there are personalities different and they have their own sensibilities too. And by listening to it, we could see that the common points started to come together. Yeah, um, I, I guess we are a bit very, or, or we're, we don't, we're a bit careful of using the word community because it's so tainted in, in the industry. As, <coughs> as Lea said, it's one of the biggest industries in France and as such is also very political. And um, our approach was to do interviews to research. And when we decided to do this communal e event, that was clearly needed by by all the people we spoke to. They all voiced one single thing, which was to it would be great to have a critical platform to discuss about these things. We deliberately chose to to do a forum because that also includes debate and that includes that we um, everyone can have their own opinion and they don't need to agree. And, but they will be listened and they will be heard. And this also creates uh, that kind of critical discussion that um, we felt is really missing from Paris and France. <laughs> so maybe our approach was uh, a bit different to it, but uh, mm. that's it. Yeah, that sounds very interesting. Um, I'd like to latch on to what you said about community and identity that very often identifying with a community seems to be a prerequisite. Not necessarily always, but often is to become a part of a community. I'm very intrigued in how it is with writing, since you are literally uh, writing realities into existence, um, yeah. where, where you are reproducing, but you are also producing realities, producing something that people can identi identify with. And also... Um I think that when it comes to writing, writing is not only, as Nelly said, uh, thought that very lonely, like mm -hmm. a very lonely practice. It's also terribly paid. But uh, writing is um, literature in general. I feel that is, is is a sort of it's very intimidating in the sense that it's perceived as as needing to have a vocabulary or an academic background in order to belong. Mm. to that literature reality in order to produce writing it it's very intimidating mm. so so when you think about community building in writing um, it is uh it is something that that you need to work on to make it or at least i do it in my practice to make it as accessible as possible as friendly as possible mm. because the reason behind that community building is that is not true. Anyone mm. can write. Everyone should write. And writing can be done in community. And writing can be healing if done in a group. Mm. So I'm going to tone it down and I'm going to make it as friendly as possible so no one believes that there needs to be a prerequisite in order to write, in order mm. to belong to that community. And a concrete example of that for me is the way I use language when creating this community. Like, how do I talk about safe space or safer space guidelines in the community, in the writing group. How do I talk about the concept of the group? I, mm. I have to make it as friendly as possible. I have to make it as open as possible. I cannot say mm, we are unpacking the colonialist beliefs that we have all, because then no one comes, mm. not because they don't understand, but because it feeds that intimidating belief mm. of having to have words, proper words, when mm. that's the furthest from the truth. So that's really beautiful. <laughs> mm. Yes. <laughs> we can give a round of applause. That is honestly very inspiring how, how one can approach language from literally from the point of view of who, of who they're speaking and not only from the point of view of the message. Um, I link this a bit to what you said about um, when you started doing spoken word that you had the need to share it and in order to do that you created a space um creating a space and holding space is not always very easy and not always very um it adds on it adds on to the to the labor 
and to the emotional labor of taking care of people who are in this space. Would you like to share something about, a little about mm. holding space and creating such spaces within, right. um, in relation to, for example, all the institutions that we're working with today? And that's not a very simple task. Mm. Yeah, uh, maybe I'll just really quickly add on to like things that uh, everyone Please else do. said because I was thinking how you said you don't try, try not to use the word community and I feel like I've also had this approach that I try to use like the words like communal experiences because uh, when you think, for me, like the idea of trying to build a community, it was like thinking like what does that look like? What is what would need to be upheld to like like so that people know what to expect but then if it's a communal experience then the red thread is just that we're here together and we create this like we also have these like mindful space guidelines and just like how can we approach each other in with like good faith and stuff like this and then also what you said that um how to create like a very uh, low expectation like threshold so that people feel invited to this space and I've also like thought about that a lot when making the uh, ghettos like spaces and um, like one thing is for example in our open mics like very often the stages people sit on the floor and there are like carpets and like there's some snacks and stuff like that so uh, the idea of like performance isn't like um, performative but more just an act of like sharing something that you have and I think that has been like quite nice to see uh, a little bit of everyone's inner worlds in that way because we often carry so much in our inner worlds and we don't know where to like share it or where to put it so mm. just having those spaces where people can come and do that has been nice mm. and then what you said about like the emotional labor um, I think like that's also one of the reasons why it's becoming a collective now uh, because I think also like the more people that join in these events or the more events there are like of course it takes a lot of time because you want to like consider like a lot of factors and have a holistic approach but at the same time holistic approach takes so much thought and time mm -hmm. and resources that are not always available so like yeah and I don't know how has it been because like yesterday we had our first collective <coughs> collective event for uh, opening for uh, the Together Again Festival and Armando was also like assisting for that and yeah, yeah, I don't know it was how did it go for you. Completely different experience. I mean, just um, the way these events have been set up in the past and everything, you come in and you feel like you're a participant, but you're also part of it. You're doing something. You feel like you're a doer. And that's, uh, that's just kind of curated experience actually because the reality is that there are actually a, there's a lot of research there's a lot of care that has to be put in the background of it for it to seem welcoming for it to seem open and friendly and i could see yesterday the people that were there they were having an experience that felt very connecting and yeah, I really, mm. I'm really excited to work more on these. I, I feel like I should also maybe specify that, like maybe uh, Armando at first like started like coming to the workshops and the open mics, and so was like on the other side of things, and then yesterday kind of was on the uh, production side of stuff. So of course it's a very different experience. That it's really nice to see that people are enjoying, but you yourself are like the time, <laughs> the <laughs> the water's running out, or this kind of stuff, and just um, that. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. This is yeah. I don't remember who said it, but somebody much wiser than me said that um, one of the very, very Im um, strong impacts of oppression is making people feel that they're alone. Mm -hmm. So as a decolonial process, bringing people together and actually being able to signify that you are not alone is in itself already a very radical act. And it's beautiful how you work, mm. how you work together. Um, being together in spaces that we facilitate um, also requires many different roles. As you said, that um, it might be that you're facilitating, you're holding the space, but then it might also mean that you're in the audience. Um, I find it very interesting, especially for working with it from a communal perspective, how 
that position fluctuates. So sometimes we're in the center and we're the artist, and sometimes we're on the uh, outside looking in, and sometimes we're somewhere in between. How do you experience this fluctuation within communal work? Would Nelly like to share something? Hmm. I think as, um, from my perspective as a playwright, it is really important to be in the audience mm. because um, I feel it's um, a great responsibility to actively listen, um, not only to art, but to the world. Um, because as you said, we are reproducing and rewriting stories, fiction, people taking it in as a reality, um, that's a great responsibility. So I have to be an active listener, mm. um, being on the outside, looking inside w with an openness and in another role than just creating. So yes, this is a big part of my work. Mm. And as we work together as yeah. also. Mm. Do you all experience it uh, in the same way as, um, I don't know if polarity is the right word, but polarities of being in the center and on stage and being the artist and then being uh, in the audience, so to say, or do you find like different polarities or different positions? Well, I suppose we, we occupy very different roles uh, in different moments. Like now I'm here speaking, you know, they're listening. Mm. And uh, but we're all still performing some kind of a role while we're doing it, right? Uh, there's just this invisible wall now between us. Mm. Um, we have been, the researchers uh, have been interviewing, so that's mostly listening and noting things and giving people voice. Uh, then we have also facilitated workshops, which basically means that we just give the tools to the people and and uh, they actually do the work. We're just there to guide. We're not really like teachers in a way, right? Mm. We're just there to... Uh, help people think on their own or find solutions or ideas or uh, questions on their own and then when it comes to the event that was forum based then we set the stage and create the space where things can happen but it's really the idea is that um, the people who come they also participate yeah. Like it's also rethinking what is the role of the audience. Is the role of the audience the role that you are having now, or is the role of the audience actually to be yeah. an active participant in the discussion and in the exchange, which quite drastically changes um, the dynamics of the situation. And in this case, we are not involved in any more uh, apart from setting the things up, right? And then when it comes to artworks, then we are maybe more involved as an artist, but we have quite a um, documentary approach, I would say, um, even though it might be a docu-fiction for some. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but in those cases, we also collaborate with other people. <laughs> so in that microcosmos, our roles can be very different again. Mm -hmm. So it mm. depends on the context, I suppose. Mm. I, yeah. I agree with what Abo said of like um, making the audience or the group interact. Like for mm. me, that changes the dynamic into a more horizontal one. And it allows me to rest as well and to give mm. uh, the participants, if I'm doing a writing group or, or whatever, Mm, to give them also the the uh, the chance to take take charge and mm. and do something uh, that is not necessarily in a participatory way but in a leading way. Mm. Um, so I can also learn as as part of that group. Yeah, and um, if I can add also something to to it is that um, I think it's in that case we were really in a different world than what we do normally, but also we were we had this, let's say, privilege to have this time to build something. Mm. And uh, it's also about that sometimes I feel is that you have the time and the space to think and to build a context for discussion to happen and to welcome people to it. And um, so, yeah, we were more like as researcher, but also because we have our own sensitivity and we understand mm. the topics. Mm. I think we learned to talk to people that we felt in a way it was not a selection, but there are some kind of ideas that are coming together. Mm -hmm. And um, 
So yeah, and then being during to build the context and then to be there and seeing what will happen. It was still free because we didn't really know what yeah. will happen during the talk. So people were really like free to talk. Um, so yeah, I think that's what I wanted to add about yeah. being in the audience. It's very interesting with working in new contexts because you have all created new contexts and sort of explored what it can mean. And there are probably a lot of things to take away, as you already mentioned, that there are, um, like you have new tools now, how to, how to build in a capacity or a capability of, um, of a project growing past yourself or past oneself. Um, which I find is very is very beautiful, and do you do you see this translating into your so-called everyday work? Do you find have you found new tools? Have you found new methods or maybe new collaborations that that can make this possible? I'm a little bit delayed, so I'll just really quickly add one thing to like the previous question because yes. uh, I was just thinking a lot of like. Um, I had a lot of discussions about what it means for me to like also perform in the spaces that I create because a big part of me also wants to belong to the spaces that I create, mm. especially because it came from a place of like wanting to uh, see an art world or a poetry scene that I also would like to be a part of and like see yourself reflected back at you from the audience and have these like like because to be a performer or an artist as well it means something different depending on where you share your work and like who's connecting to your work and yourself. So um, I feel like that's just, I haven't found the answer yet, but I feel like it's also been different experiences to create platforms where I've decided like I'm not a part of this one, this is for others, or like having platforms where like I'm going to be a part of this also and just like re like testing out different roles and maybe also telling myself like it doesn't have to be perfect or like that like, because uh, I'm not a professional like producer or curator but like if I'm going to be in this role like maybe see how you can like like play around <laughs> a little mm. bit like that mm. but yes I found that very beautiful I had a discussion with uh, an artist um, a while ago and and they spoke of post-intentional art where very often we we work in art situations where the process itself doesn't necessarily have the depth that the description of the process later has. And what I find intriguing here is this the other way is a product of that intention. And I, fe I feel that is very beautiful. Mm. Mm. We are slowly, gradually gliding into the Q&A section. Um, so if you have a question in your mind, you will have, or even a comment, you will have a moment to share it in just a few minutes. Before that, I would like to ask one final question about takeaways. Have you received or have you created, have you been able to build together new tools for this post-pandemic togetherness that we now experience where we have new tools and we've also tested out new tools? And we've also realized that some of them might not be as adequate as they might have been described to be now after testing. Have you found new processes and new new ways to work? Um, I would maybe say that what Leah said was not doing so much is actually the best. Because if I, if I look at the situation where we are po in post-pandemic today, um, I think what we learned probably is that, or what we realized that actually we are facing an extinction in a very fast rate. And what happened were these kind of great initiatives where uh, we want to be together and we want to make change and the changes are also happening, but in a very slow pace. And at the same time, we are still living in this uh, society and system and structures that really just reproduce mo for most part um, these kind of historical experiences of capitalism and neoliberalism and class uh, privilege and, and uh, patriarchy. So at one point uh, we are basically wanting to do something but we don't know so well how to do it. So, because uh, we are so conditioned, right? So I think these kind of initiatives are great. And, um, but I think maybe 
pausing is a great way of doing it. And I have a small example of that. Every summer, I delete the Instagram app from my phone. And, and then I put it back when I need to use it. Like, for example, here I have it tap so I can do some stuff like we do. I mean, it's a professional tool also, right? Um, and the first time I did it, I was thinking, like, I'm going to miss out so much. Like, how I'm going to learn anything? Huge <laughs> FOMO. Uh, I'm going to talk to my friends. And the biggest surprise was that actually I did not feel I was missing out anything. Not, not anything. But the relationships I had with my friends and, and colleagues and so on just came much more genuine and, and honest and deep. And actually, this is the thing that we are so inside something that it's very hard to step out of it. And, and I think these are the kind of tools we need to create. And these are maybe new imaginations or um, like what we try to do with our project is to create the space where we can think and pause and maybe enact some kind of other kind of narratives or future or behavior models. Um, and I think these are really the tools uh, that we need to Im imagine. And it's, mm -hmm. it's more about mental than it's actually like physical. Mm -hmm. mm. Thank you. Does anybody else want to share? I think um, the main tool, it's sort of adding on to what you're saying, but yes, I think when we were all locked up in our homes uh, on our computers, th this felt at least for me one of the first times that I experienced fully technological fatigue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And after that, I started really caring about the emotional connection, the sort of actual physical touch, the, these little tiny things yeah. that feel so much more powerful in this like yeah. new world in a way that like we're trying to survive in where s technology keeps getting better and more intense and it's encouraging us to be more and more apart when like I, I'm not, I'm very like curious about the idea of collaborating with people like through Zoom or something but like I at this point, it feels it feels harder to me, but mm. of course it works for sure. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, there are many things that Zoom can't replace. Yeah. <laughs> and unfortunately, unfortunately, it has become sort of like a secondary. It has become an option. Yeah. That okay, well, it's it's being streamed, so I won't show up. Yeah. Um, it's great that there is opportunity for those who cannot make it, but then there's a lot that happens in the in-betweens. Yeah. Thank you very much for, your, your for this discussion and your thoughts. And now I'd like to open up the floor for um, questions and comments, and there's a mic around. There we go. Hello. I have a question as a person totally external to the project. Sorry, together again. sorry to interrupt. Can you my please introduce is, yourself? Yes, yes. my name <laughs> is Egle Oddo and I'm a visual artist and I live in Helsinki and uh, I consider Finland uh, my home. I live and work here for many years. And uh, I have a question related to the structure of the project because I, as an external person to the project together again, I have seen the presentation from the institutional point of view and the founders, and now I see the presentation from the artist point of view and the creators of the content. But my interests are in the relation between these two worlds and what, from the point of view of the artists, what has been this interspace? Have you been able also to influence and change the institutions? Because very often we see the institutions as those who provide the funding, they provide the conditions and then uh, the artists and the creators of course they gladly receive the, those uh, those resources and then they, they put them into action but I think it's beautiful when the artists and the content providers they're able to uh, inch inside the institutions a new way of thinking but I'm interested in the point of view of the artists not of the institutions thank you thank you very much for your question the floor is open to anyone uh, maybe I, I'll just like because uh, I feel like that's also been like a topic that's been like a lot on 
uh, like our minds as well. Like, what it the, what does it mean when we create these spaces? It's like in the last exhibition, for example, it was in the Kiasma space, and it's a space for like BIPOC creators. And what does it mean to like bring that uh, like community in those kind of spaces that um, haven't always been so welcoming? And I think for myself, like I've really try to focus on internal institutions, not the external one, because at least like for myself, like I don't understand the structure or how the change would happen, but I feel like we, um, the uh, the more you focus on like the people around you and like how do you like uh, dismantle the internal institutions, the change happens by itself. And then maybe also similar to this like uh, Garros movement that instead of like being in control of creating the change in institutions, maybe like, just how do you, I don't know if that made sense, <laughs> but mm. yeah, something in that direction. <laughs> Thank you. There is a question. Hi, uh, my name is Julia. Uh, I'm born and raised in Finland, half Italian, uh, so multicultural. I'm a teacher, both in dance and school. Um, and my question was, when you create these communal spaces, how do you choose uh, through what kind of channels you reach people, or do you have any thoughts about like different ways? Because I realize that in my, for example, uh, friend groups, there's a lot of people that want to get more off the social media and stuff like this. So what kind of channels do you use, and do you have any opinions on, on how to use people from different, I don't know, ways of life and sides of life? Mm -hmm. Mm, maybe in our case it was a bit special because we use a physical space that's like uh, the 35-37 Paris and uh, it was uh, also something interesting because it's a space that uh, really attracts a lot of people in Paris already and we thought that it could be a good way to integrate this space and have different uh, public coming so of course like our surrounding public found the friends and people that are following our work plus the people that will be interested in the art aspect, the people from the Finnish Institute, plus the people that will come, maybe just because it was an event in 35-37 and it's quite cool to go. Um, and just like, they will be there and also like connect to it. And we saw that happen. And that's the thing I personally, and I think you too, really liked about the event is that to see all these different groups coming together and be like, oh, actually that's pretty nice. So like, hey, like it was fashion week a week after the event and I have a few examples of people coming to me that I didn't know but like you know from kind of the same group that we could like follow each other on Instagram for example we, but we never talked and they came to me and be like oh I was there a bit by surprise because my friend da 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 and I think yeah using that like the physical space was interesting I think for us and then we have the forum as well online yeah, uh, which will develop a bit more in the future. Yeah, we we built this like forum with the technique from 15 years ago, which apparently wasn't so easy for the developer, but it's there. Uh, it's our like online space, which is also independent out of any other platform. Uh, but just to quickly add on that, I think the fact that it is a very uh, multi and interdisciplinary project helps a lot. Because when you have people from arts and design and fashion design from academia, uh, we had a, a performance company doing a piece. We had a philosopher, Emmanuel Cotia, that was speaking. So obviously, like all these uh, groups kind of want to see what the other part is. And like Leah said, we had this very massive space. But what we did is we basically chopped it in these compartments. So every um, every um, action happened in a different space, but it was the audience that moved and, and, and the stage was there. So it also created, um, I'm drifting off a little bit now, but it created this movement and interest that kept people there. And then once people are there, they start talking and, and it makes everything much more mm -hmm. interesting. Um. I can add to that that uh, for for my projects of, of writing, um, we use social media, but it is a concern uh, because when we use social media, we actually ask other groups or other collectives to, to repost our stuff. Uh, and we 
have found out that we reach the same circles and the same people over and over again, which is really nice, but there are other people who would be interested in writing or in coming to write with us and are not receiving that information because they are not to begin with following all these mm. circles that we're in. So it is a, a, an interesting and a valid and a, and a very urgent question of how we actually want to build community to people who haven't written before or who would like to try writing, how do we reach uh, out to them? So I think the brainstorming has to be a little bit bigger. Like, do we email institutions? Do we email, like, I don't know, schools or, or group of students, whatever? Like, do we go out of our uh, comfort contact? And, yeah. Uh, I was just, like, thinking about this as well, that, like, because uh, I was thinking a lot about co-curation and at least like for me as an artist very often I'll meet someone else and I'll hear their approach or something and I'll have this feeling like we're in the same flow but I just met like just like also being able to trust that like maybe I can't reach all those other people but somewhere someone else is probably doing the same thing and that like maybe like uh, there's also this invisible togetherness as well that like whatever you're doing someone else is also like catching that invisible <laughs> thread and that maybe uh, trusting that like the reach that you have is enough and then if, it, if it's like meant to like reach out then it will happen and then uh, in the meantime there's somebody else like also doing because I was also thinking for example when I read about your like writing groups as well I was just like that's really beautiful I feel like it's like on a similar thread as well but then also we had never met before now <laughs> and stuff like that so then just yeah just being able to co-curate like that. And, yeah. Yeah. With accessibility, okay. more is often more. <laughs> the more platforms, the more connections, mm -hmm. the more um, the more second-hand connections you have, the more mm -hmm. accessible your art is. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? I think we have time for one or two more. Maybe. Is the mic on? No? Oh, oh there, there we, we go. go. Hi. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for such a meaningful conversation and, and all the beautiful um, and emotional work. Uh, my name is Enni Kokka Tuomala and I'm an empathy artist based in London. I was really fascinated by the conversation that emerged around roles and the different roles that we play as artists. I think, you know, often especially when making work in a more collaborative way, but also presenting more uh, communal experiences. I love the expression, Alex, that you used. Um, we end up playing even more roles than perhaps in other settings. And I wondered, how do you all as artists manage that? What, what kind of processes and support structures what sort of uh, processes of care do you bring in into your own practice and these collaborative ways of working? Um, I wondered, I, I loved, um, Julian, your expression of this post-intentional um, art. I wonder how much of it is something you do intentionally at the beginning where you define the different roles and approaches to it, how much of it emerges in the process and how much of it is post-intentional or mm. post-rationalized. Just, just wanted to hear a few thoughts about that. I know it's a big question. The floor is open. Mm. As you think, I can share. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> not um, as an artist myself, even though I haven't been in this process but work communally, I find that um, art usually either gives energy or takes energy, um, depending upon the context and the content. And understanding that balance, that when are you working in a community that literally gives you energy. Like I can be doing very hard work, facilitating very difficult situations, but feel revived because of the group I'm working with and because of the end mm -hmm. goals. Mm -hmm. Where with, in other contexts, I might be working even less, so to say, but it's draining. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, quite honestly, very often it's when I'm working with my peers or on a gra grassroots level, it's very often energizing. And then when working with yeah. big institutions, the bureaucracy of it makes things so slow. And then the role of artists and the creation of art becomes a very minuscule part of the work itself. And I think that balance is something that I mm. find important. Mm. Would somebody else like to share something? I totally agree on that. And I think in the beginning of uh, theater production, for instance, 
I use quite an amount of work of being together just as a group um, to sh to have this sense of shared art piece and creating together so everyone gets to speak up and feels involved and feels heard and um, everyone also has the responsibility of what we are creating. So the roles often develop and change a bit from what was maybe thought in the beginning because of this feel of feeling of community and togetherness. Thank you very much. And with those words, I'd like to thank you and thank everybody in the audience for this discussion. The discussion is not over, even though our time is up, this, the discussion continues. Please continue these topics, continue these discussions, and please contact these artists for more in-depth discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, there's a traffic moment. I will allow the traffic moment to happen before we continue. If I can still ask everybody to sit down uh, as soon as possible, because we're kind of on a tight schedule with the program before the lunch. After the next session, we will have lunch, so then you will have more time to, to interact with each other. Sorry to be so strict, but I want to get everything on stage before our lunch break. So. Um, Okay, I think it now looks like we're almost all set, so we can um, continue with the program. Um, I still want to, on my own behalf, uh, thank all the speakers in the previous session. Um, I think it was a really beautiful and empowering and important conversation. And I even felt that something happened in the room during the conversation. I think that was the moment during the conversation that we somehow actually truly came together. Um, and I think it was a good reminder that how even this moment is created here and now through all of us and what everybody sort of brings into the room. By being silent or by listening or by talking or creating something, whatever roles we're playing here, but we're all creating the moment together. So thank you for all of you sharing your personal views of your work. I know it's always vulnerable and it's personal, so I think it's very fruitful and important for all of us. So thank you. Um, and now it's time for the first presentation. It looks like people are ready already. Uh, uh, so Post Theater Collective. Uh, the Post Theater Collective launches season three, Holy Monkey of the Middle Eastern Bloc podcast. The podcast continues to reflect on the global pandemic through the eyes of people belonging to cultural and linguistic minorities. Um, and this work is written by Nelly Winterhalder and Louis Armas. Sound designed by Saku Kämäräinen, in the main roles, Nora Sointu Vuorela and Timo Torikka, directed by David Kosma and produced by the Post Theatre Collective, and it's commissioned by the Finnish Norwegian Culture Institute. Post Theatre Collective, the stage is yours. Good day. Welcome to our reading session of uh, Holy Monkey, which was written by Nelly Winterhalder and Lois Armas. Um, the bits and bytes what we are presenting to you today uh, are presented by uh, Timo Torica and uh, Nora Vorella and me, David Kosma. Um, the full story was launched today at 9 o'clock uh, on SoundCloud. Uh, you can find the QR code on the web page of Together Again and um, also probably here in the program, I'm not sure. But um, the story goes like this. Harald and Taimi are on their way to each other. Uh, 
Father and daughter, they haven't been in touch for 11 years after Harald left the home without warning from one day to another. As the pandemic redefined notions of closeness and family, Taimi contacted Harald with only one question. Shall we meet? The eight episodes of Holy Monkey invites you into Harald's and Taimi's journey towards seeing each other. What are their fears? What are their hopes? How have they changed since they last saw? What do they expect from the encounter? There, 13A, that's my seat. A lucky number, I guess. I woke up from coma on the 13th, and that's um, 18 months ago now. It's 11 years since I haven't seen my daughter. 28 minutes since I had my last ginger shot. Mm-hmm. 18 months since my last vodka shot. All three of them seems like another life now. Now I'm here. I'm taking the bus to Gothenburg. Seat 13A. Then the train to Stockholm on the way to meet my daughter. I am... I am a father. I am. Uh, I am a, a father. I'll just keep saying that I am a father. I am, I am, I am a rock. I am an island. I am on this bus. I have a coat. I have a trolley. I am a father. I have a seat. I found my seat. My coat has found its coat back. My trolley is in the luggage locker. I'm a father heading for his daughter. Good luck to this fellow. <laughs> That's me. You never know for sure, but I, I, think, I think I am a rock, an island. I am myself, I mean, a father. Off we go. I took today, Friday and Monday off from work, just so I can spend Saturday and Sunday in Stockholm. I will meet my friend Yasmin, and I will see my father. It's 6.15 in the morning. Finally, the bus takes off. Before the pandemic in 2019, Galle and I did the same route. We spent a longer time in Stockholm, almost a week, and we took a cruise boat to Helsinki to visit my mother who lives there. Why don't we just fly? I asked over and over. Do you know how irresponsible that is? Galle answered over and over. I thought of all the happy mindless and irresponsible travelers who fill the airports, going everywhere. It was summertime when we traveled, and we had a beautiful trip. We didn't fight a single time, and we laughed a lot. We always laugh. I wore only dresses on that trip. It's one of my favorite memories together. It's a memory that feels light and happy. 7 a.m. I am alone on the bus. Outside is still dark, but getting increasingly lighter by the minute. It's been drizzling since yesterday. A light rain that doesn't stop. Autumn mornings are like this so often. Grey and rainy. This bus feels like a home. Pleasant and warm. It dawns on me. I was longing for this. Being on my way somewhere even if by bus. The return to what normal is after such a long pause feels safe and predictable. Before this day, before sitting on this bus to Rovaniemi months ago, I sat on the floor of my kitchen, my hair a mess, my clothes a mess, and the kitchen floor dirty with cereal crumbs, dog hair and dust. My eyes were swollen from crying. 
admins my tears I typed very impulsively. A reply to an old text message from my father, which I had left unanswered, just as every single message he has sent over the years. Unanswered. I typed, I typed a question. Shall we just meet? He replied. We typos. Yes, of course. He sounded immature and excited at the same time. He sounded like a stranger. Who is this man? <coughs> After pressing send, I regret it. But at the same time, I felt relieved. This was needed. And I couldn't help feeling curious as well. This confusing mixture of feelings followed me for days, for months. Still today, I don't know how I feel exactly. I feel all of it. One moment I regret, the next minute I might even be excited. I remember my daughter's birth. That's it. That's all I remember. My memory is blank. My whole life is a blank between me being 15 and 55 years old. Except for time is first scream. She sounded almost upset about this moment of welcome, as if that place didn't correspond at all to her high expectations. A light greenish corridor with a smell of disinfectant right at the entrance of the hospital. Amanda gave birth on the middle of the floor, surrounded by a midwife, a doctor, a receptionist, and a father. Me. I wanted to scream myself when I first looked into my daughter's wrinkled face. My scream would have sounded less upset, but more with a relieved and somehow terrified note. I am a father. Instead, I burst into tears. I was overwhelmed by the uniqueness of both birth and my daughter's beauty. And I was exhausted after the wheezing taxi ride, the stress of not quite making it to the delivery room. The receptionist handed me a handkerchief, and I remember I wondered if her dark, almost black hair was a wig. Feeling my way through the darkness, guided by a beating heart, I can't tell where the journey will end. But I know where to start. I remember every single inch of that moment, the start of her life 25 years ago. And nothing else. I do not remember her first smile. I do not remember her first step. I do not remember her learning how to bike, nor failing her first ever pancake. Maybe it was delicious. I don't even like pancakes, but I'm sure I loved her pancakes anyway. She's my, my daughter. And now I'm traveling toward her. Even if I have to take a bus. Episode 2. A text message from my father. My train arrives at 1531. Me that the holy monkey... Asian restaurant inside the station. <sighs> My father writes as if he would be a wreck, always in a hurry, without a plan. Since I texted him asking to meet, we chatted about logistics, where and when. His texts haven't revealed much of him, nor I could truly know if I was waiting for something to be revealed to me. Ever since he left, 11 years ago, Every time I think about him, every time I'm forced to speak about him, to a new friend, to a new boyfriend, in conversations with mom sometimes, every one of those times I become mute, deaf, and blind. I don't see the past, I don't hear his voice, and I don't know what to say. When someone innocently asks about my parents, do they live close, do we see often, are they together? Are they alive? I become ashamed. Not this again, I think. I become numb, and I feel I'm put in the spotlight for all the wrong reasons. 
I imagine everyone pities me. I lean back, meeting the itchy bus seat with my back. There is one life before and one after. Before I became a father and after. Before I lost my memory and after. Those lives are divided by a solid wall like the double glazed rain window that separates me on the bus from the foggy outside landscape. My memories are just as difficult to read as the landscape on the other side of the window. And the event dividing my life in two, one before and one after, is a simple cardiac arrest. Of course it's not simple. Life never is, nor is death, I guess. But apart from the, the unexpected event of my heart stopping, who knew it would cause me a brain injury and memory loss? Linda told me about the day it happened. I had been outside for a run, yes. I have. Life is unfair sometimes. I guess there are plenty of men in their 50s who don't give a shit about their health. They are smoking cigars, eating goose liver and avoiding to ever lose their breath. I've never been one of them, says Linda. According to her, I have always loved to move. You like the air pushing through your lungs to get your muscles sweat, says Linda. I look at my belly decorating decorating my waistband like a muffin. Vodka, of, I kind of like muffins. Vodka, of course, and even goose liver, that's for sure. Anyway, that day I was going for a run, and I must have felt a little lightheaded, so I decided to take a shortcut and return home early. I didn't quite make it to my house, and for some reason I ended up in front of my neighbor's door. Pam. She wasn't happy about seeing you. It had been just a year since you ran over her dog, so you weren't on speaking terms. She was just baking bread and opened the door with duff on her hands, Linda told me. You were all purple and strange when she opened the door and you made some weird noise that reminded her of her uncle's cows. She was about to slam the door in your face, but you just fell over the doorstep, doorstep with your face first. Luckily, Pam showed mercy with the murder of her dog and made an emergency call. After a few minutes, the paramedics were over me with a defibrillator trying to resuscitate me. My heart had stopped. and My brain was left without oxygen for several minutes. But suddenly, my heart decided to show up at work again. And I ended up in the, in the hospital in a coma. Four days were enough to erase most of my memory, so when I woke up, my heart was working, just my brain was off. I got my head checked by a jumbo jet. It wasn't easy, but nothing is, no. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Now we jump a bit in time and continue with timing. The day I ended up sitting on the kitchen floor sending a text message to my father had been a day when I had cried a lot. This felt foreign to me, physically and emotionally, for I hardly cry. I don't remember crying when my father left, and I didn't cry when I saw my mother cry. I almost never cry if I miss her. I wouldn't ever cry for a job. And I comfort my friends as they sob. I feel for them. They do not comfort me in return, because there's nothing to offer comfort about. I am strong in every sense. I draw when I'm sad. I read. I run. I move my body. I take a shower. I breathe. I am a tower. I am my best friend. I am my comfort. 
But on that day, finally, I cried. Summer had just started and restrictions had been lifted for the time being. The loneliest, most silent spring of COVID's first wave had come to an end. Galle was delighted at the prospect of visiting his parents weekly, driving there, bringing food, finally being inside the same kitchen sharing a meal, sitting on the same living room watching a movie. What a nuisance, I said, referring to the drive even though it was no longer than 20 minutes. I don't know why I said that. Or, of course I know. I was unable to control the feelings inside me. The world opens up again and there he goes, to his wholesome, happy family. And here I stay, still abandoned by my father. Aren't you visiting your mom? He asked out of the blue, guessing the cause of my bad mood. I guess so. I replied without even looking at him. You're being really mean, he pointed out. He let me cry that day. I understand, he said, reading between the lines. I understand, he kept saying. It had accumulated inside me, I guess. The resentment and the sadness. But truly, he didn't understand. One can't understand what one hasn't lived. I could see him repeating more to himself than to me, like a mantra to make me silent. I understand. I understand. No, he did not. He just wanted me to shut up. He was uncomfortable at seeing me cry. And I thought, I must call mom. She will get me. She will understand that even though I love her, I still, sometimes, when global pandemics give us relief, I still think of my father. It's five in the afternoon. I love this time of the day. The bus moves softly towards Lula and it's not raining anymore. Instead, the light outside is fierce, bright, powerful, daring, inundating every single tree. I notice only now that my cheeks are wet. I have been crying. In the meanwhile, Harald's bus has arrived to Gothenburg, and it's time to change the bus to the train that goes to Stockholm. But before that, Harald gets an idea. A picture! Maybe I should send her a picture so she can recognize me. Hmm. At least the belly doesn't show. Should I have smiled more? And the picture is slightly out of focus. Behind me, the window of the bus and uh, a roller coaster. I turn around. Is there an amusement park close to, to the train station? I watch a snake-like little train carrying its passengers slowly uphill, preparing to throw them headfirst into the giant roller coaster in a few instants. Did I? ever take time to a park? Did we ever scream out loud together in a roller coaster? Did we ever get on a big wheel laughing about the tiny ant people on the ground, enjoying the miniaturization of all thoughts? Or did she inherit my mother's fear of hates? Finally, this has to be the train station. Wallet, keys, phone. Ah, the picture. Uh, for you to recognize me. Episode fourth uh, starts with Harald realizing that the toilets and the cafe of the train are closed due to a problem with water supply. In the meanwhile, Taimi is still in the bus on her way to Luleå. I go in and out of airplane mode. I hate not having enough battery to splurge. I go out of airplane mode now, and I get a text message from my father. I open it, and I'm surprised by what I see. I was not prepared for this. He has sent a picture of himself. For you to recognize me, he writes. Where is he? Instead of zooming at his face, I zoom at the background. Where is he? 
As usual, when I want to bury an uncomfortable feeling, my mind takes off onto a thousand rapid thoughts, one after another, inundating me, distracting me. <laughs> Here I am, thankful for these random passengers. Watching them makes me numb to the nervousness I feel about seeing my father. Literally numb as well. My legs are now heavy, tickling when I move them again. I unlock my phone. Out of airplane mode again. No new messages. And nine percentage of battery. God damn it. The familiar feeling of anger and unfairness. The one I felt during lockdown is returning in this bus. I wish I'd be home. I look at my father's picture again. He looks as he looked a decade ago. There's no surprise, nor answers to any of the questions I haven't even voiced aloud. The first ones would probably have been, Why would you leave your family? Where are you now? Who are you with? Who are you, really? The bus arrives in Lula. I stretch my legs, my whole body, before stepping outside. Obviously, relationships haven't been my thing. Linda told me she was the reason I left Helsinki and moved to Oslo. The reason for leaving my family, my wife Amanda and my daughter Taimi. Ever since we met, Linda and I have had that crazy in-love relationship, says Linda. I have to trust her. I, I, I don't remember any of it. I don't remember falling in love with her. I don't remember our first meeting at a corporate event. Later on, we went to a bar, had lots of vodka, and an imitator was singing, You're simply the best. Better than all the rest, better than anyone, anyone I've ever met. The imitator was lousy, but it became our song, says Linda. I remember the song, of course. I, I, I just don't remember the night. That same night, I must have decided to leave Amanda, Taimi, and my whole life in Helsinki. We were just madly in love. We are says Linda. And some weeks later I was leaving town in the middle of the night without even leaving a note to Amanda or Taimi, disappearing from everything I've known and been, heading to a new life in Oslo with Linda. We skip episode five and go to episode six, where Taimi gets into the train that goes to Stockholm and has a good phone call with her mother. But we continue with Harald. I have this photo of Amanda and Taimi. When I was looking for memories in the depths of my smartphone backups, this one caught my eye. Screens are still making me dizzy, so I printed a couple of photos, and this is one of them. Taimi is a teenager. The picture must have been taken a short time before I left Helsinki for good. I'm carrying it around in my pocket. I take it out once in a while. Look at it. I have to remember... I have to remember something, right? It has to evoke a sensation, a, a smell, a feeling, a fight. Anything. The emptiness is screaming out loud. Nothing. Fate must be laughing up their sleeve. My memory is stuck at 15, which is exactly the, the, the age time he had when I last saw her. The paper feels thin. I have had it in my pocket for a while. I have had it in my hands many times. Linda hasn't seen it. I folded it twice. The folds have become gray lines dividing the picture. One is separating Amanda and Taimi, the other one under their breasts. Taimi is a young woman. I am a father. Shouting something at the one taking the picture. I think it's me. She shines straight into my lens. The whole body is challenging me to come closer. Taimi is looking down. Her upper body slightly cringed in complete shyness or shame of her parents' playfulness. Amanda is an attractive woman. It takes a bit of a man to leave that woman. 
I wonder how she looks today. Are her breasts still... If I can meet Taimi, is there a possibility to meet Amanda as well? You were always on my mind. You were always on my mind. During episode 7, Harald's train is stuck just before Stockholm, and his need to go to the toilet is getting worse and worse. And he becomes unsure if Taimi will show up or not. And that being said, we arrive to the final episode. I think about my home in Helsinki. My mother's home. Always the doors are open there for me. Her sofa becomes a sofa bed, and we talk well into the night. I feel protected as she combs my hair. Holy monkey stands finally in front of me. I've killed all the time I have to kill, yet there is no one I can recognize here. Or my father is definitely not here yet. In front of Holy Monkey there's a cafe. I don't even bother to order a coffee, for I know I won't be staying long in this station. I just want to sit for a second, with my gaze fixed on the entrance of the sushi place, seeing so many people walk by, enter, and leave. I think of my home waiting for me here, outside this train station, in Stockholm. That's Yasmin's home. Her wooden table where I draw. Her enormous bathroom where we put makeup together. Her sofa where we drink wine, tea, where I sleep. The thought hits me. There is no home in my father. I also do not need it. There, there's the holy monkey. Holy shit. How do I look? A quick check in the shop window, pushing my shirt back into my trousers. Holy shit, I'm going to meet my daughter at the holy monkey. That, that woman sitting in the corner, is that, is, is, is that her? No, no, she's older. And she has curly hair. Tammy's hair is looking straight in my pictures. More like mine. Darker as well. No, it's not her. She's not, time, time is not, not here yet. I really, I really have to pee. I should look for a restroom outside the restaurant at the station hall. Didn't I just pass a sign? I just go, find the restroom and then... But what if I miss Taimi? If she doesn't find me here, she'll think I... Why isn't, why isn't she here yet anyway? My, my, my train was late, I texted her still. She's not here. Should I send her a picture of me sitting at the holy monkey? No. Too stupid. She didn't even bother to text me back after my last picture. Didn't she see it? Or did she decide not to... No. She'll be here any minute. I have to wait. No pee, just wait. She'll be here any minute and I'll tell her that... that um, I'll tell her that... that, uh, that the toilet was closed, that I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that I have brain damage, uh, that I want to get to know her, that I want to meet her mother, that her mother's breasts are... <sighs> that that I, 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 I'm, 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 I'm ridiculous. I'm, I'm, I'm ridiculous. Sitting in a foreign country, a foreign city, in an Asian fast food restaurant, hiding from my wife, desperately looking for my daughter, peeing my pants. What kind of father is that? I don't even know... I don't even know how... how, how she looks. I didn't even remember to ask her for a recent picture. All I have are photos from more than 11 years ago, on paper. I don't know anything. What kind of father doesn't know anything about his daughter? I don't know anything. How she smells, how her voice sounds, what songs she likes, does she even like Asian food? No, she's never going to like me. I can't, I can't, I, I can't do this. I have to, I have to call Linda, I have to, to I, I have to make sure she doesn't... Linda, Linda is at the cabin. I have to, I have to go. I have to pee. I don't move because I am frozen. 
you know, even if I wanted to, I don't think I could move. I sit heavily, with my backpack uncomfortably between me and my Amy and the back of the chair. He's walking in a clumsy way, and the first thing I think is, he's nervous. Or maybe he just walks like that all the time, clumsily, like the wreck I imagined him to be. I can't take my eyes away from him. Even if I know his face, even if I recognize him easily, it's clear to me that I don't know him. His face. He's a stranger, but there he is, I guess. My father. His face makes me so sad. The way he walks makes me sad. His sad suitcase. Now I don't only feel frozen, I also feel heavy. I feel dizzy and I feel this is all very unfair. I shouldn't be here, spying on my father from afar. He looks lost, but he looks like a regular man. He looks big time lost. And I can't read his expression, like a daughter would read his father's expression. I can't. I can't say what's going on. I am sad all of a sudden, seeing him so close and knowing I am not going to get closer. I am so sad right now, sitting on this chair, seeing him without him seeing me. I know I will always be sad. He doesn't know this. He doesn't see me. He still looks lost. He is really so close, yet we won't say hello. I see him disappearing from my view. He's going somewhere. He didn't see me. And I feel re relieved and hurt at this, both at the same time. He didn't look hard enough around before he comes back from wherever the fuck he went. I walk away from the station. The end. Thank you, Nora Sointu Vuorela and Timo Torikka and David Kosma and the Post Theatre Collective. Beautiful work. Thank you so much for sharing that as well. Now it's time for a lunch break and we will come together again at one o'clock. Uh, there's also some snacks and coffee available here. And also in the hallway, uh, please visit the works by the Soft Collective and Roll in Circles by Have and Need, directed by Aapo Nikkanen and Lea Dominics. And they're right in the hallway when you step outside from this room. Um, and we will see each other again at one o'clock. Thank you very much. The Finnish Institute in Athens is an academic institution with a mission to carry out and promote the study of Greek, archaeology, history, language and culture from ancient times to the present day. As an academic institute, the Finnish Institute at Athens is classified in Greece as an archaeological school. This status allows it to carry out archaeological field work in Greece. Current projects focus on Agia Paraskevi of Arakamitai, Potike, Retimnon, Naxos of Sicily and Melitaya. The institute also provides education. During the autumn, we organize an introductory course on ancient Greek culture for Finnish undergraduate students, traveling with the students for approximately five weeks around the sites of ancient Greece. Courses for teachers are also regularly offered, as well as courses for more advanced students. The Finnish Cultural Institute for the Benelux is based in Brussels. The institute builds bridges between cultural practitioners and institutions in Finland and the Benelux. We foster new creative collaborations and our program is infused with contemporary, sustainable and cross-disciplinary cultural initiatives. We work with artistic projects as well as societal themes aiming for equity, 
anti-racism and sustainability. Highlights include commissioning a dance performance for the first ever EU Sami Week, organized in Brussels, and supporting the work of Netherlands-based visual artist R. Murphy. In the next year, we will be developing our Masculinities program, bringing the Dutch theatre piece Boys Won't Be Boys to Finland and supporting a permanent sculptural work by a Finnish artist in Belgium. For Together Again, the Institute has collaborated with Pehme Collective, aka The Soft Collective. Their workshop Safer Spaces for Unhad Conversations, held in Amsterdam in May, is a continuation of their previous work in London. The work, created together with Zulu Green, a black queer rapper, singer and songwriter from Amsterdam, references community caring. Finn Agora, the Finnish Institute in Budapest, works to create and promote connections between Finland and Hungary in the fields of culture, science and economics. The Institute's goal is to strengthen and create connections between Hungary and Finland. This is done by events, seminars, professional collaborations and projects. This year's highlights are the annual Finnish film festival Finn Film Napok and the launch of a new artist residency collaboration. This autumn, Finagora will focus on creating new collaborations with art organizations in Budapest, organizing a workshop on minority languages and facilitating Finnish authors and artists visiting Budapest and being part of festivals and exhibitions. The Finnish Cultural Institute in Denmark is located in Copenhagen. The Institute offers Finnish expertise in the fields of contemporary art and performing arts, creating and nurturing dialogue between Finnish and Danish professionals and audiences. All of the Institute's projects are executed in collaboration with Finnish and Danish partners. The Institute works with cultural exchange through exhibition projects, residency programs and other artistic projects. One of the highlights in the recent years has been a long-term collaboration with the artist Jenna Sotela and a Copenhagen-based artistic platform Primer. This autumn, the Institute will be focusing on our residency programs for visual artists, as well as bringing Danish and international arts and culture professionals to Finland and introducing them to Finnish artists and the local art scene. The Finnish Institute in the UK and Ireland is located in London. The Institute enables progressive personal and societal change through art and culture by enriching and diversifying connections between cultural professionals in Finland, Ireland and the United Kingdom. The Institute runs two programs, Arts and Society. Recent highlights include Finnish Art Prize Below Zero, won by Nastya Sederrönke, and a festival celebrating Tuva Jansson's queer heritage. This autumn, the Institute focuses on bringing British and Irish arts and culture professionals to study visits in Finland, and producing an exhibition in London showcasing underrepresented Finnish artists and designers. For the Together Again project, the Institute worked with the artist Minna Henriksson. Her work focused on the Finnish Writers' Association Kiela and its largely forgotten feminist writers from the 1930s. The work was originally shown earlier this year as part of a larger exhibition called Editorial Tables, Reciprocal Hospitalities at the Showroom Gallery. The Ibero-American Institute of Finland is Finland's cultural institute working in Spain, Portugal and Latin America. Its main purpose is to promote Finnish culture and arts and dialogue in the areas where Spanish and Portuguese are spoken. The Institute's projects focus on visual arts, architecture and design with a basis on human rights, gender equality and social inclusion. Recent projects include Sofia Arngrud's social art installation in Uruguay with 223 footballs and teenagers, as well as art exploring new AI technologies. The Cultural Center and Art Gallery are in the heart of Madrid in the so-called Literary Quarter. The Institute works closely with local partners partners like festivals, museums and galleries. Like earlier this year, Klaus Harp and Emian Co's exhibition was held in Spain's National Design Museum. 
Nordica Institute also collaborates with Nordic and European networks, especially in projects related to literature and film. For the Together Again project, the Ibero-American Institute worked with the Finnish-Nigerian photographer Uwa Idoase in Portugal, Spain and Finland. During his six-week residency in Oporto, Uwa worked with and photographed local children. Through his portraits, Uwa addresses the intersection between dreams, aspirations and community in the growth process of young people. Uwa's works were exhibited in Oporto, Madrid and now are in Helsinki. The Finnish Cultural Institute in New York is located in New York City in the United States. The Institute worked across the fields of contemporary art, design and architecture, creating dialogue between Finnish and American professionals and audiences. The Finnish Cultural Institute in New York organizes residency programs, projects and events that foster critical dialogue. Recent highlights include supporting EU Sosiraya's solo exhibition at MoMA PSI 1 and the program Exercises in Togetherness, showcasing Finnish and American artists' work through notions of care and intimacy. This year, the Institute collaborates with the renowned Performa Biennial in realizing a Finnish Pavilion Without Walls program, which presents several new commissions by Finland-based artists working in the intersections of visual and performative arts. For Together Again, the Finnish Cultural Institute in New York has commissioned a work in the form of a public seminar and a video piece by visual artist Matti Aikio in collaboration with Vera List Center for Art and Politics and Frame Contemporary Art Finland. Aikio's work explores intersections of modern Western society and indigenous cultures, the Sami culture in particular. The Finnish Norwegian Cultural Institute promotes cultural exchange between Finland and Norway. Our aim is to strengthen cooperation, dialogue and mobility between professional art and cultural practitioners. The Institute is based in Oslo but has activities throughout Norway. Currently, the Institute runs the program Nord, Cultural Bridges. The objective is to strengthen networks and activities between cultural practitioners in Northern Norway, Northern Finland and Sami. This includes collaboration with Hiljaisos Festivali at the multidisciplinary festival Festspielen in Nord Norge and community arts project Vadsø Megacity. This autumn, the institute focuses on bringing Finnish artists to residences in Norway. In September, a performing arts group will attend a residency in Dabli, Center for Performing Arts in Hammerfest, in collaboration with Svenska Kulturfonden. For the Together Again project, the Institute commissioned a third season of a podcast, The Middle Eastern Blog, produced and directed by the Coast Theatre Collective. The podcast reflects on the global pandemic through the eyes of people belonging to cultural and linguistic minorities. Writers for the new season are Norway-based Nelly Winterhalden and Finland-based Louis Arvas. The Finnish Institute in France is an independent and multidisciplinary platform between Finland and France, in collaboration with different international institutions, academia and creatives, the Institute engages actively with critical discourse through its on-site and off-site programming. In the most recent exhibition, called Imagine Every Day, Outsider Art Finland, the Institute presented a group of outsider artists exhibiting for the first time in Paris. Since 2022, the Institute also showcases Finnish gastronomy in the heart of Paris by offering a program of culinary events at the Café Ma. This autumn, the Institute's gallery has the honor of presenting the creations of an exceptional duo of designers, Yuslin Maumua. The Institute continues its collaboration with Alta University by organizing a showroom during Paris Fashion Weeks. For the Together Again project, the Institute continues to work with the artist Arpo Nikkonen, whose project looks at the ecological issues of garment production. Arpo Nikkonen worked with Leah Dominguez in a multidisciplinary project where they dwelled into the challenges of the fashion industry through discussions, workshops and artworks. The project's first forum, called Have Need, was held in Paris in June. The Finnish Institute in Estonia maintains, develops and strengthens Finnish-Estonian cultural cooperation in different fields of art, education and society. The Institute also keeps track of the societal developments in Estonia and participates in it through its programs. Recent highlights include Elina Simonen's exhibition, From Word to Image, which combines poetry, fashion design and photography. 
the exhibition was shown in eight different places in Estonia, Latvia and Finland. We also work on establishing the Finnish timeout Eratauko method developed to advance more constructive dialogues. This autumn we are excited to tell you about our new Erasmus Plus project which aims to give a chance for the youth of Helsinki and Tallinn to wrap together in workshops organized by two suburban youth centers. The Finnish Institute in Japan, located in Tokyo, promotes Finnish science, culture and higher education and the collaboration of these fields between Finland and Japan. The Institute identifies cooperation needs and opportunities and helps potential partners to find each other. The program consists of seminars and lectures, exhibitions and residences, just to name a few. The Institute's current research project compares Japanese Sansu and Finnish artists' homes. And in May, we held the 150th anniversary exhibition of Vivi Learn, one of Finland's first female architects, both in collaboration with Waseda University. In the autumn, the Finnish Institute in Japan continues with the ongoing series of AI seminars and is co-organizing a large-scale exhibition of a prominent Finnish ceramic artist. Autumn is also the time for the traditional Finnish-Swedish week. Hello, Tokyo! The Finnish Institute in Athens is an academic institution with a mission to carry out and promote the study of Greek, archaeology, history, language and culture from ancient times to the present day. As an academic institute, the Finnish Institute at Athens is classified in Greece as an archaeological school. This status allows it to carry out archaeological field work in Greece. Current projects focus on Agia Paraskevi of Arakamitai, Potike, Retimnon, Naxos of Sicily and Melitaya. The institute also provides education. During the autumn, we organize an introductory course on ancient Greek culture for Finnish undergraduate students, traveling with the students for approximately five weeks around the sites of ancient Greece. Courses for teachers are also regularly offered, as well as courses for more advanced students. The Finnish Cultural Institute for the Benelux is based in Brussels. The institute builds bridges between cultural practitioners and institutions in Finland and the Benelux. We foster new creative collaborations and our program is infused with contemporary, sustainable and cross-disciplinary cultural initiatives. We work with artistic projects as well as societal themes aiming for equity, anti-racism and sustainability. Highlights include commissioning a dance performance for the first ever EU Sami Week organized in Brussels and supporting the work of Netherlands-based visual artist Arne Murphy. In the next year, we will be developing our Masculinities program, bringing the Dutch theatre piece Boys Won't Be Boys to Finland and supporting a permanent sculptural work by a Finnish artist in Belgium. For Together Again, the Institute has collaborated with Pehme Collective, aka The Soft Collective. Their workshop, Safer Spaces for Unhad Conversations, held in Amsterdam in May, is a continuation of their previous work in London. The work, created together with Zulu Green, a black queer rapper, singer and songwriter from Amsterdam, references community caring. Finn Agora, the Finnish Institute in Budapest, works to create and promote connections between Finland and Hungary in the fields of culture, science and economics. The Institute's goal is to strengthen and create connections between Hungary and Finland. This is done by events, seminars, professional collaborations and projects. This year's highlights are the annual Finnish film festival Finn Film Napok and the launch of a new artist residency collaboration. This autumn, Finagora will focus on creating new collaborations with art organizations in Budapest, organizing a workshop on minority languages and facilitating Finnish authors and artists visiting Budapest and being part of festivals and exhibitions. The Finnish Cultural Institute in Denmark is located in Copenhagen. The institute offers Finnish expertise in the fields of contemporary art and performing arts, 
creating and nurturing dialogue between Finnish and Danish professionals and audiences. All of the Institute's projects are executed in collaboration with Finnish and Danish partners. The Institute works with cultural exchange through exhibition projects, residency programs and other artistic projects. One of the highlights in the recent years has been a long-term collaboration with the artist Jenna Sotela and a Copenhagen-based artistic platform Prima. This autumn, the Institute will be focusing on our residency programs for visual artists, as well as bringing Danish and international arts and culture professionals to Finland and introducing them to Finnish artists and the local art scene. The Finnish Institute in the UK and Ireland is located in London. The Institute enables progressive personal and societal change through art and culture by enriching and diversifying connections between cultural professionals in Finland, Ireland and the United Kingdom. The Institute runs two programs, Arts and Society. Recent highlights include Finnish Art Prize Below Zero, won by Nastya Sederrönke, and a festival celebrating Tuva Jansson's queer heritage. This autumn, the Institute focuses on bringing British and Irish arts and culture professionals to study visits in Finland, and producing an exhibition in London showcasing underrepresented Finnish artists and designers. For the Together Again project, the Institute worked with the artist Minna Henriksson. Her work focused on the Finnish Writers' Association Kiela and its largely forgotten feminist writers from the 1930s. The work was originally shown earlier this year as part of a larger exhibition called Editorial Tables, Reciprocal Hospitalities at the Showroom Gallery. The Ibero-American Institute of Finland is Finland's cultural institute working in Spain, Portugal and Latin America. Its main purpose is to promote Finnish culture and arts and dialogue in the areas where Spanish and Portuguese are spoken. The Institute's projects focus on visual arts, architecture and design with a basis on human rights, gender equality and social inclusion. Recent projects include Sofia Arngrud's social art installation in Uruguay with 223 footballs and teenagers, as well as art exploring new AI technologies. The Cultural Center and Art Gallery are in the heart of Madrid in the so-called Literary Quarter. The Institute works closely with local partners Partners like festivals, museums and galleries. Like earlier this year, Klaus Harp and Emian Co's exhibition was held in Spain's National Design Museum. The Institute also collaborates with Nordic and European networks, especially in projects related to literature and film. For the Together Again project, the Ibero-American Institute worked with the Finnish-Nigerian photographer Uwa Idoose in Portugal, Spain and Finland. During his six-week residency in Oporto, Uwa worked with and photographed local children. Through his portraits, Uwa addresses the intersection between dreams, aspirations and community in the growth process of young people. Uwa's works were exhibited in Oporto, Madrid and now are in Helsinki. The Finnish Cultural Institute in New York is located in New York City in the United States. The Institute works across the fields of contemporary art, design and architecture, creating dialogue between Finnish and American professionals and audiences. The Finnish Cultural Institute in New York organizes residency programs, projects and events that foster critical dialogue. Recent highlights include supporting EU Sosilaya's solo exhibition at MoMA PSI 1 and the program Exercises in Togetherness, showcasing Finnish and American artists' work through notions of care and intimacy. This year, the Institute collaborates with the renowned Performa Biennial in realizing a Finnish Pavilion Without Walls program, which presents several new commissions by Finland-based artists working in the intersections of visual and performative arts. For Together Again, the Finnish Cultural Institute in New York has commissioned a work in the form of a public seminar and a video piece by visual artist Matti Aikio in collaboration with Vera List Center for Art and Politics and Frame Contemporary Art Finland. Aikio's work explores intersections of modern Western society and indigenous cultures, the Sami culture in particular. The Finnish-Norwegian Cultural Institute promotes cultural exchange between Finland and Norway. Our aim is to strengthen 
cooperation, dialogue, and mobility between professional art and cultural practitioners. The Institute is based in Oslo, but has activities throughout Norway. Currently, the Institute runs the program Nord, Cultural Bridges. The objective is to strengthen networks and activities between cultural practitioners in northern Norway, northern Finland, and Sami. This includes collaboration with Hiljaisus Festivali at the multidisciplinary festival Festspielen in Nord Norge and community arts project Vadsø Megacity. This autumn, the institute focuses on bringing Finnish artists to residences in Norway. In September, a performing arts group will attend a residency in Dabvi, Center for Performing Arts in Hammerfest, in collaboration with Svenska Kulturfunden. For the Together Again project, the Institute commissioned a third season of a podcast, The Middle Eastern Blog, produced and directed by the Post Theatre Collective. The podcast reflects on the global pandemic through the eyes of people belonging to cultural and linguistic minorities. Writers for the new season are Norway-based Nelly Winterhalden and Finland-based Louis Arvas. The Finnish Institute in France is an independent and multidisciplinary platform between Finland and France. In collaboration with different international institutions, academia and creatives, the Institute engages actively with critical discourse through its on-site and off-site programming. In the most recent exhibition, called Imagine Every Day, Outsider Art Finland, the Institute presented a group of outsider artists exhibiting for the first time in Paris. Since 2022, the Institute also showcases Finnish gastronomy in the heart of Paris by offering a program of culinary events at the Café Ma. This autumn, the Institute's gallery has the honor of presenting the creations of an exceptional duo of designers, Jusleen Maumua. The Institute continues its collaboration with Art University by organizing a showroom during Paris Fashion Weeks. For the Together Again project, the Institute continues to work with the artist Arbo Nikkanen, whose project looks at the ecological issues of garment production. Arbo Nikkanen worked with Lea Dominguez in a multidisciplinary project where they dwelled into the challenges of the fashion industry through discussions, workshops and artworks. The project's first forum, called Have Need, was held in Paris in June. The Finnish Institute in Estonia maintains, develops and strengthens Finnish-Estonian cultural cooperation in different fields of art, education and society. The Institute also keeps track of the societal developments in Estonia and participates in it through its programs. Recent highlights include Elina Simonen's exhibition From Word to Image, which combines poetry, fashion design and photography. The exhibition was shown in eight different places in Estonia, Latvia and Finland. We also work on establishing the Finnish timeout Eratauko method developed to advance more constructive dialogues. This autumn we are excited to tell you about our new Erasmus Plus project, which aims to give a chance for the youth of Helsinki and Tallinn to wrap together in workshops organized by two suburban youth centers. The Finnish Institute in Japan, located in Tokyo, promotes Finnish science, culture and higher education and the collaboration of these fields between Finland and Japan. The Institute identifies cooperation needs and opportunities and helps potential partners to find each other. The program consists of seminars and lectures, exhibitions and residences, just to name a few. The Institute's current research project compares Japanese Sansu and Finnish artists' homes. And in May, we held the 150th anniversary exhibition of Vivi Learn, one of Finland's first female architects, both in collaboration with Waseda University. In the autumn, the Finnish Institute in Japan continues with the ongoing series of AI seminars and is co-organizing a large-scale exhibition of a prominent Finnish ceramic artist. Autumn is also the time for the traditional Finnish-Swedish week. Hello, Tokyo! The Finnish Institute in Athens is an academic institution with a mission to carry out and promote the study of Greek, archaeology, history, language and culture from ancient times to the present day. As an academic institute, the Finnish Institute at Athens is classified in Greece as an archaeological school. This status allows it to carry out archaeological field work in Greece. Current projects focus on Agia Paraskevi of Arakamitai, Potike, Retimnon, 
Naxos on Sicily and Melitaya. The institute also provides education. During the autumn, we organize an introductory course on ancient Greek culture for Finnish undergraduate students, traveling with the students for approximately five weeks around the sites of ancient Greece. Courses for teachers are also regularly offered, as well as courses for more advanced students. The Finnish Cultural Institute for the Benelux is based in Brussels. The institute builds bridges between cultural practitioners and institutions in Finland and the Benelux. We foster new creative collaborations and our program is infused with contemporary, sustainable and cross-disciplinary cultural initiatives. We work with artistic projects as well as societal themes aiming for equity, anti-racism and sustainability. Highlights include commissioning a dance performance for the first ever EU Sami Week organized in Brussels and supporting the work of Netherlands-based visual artist Arne Murphy. In the next year, we will be developing our Masculinities program, bringing the Dutch theatre piece Boys Won't Be Boys to Finland and supporting a permanent sculptural work by a Finnish artist in Belgium. For Together Again, the Institute has collaborated with Pehme Collectivi, aka The Soft Collective. Their workshop, Safer Spaces for Unhad Conversations, held in Amsterdam in May, is a continuation of their previous work in London. The work, created together with Zulu Green, a black queer rapper, singer and songwriter from Amsterdam, references community caring. Finn Agora, the Finnish Institute in Budapest, works to create and promote connections between Finland and Hungary in the fields of culture, science and economics. The Institute's goal is to strengthen and create connections between Hungary and Finland. This is done by events, seminars, professional collaborations and projects. This year's highlights are the annual Finnish film festival Finn Film Napok and the launch of a new artist residency collaboration. This autumn, Finagora will focus on creating new collaborations with art organizations in Budapest, organizing a workshop on minority languages and facilitating Finnish authors and artists visiting Budapest and being part of festivals and exhibitions. The Finnish Cultural Institute in Denmark is located in Copenhagen. The institute offers Finnish expertise in the fields of contemporary art and performing arts, creating and nurturing dialogue between Finnish and Danish professionals and audiences. All of the Institute's projects are executed in collaboration with Finnish and Danish partners. The Institute works with cultural exchange through exhibition projects, residency programs and other artistic projects. One of the highlights in the recent years has been a long-term collaboration with the artist Jenna Sotela and a Copenhagen-based artistic platform Prima. This autumn, the Institute will be focusing on our residency programs for visual artists, as well as bringing Danish and international arts and culture professionals to Finland and introducing them to Finnish artists and the local art scene. The Finnish Institute in the UK and Ireland is located in London. The Institute enables progressive personal and societal change through art and culture by enriching and diversifying connections between cultural professionals in Finland, Ireland and the United Kingdom. The Institute runs two programs, Arts and Society. Recent highlights include Finnish Art Prize Below Zero, won by Nastya Sederrönke, and a festival celebrating Tuva Jansson's queer heritage. This autumn, the Institute focuses on bringing British and Irish arts and culture professionals to study visits in Finland, and producing an exhibition in London showcasing underrepresented Finnish artists and designers. For the Together Again project, the Institute worked with the artist Minna Henriksson. Her work focused on the Finnish Writers' Association Kiela and its largely forgotten feminist writers from the 1930s. The work was originally shown earlier this year as part of a larger exhibition called 
editorial tables, reciprocal hospitalities, at the showroom gallery in London. The Ibero-American Institute of Finland is Finland's cultural institute working in Spain, Portugal and Latin America. Its main purpose is to promote Finnish culture and arts and dialogue in the areas where Spanish and Portuguese are spoken. The Institute's projects focus on visual arts, architecture and design, with a basis on human rights, gender equality and social inclusion. Recent projects include Sofia Arngrud's social art installation in Uruguay with 223 footballs and teenagers, as well as art exploring new AI technologies. The Cultural Center and Art Gallery are in the heart of Madrid, in the so-called Literary Quarter. The Institute works closely with local partners partners like festivals, museums and galleries. Like earlier this year, Klaus Harp and Emian Co's exhibition was held in Spain's National Design Museum. The Institute also collaborates with Nordic and European networks, especially in projects related to literature and film. For the Together Again project, the Ibero-American Institute worked with the Finnish-Nigerian photographer Uwa Idoose in Portugal, Spain and Finland. During his six-week residency in Oporto, Uwa worked with and photographed local children. Through his portraits, Uwa addresses the intersection between dreams, aspirations and community in the growth process of young people. Uwa's works were exhibited in Oporto, Madrid and now are in Helsinki. The Finnish Cultural Institute in New York is located in New York City in the United States. The Institute works across the fields of contemporary art, design and architecture, creating dialogue between Finnish and American professionals and audiences. The Finnish Cultural Institute in New York organizes residency programs, projects and events that foster critical dialogue. Recent highlights include supporting EU Sosiraya's solo exhibition at MoMA PSI 1 and the program Exercises in Togetherness, showcasing Finnish and American artists' work through notions of care and intimacy. This year, the Institute collaborates with the renowned Performa Biennial in realizing a Finnish Pavilion Without Walls program, which presents several new commissions by Finland-based artists working in the intersections of visual and performative arts. For Together Again, the Finnish Cultural Institute in New York has commissioned a work in the form of a public seminar and a video piece by visual artist Matti Aikio in collaboration with Vera List Center for Art and Politics and Frame Contemporary Art Finland. Aikio's work explores intersections of modern Western society and indigenous cultures, the Sami culture in particular. The Finnish Norwegian Cultural Institute promotes cultural exchange between Finland and Norway. Our aim is to strengthen cooperation, dialogue and mobility between professional art and cultural practitioners. The Institute is based in Oslo but has activities throughout Norway. Currently, the Institute runs the program Nord, Cultural Bridges. The objective is to strengthen networks and activities between cultural practitioners in northern Norway, northern Finland and Sami. This includes collaboration with Hiljaisus Festivali at the multidisciplinary festival Festspielen in Nord Norge and community arts project Vadsø Megacity. This autumn the institute focuses on bringing Finnish artists to residences in Norway. In September, a performing arts group will attend a residency in Dabli, Center for Performing Arts in Hammerfest, in collaboration with Svenska Kulturfunden. For the Together Again project, the Institute commissioned a third season of the podcast, The Middle Eastern Blog, produced and directed by the Post Theatre Collective. The podcast reflects on the global pandemic through the eyes of people belonging to cultural and linguistic minorities. Writers for the new season are Norway-based Nelly Winterhalden and Finland-based Louis Arvas. The Finnish Institute in France is an independent and multidisciplinary platform between Finland and France. In collaboration with different international institutions, academia and creators, the Institute engages actively with critical discourse through its on-site and off-site programming. In the most recent exhibition, called Imagine Every Day, Outsider Art Finland, the Institute presented a group of outsider artists exhibiting for the first time in Paris. Since 2022, the Institute also showcases Finnish gastronomy in the heart of Paris by offering a program of culinary events at the Café Ma. This autumn, the Institute's gallery has the honor of presenting the creations of an exceptional duo of designers, Yushlin Maula. 
The Institute continues its collaboration with Art University by organizing a showroom during Paris Fashion Weeks. For the Together Again project, the Institute continues to work with the artist Arbonikkanen, whose project looks at the ecological issues of garment production. Arbonikkanen worked with Lea Dominguez in a multidisciplinary project where they delve into the challenges of the fashion industry through discussions, workshops and artworks. The project's first forum, called Have Need, was held in Paris in June. The Finnish Institute in Estonia maintains, develops and strengthens Finnish-Estonian cultural cooperation in different fields of art, education and society. The Institute also keeps track of the societal developments in Estonia and participates in it through its programmes. Recent highlights include Elina Simonen's exhibition From Word to Image, which combines poetry, fashion design and photography. The exhibition was shown in eight different places in Estonia, Latvia and Finland. We also work on establishing the Finnish timeout Eratauko method developed to advance more constructive dialogues. This autumn we are excited to tell you about our new Erasmus Plus project which aims to give a chance for the youth of Helsinki and Tallinn to wrap together in workshops organized by two suburban youth centers. The Finnish Institute in Japan, located in Tokyo, promotes Finnish science, culture and higher education and the collaboration of these fields between Finland and Japan. The Institute identifies cooperation needs and opportunities and helps potential partners to find each other. The program consists of seminars and lectures, exhibitions and residences, just to name a few. The Institute's current research project compares Japanese Sansu and Finnish artists' homes. And in May, we held the 150th anniversary exhibition of Vivi Learn, one of Finland's first female architects, both in collaboration with Waseda University. In the autumn, the Finnish Institute in Japan continues with the ongoing series of AI seminars and is co-organizing a large-scale exhibition of a prominent Finnish ceramic artist. Autumn is also the time for the traditional Finnish-Swedish week. Hello, Tokyo! The Finnish Institute in Athens is an academic institution with a mission to carry out and promote the study of Greek, archaeology, history, language and culture from ancient times to the present day. As an academic institute, the Finnish Institute at Athens is classified in Greece as an archaeological school. This status allows it to carry out archaeological field work in Greece. Current projects focus on Agia Paraskevi of Arakamitai, Potike, Retimnon, Naxos of Sicily and Melitaya. The institute also provides education. During the autumn, we organize an introductory course on ancient Greek culture for Finnish undergraduate students, traveling with the students for approximately five weeks around the sites of ancient Greece. Courses for teachers are also regularly offered, as well as courses for more advanced students. The Finnish Cultural Institute for the Benelux is based in Brussels. The institute builds bridges between cultural practitioners and institutions in Finland and the Benelux. We foster new creative collaborations and our program is infused with contemporary, sustainable and cross-disciplinary cultural initiatives. We work with artistic projects as well as societal themes aiming for equity, anti-racism and sustainability. Highlights include commissioning a dance performance for the first ever EU Sami Week organized in Brussels and supporting the work of Netherlands-based visual artist Art Murphy. In the next year, we will be developing our Masculinities program, bringing the Dutch theatre piece Boys Won't Be Boys to Finland and supporting a permanent sculptural work by a Finnish artist in Belgium. For Together Again, the Institute has collaborated with Pehme Collective, aka The Soft Collective. Their workshop, Safer Spaces for Unhad Conversations, held in Amsterdam in May, is a continuation of their previous work in London. The work, created together with Zulu Green, a black queer rapper, singer and songwriter from Amsterdam, references community caring. Finn Agora, the Finnish Institute in Budapest, 
works to create and promote connections between Finland and Hungary in the fields of culture, science and economics. The Institute's goal is to strengthen and create connections between Hungary and Finland. This is done by events, seminars, professional collaborations and projects. This year's highlights are the annual Finnish film festival Finn Film Napok and the launch of a new artist residency collaboration. This autumn, Finagora will focus on creating new collaborations with art organizations in Budapest, organizing a workshop on minority languages and facilitating Finnish authors and artists visiting Budapest and being part of festivals and exhibitions. The Finnish Cultural Institute in Denmark is located in Copenhagen. The Institute offers Finnish expertise in the fields of contemporary art,
Okay, dear audience, welcome back together again uh, to this moment of being together again. Or maybe you're um, just now joining us, so also welcome to you. Um, either here at Audi, joining us live, or then online also. We're very happy and grateful that you are taking the time to be part of this important um, and very inspiring day. I think we had a very inspiring and beautiful and uh, um, yeah, very powerful morning. I felt like there was many moments that I wanted to be part of the discussion or say a comment or ask more questions. And I think that's always a sign of a good conversation. I think the morning was also a very good reminder to all of us that all these moments when we come together, they are actually only formed when we come together. We can have structures, we can have plans, we can have ideas, we always have a program, but then what actually happens between us, what all of us are saying or not saying or how we're present in this moment, it's what creates the moment and the coming together. Um, and I think we did a great job in the morning, so let's continue on that path. Whatever role feels good to you, you can make your own choices. You can listen, you can participate, ask questions, or maybe you're a presenter, speaker, artist. All roles are allowed. My name is Jani Toivola, and I will continue throughout the day as your host, host which I feel like is a great privilege. Um, let's move on with the program, because we have many things happening still throughout the afternoon. Uh, now it's for a time for our keynote presentation by Louis Schultz, partner at London-based Turner Prize-winning collective Assemble. Louis Schultz's keynote speech focuses on presenting Assemble's I ideology and ways of working collaboratively and site-specifically, including insights on the collective's recent and earlier projects. Assemble is a multidisciplinary collective working across architecture, design and art. Founded in 2010 to undertake a single self built project, Assemble has since delivered a diverse and award-winning body of work whilst uh, retaining a democratic and cooperative working method that enables built social and research-based work at a variety of scales, both making things and making things happen. <laughs> Please. Let's welcome on stage with a huge round of applause, Louis Schultz. The stage is yours. Thank you. Hello, thank you very much for having me. Um, and thank you, Yanni. Um, yeah, my name's Louis Schultz uh, from Assemble. Um, and um, I don't speak Finnish, <laughs> sorry. So I'm going to give the talk in English. Hope that's, hope that's okay. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to talk about a little bit about who we are, like introduce us for like people that, that don't know, um, and then, um, go into a bit more detail on two of our projects. So, uh, our work in Liverpool, um, and a more recent project, um, that we've been doing in London. Um, so just as a bit of background um the way that we we kind of started as like a group of friends out of university um people were kind of bored um the context was uh it was 2009 2010 um just had the financial crash um and there were kind of like lots of opportunities around um to to do something uh and this this is us um, so yes, yeah, so that's how we started these kind of ad hoc, like pop-up projects, I suppose. Um, so this is the Cinerolium, this is our very first project um, that we did with basically zero budget. I think we had three thousand um, pounds that we applied for, um, and yeah, it was a cinema in a petrol station that was there for like six or seven weeks, and we did it as just a bit of fun, really. Um, and um, then the next year we did a similar project, uh, Folly for a Flyover, um, which was another kind of pop-up thing. Uh, we managed to get some money through the Olympics that was happening in London the following year. And since then, um, I guess we've gone on to deliver a really large range of different types of projects. Um, I think people have called us before like professional amateurs or something like you know we kind of 
doing a lot of different things um may, maybe not doing them all that well um <laughs> uh so yeah so this is a skate park that we built as part of a public art commission in the south of england uh we've made some ceramics um we've uh, built this pavilion in japan um we worked on designing the local town square next next to our office in South London. Uh, we designed an art gallery also in South London, uh, as well as a this kind of large materials research and experimentation um, building laboratory, I suppose, uh, in Arles in the south of France. Um, we've published books. Uh, set up an adventure playground uh, in Glasgow. Uh, and we also helped to set up a fashion school in New Orleans. We worked with one of the first community land trusts in the UK uh, to bring back an area that the municipality had tried to destroy, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a bit. Uh, and we also set up a ceramics manufacturing company there in that in that same area. And more recently, we've worked on master planning of an industrial estate in Australia. Um, but yeah, this is kind of how we started. And this is kind of uh, a very early image of, of um, our first office, which was sort of in somebody's house, which is like a this house was like this kind of guardianship uh, property. Um, and so that's why it's so big. Um, it was kind of, uh, they were working as like, essentially like security guards for this building. Um, so I wanted to speak in a bit more detail about a couple of projects. So the first one is our work in Liverpool. Um, and this particular area in Liverpool is called Granby uh, and over the years uh, we've worked on a number of projects um, in the area and kind of remained committed to that area. Um, so I'll start with a bit of sort of context and history about this place. Um, so Liverpool is a port town um, and kind of its uh, historic wealth um, is has quite big links to the slave trade um and so it's actually home to one of the oldest black communities in the uk um and granby is that that place that part of liverpool um it was a historically black area um and so these images are from the 1960s um before deindustrialization when the area was really thriving as a working class area there were lots of jobs for people um and it was it was a good place to live this is an image kind of showing the original uh victorian development um rows of terraces which are very common in the uk um housing typology uh and these were built as factory housing uh, fa uh factory worker housing But then um, in the 1970s and 1980s, um, you had the industrialization and, you know, the movement of manufacturing industries um, out of the West, out of the UK, out of Liverpool. Um, and that caused major problems um, in what is substantially a working class city. Um, and so you had economic decline, uh, unemployment and the problems that are associated with that um, and eventually uprisings against a racist police force. But this area, rather than seeing these as kind of wider global economic issues, um, the local authority saw it as a problem with Granby and with the people there. Um, and so over the next few decades from the 70s onwards, there were successive top-down regeneration schemes that sought to demolish these houses and demolish the buildings and start again. And it's something that you see in a lot of places, you know, 
the architecture is blamed, the people are blamed, when really they are um, suffering from larger global economic forces. Um, and it's funny because nowadays in the UK, this type of housing, Victorian terraced housing, is seen as like, you know, the bourgeois dream place to live. And it's, um, you know, maybe the 1960s and 70s council estates that are the bad architecture. Whereas, you know, at this time, um, the terraces were seen as they were seen as that they were poorly maintained um and they were seen as um you know uh past their usable life and things like that um so a program of demolition was um was 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 planned um <clears throat> sorry something went wrong with this slide um where <laughs> sorry this the image on the left is supposed to be kind of aligned with the one on the right um but essentially um this kind of uh these drawings um describe the um the demolition and regeneration plans um that were that did actually happen uh in the area and <clears throat> in this drawing the gray uh plots are housing uh, and the coloured plots are either commercial or municipal or other non-residential buildings. So you can see that as built in 1950, um, the development um, had this street down the middle, a high street, um, which was also a thoroughfare. So, you know, people would automatically walk or drive down this street and so it could sustain um, commercial shops and things like that. By 2016, these regeneration schemes, um, which were based on the idea of low density housing um, and um, kind of cul-de-sacs, um, they'd cut off the high street and so it was no longer made any sense to walk down there. Um, and that kind of ripped the heart out of the area um, because you could no longer maintain the shops and so they're all, everything's boarded up. Um, and this is what became of it. Um, so it's a few kind of before and afters. So the, the council um, uh, kind of evicted people over time. And the, the, so this is... So this is like Google Street View, historic Street View. So this is 2009, and then this is the same view in 2012. Um, so then, same 2008 and 2012, 2008, 2012. Um, so to facilitate this program of demolition and regeneration as the council saw it um they obviously evicted people um boarded up houses um and they um the roofs that you see that have been removed that's not due to weathering or vandalism that the council removed the roofs um specifically to stop people squatting in the houses um because squat it, even though squatting is legal in the UK, um, they didn't want people squatting in there. Um, and this street still looks like this. <laughs> um, you know, even though the people have been evicted kind of decades ago. And this is a similar story in many parts of the formerly industrialized north of England. Um, and you see these kind of streets of uh, empty terraces. Um, so eventually there was some acknowledgement by the council that this policy had been a failure. <clears throat> and throughout that time, a small group of residents had consistently resisted evictions and had taken it upon themselves to look after their area and to stay there despite neglect from the local authority. 
kind of maintaining their own streets, you know, taking ownership of a place that was neglected. Um, they organized a market on the high street to replace some of the function of the high street, which had been destroyed. And they organized to resist the continued destruction of the area. So eventually they formed a community land trust, which is um, a type of ownership model of land that actually comes from uh, America. And it was one of the first community land trusts in the UK. It's quite a popular concept now, um, but back then it was quite unusual to be doing this. Um, and the reason was because the council had long ago run out of funding and willing to actually regenerate this area. And so they were left just with these boarded up houses. They, the council were really desperate for someone to come up with some idea of something to do. There was quite a famous thing in the UK where they had this scheme where they were selling houses for one pound. Um, and as long as you had the money to refurbish the house and you wanted to live there, then you could buy a house for one pound. So that was what that was this exact same area. Um, so the residents formed this community land trust, um, which basically takes the property into community ownership and they rent some properties, but they also sell some. But you sign a covenant um, or a contract when you buy it, um, which means that you can only sell it. Um, uh, the increase in price has to be based on an increase in local wages in the area. Um, and we worked with the Community Land Trust to develop an alternative master plan for the area uh, focused on retention of the terraces. Um, and yeah, it was actually not a kind of obvious thing to do, um, partly because new housing um, in the UK has um, major tax breaks. Um, so VAT or TVA basically is not... Um, is not charged on new buildings, new construction of housing, but on refurbishment it is, um, which is a little bit odd given the climate situation, but that is still how it is. And it's really um, a bung to the house building industry. Yeah, so this is some of the houses as we found them. Um, the design process. Um, so, yeah, just as a, a also forgot to mention, um, the um, we we got some funding from a philanthropist. Um, so he had heard about the one pound houses scheme and he wanted to um, develop some some of these terraces. So it was quite uh, it was quite lucky really um, to do with the funding. We we got funding from him to refurbish 10 of the houses um, with the community land trust. So this was the design process um, for um, these new interiors. Um, and yeah, it was very light touch. It had to be done very cheaply. Um, but we kind of focused it on this idea of like keeping it simple, but having a number of sort of precious elements. <laughs> um, So some of those things were the um, worktops, the cupboard door handles, um, this kind of shelving unit that we put in by the front door, and the fireplace surrounds. Uh, we made these cutout tiles, which are just made using standard white bathroom tiles, and then sort of cut out these colored um, glaze pigment it's like a basically a piece of paper and you just cut it out with scissors and you lay it on the tile and then you put it back in the kiln and fire it and the the color gets permanently um uh applied onto the tile but it was kind of just a, this very simple um idea um yeah we did these kind of 
Raku fired. I don't know if it's official Raku, but <laughs> we made these um, cupboard door handles um, using a barbecue. <laughs> um, and yeah, we made the fireplace surrounds were um, polished concrete, um, but they were made using um, some of the demolition rubble from the area. Um, so like old pieces of brick and things like that. So this was the sort of process that we used. This was in the storage warehouse. <laughs> um, yeah, and our kind of working practice for this project was this idea of working in residence, which come, which kind of is a thread that um, uh, runs through a lot of our work. Um, you know, just going somewhere and being there um, for a certain period of time. Um, and so obviously there were a lot of empty buildings. So we kind of took on one of these houses, which was, you know, used as a site office um, and there was somewhere to sleep there. And um, one of the local residents actually set up a little cafe in the back as well to serve the um to serve the construction workers. And these are some really nice drawings by Marie Jacoti, who is um, an artist who we commissioned. And yeah, a lot of projects have kind of developed out of this as well. Um, so having um, developed these um the sort of precious items the door handles and things we set up um a manufacturing business um and this was kind of off the back of the turner prize as well um we kind of used the publicity platform of that to set up this manufacturing business called granby workshop um to really um you know to to sort of develop those projects and to create a place for sort of employment local employment in in the area um we're also working with the community land trust to um build a new uh cafe as well on the high street to try to bring the high street um a bit more back into use with a flat or apartment um above and we also at the very beginning had this idea of some of the houses with the roofs removed, you know, they were just complete ruins. You know, there was grass growing um, on the floor. And so we kind of had this idea of creating a, a winter garden or like an indoor um, space that could be used by the local community. Um, and yeah, actually <laughs> managed to get it built um, sort of kind of unbelievably. Um, and yeah, so that was, was quite a nice outcome of it as well um and yeah we're still kind of yeah we're still working in liverpool kind of uh, almost 10 years later now um so yeah that's the liverpool Grammy project um and the other project i wanted to talk about was the house of anetta um which is a more recent project um that we've been working on um and it's quite an unusual kind of circumstance it doesn't doesn't happen to us every day or or kind of ever um but there was this quite big five-story house um in central london we kind of got a phone call saying you know oh um we own this house you know what do we do with it and so we didn't really know anything about it we didn't know much about who these people were or what it was um and so we just went to see it um and the um that the new owners of this house are this organization they're like a charity called the edith marion foundation um and they have this purpose to remove land and property from the flow of speculation and inheritance. Um, so it's kind of this idea of like land stewardship. Um, 
and they kind of own property on behalf of the users of that property is the idea um and this was the first thing that they had owned in the uk they have a lot of projects they're based in switzerland and they have a lot of projects across switzerland and germany um but they own all sorts of different types of property and it's not just for charitable use um they own um shopping malls and um farms and housing estates um all sorts of things um hotel they own a hotel um so the idea is not so much you know they do own also community buildings as well um but the idea is that the buildings are um the purpose of their purpose um, is to own the buildings on behalf of the users and the local community. Um, so it's quite an interesting concept. Um, so anyway, um, we went into this house um, and kind of at first sight, it was just sort of super overgrown and in complete disrepair. Um, on the top floor, there was a living space um, for someone, but it was, this is probably the tidiest room in the house. Um, and it was quite odd as well, because this was a person who was sort of living in poverty, really. There was no heating, there was no washing facilities. Um, so they were living in this very kind of simple existence, but um, in this multi-million dollar house in central London. Um, and the, the house had kind of been stripped back um, and only the sort of historic fabric of the building remained. But we soon discovered this rich archive of books and artworks kind of at first sight, the house just looked like a complete mess. Um, but as we worked through it, um, we saw that this person was obviously creating quite amazing work. And it was this woman, Annetta Pedretti. Um, she was a sort of obsessive polymath and maker of things. And she died quite suddenly and didn't leave a will. Um, so her family... Uh, thought that she would have wanted the house given to charity. And so that's why it went to the Edith Marion Foundation. Um, and she's Swiss as well. So <laughs> that's what that's the Swiss connection. Um, yeah, and she lived there from when she bought the house in 1980 till when she died in 2018. Um, she studied architecture um, and then did a PhD in cybernetics, um, which is the study of feedback loops. Um, so it's quite um, like sort of avant-garde, like very intellectual kind of thing, um, which she was very into. But it's, it's, um, it come the cy cy cybernetics, it comes from the Greek word, which means helmsman. Um, and it's this idea of like the helmsman of a ship. They, um, have a goal, they take in the surroundings um, and the information and then they steer the ship and then they take in the information again and they steer again and they keep doing that over and over again to try to keep on track. Um, and so it's this idea of a feedback loop. And people like Aneta thought that all intelligent systems follow this cybernetic process. Um, and they developed this huge body of work um and she was publishing these books she had this lithographic printer in the house and she was printing and binding herself like this whole publishing house worth of books on cybernetics and there's stacks and stacks of them in the house it's some quite kind of amazing um and she was had these super experimental things that she was just making um for seemingly not a lot of reason other than her own interest so on the right these images it, it's kind of hard to see but it it's a book that's been woven so like each the, the paper has been cut into ribbons and she's woven them together um and all of the writing is kind of going in different directions 
Um, and yeah, she's done this because she thought that the format of the book is too linear. Because, you know, it's this, this cybernetics feedback loop thing. Um, and a lot of the books as well, they take the form of a conversation. She was Her interest was the cybernetics of language. Um, and so she thought that um, knowledge comes out of conversations because a conversation is a form of feedback loop. Um, so the books often take the form of like people writing each other letters. Um, she also developed a cybernetic... Um, she, she developed a system of beekeeping based on cybernetic ideas, um, which I'm not too familiar with. Um, but, yeah, um, the beekeepers... <laughs> there's a separate presentation by the beekeepers on that. Um, <laughs> she was also um, an accomplished seamstress. Uh, she made these amazing clothes, sort of artistic art clothes, I suppose. Um, and she had these just quite cool um, art projects. So she was um, she developed this idea of like trying to um, make a flag for a multicultural society. Um, and there's loads of these prototypes, and they've been they're in the house. And there's these enormous flags, like three four meter wide um flags that she's sewn um and yeah and she was also very politically motivated um she was interested in property issues and land justice and <clears throat> she was also a committed feminist as well um but yeah and just hugely prolific across different media you know we found all of these videos um and that like almost all of these it's like this thing called horizon horizon part one horizon part two horizon part three horizon part four and what it is is like real time um video of like the sun setting over like hours and hours and hours like over a horizon in the sea and this is like one of her artworks um and she was a committed campaigner as well against a lot of the large developments that were displacing some of the working class residents in the area. Um, she worked on a range of construction projects. Um, she designed and built experimental structures um, and components um, and working with a range of different sort of crafts and materials. And she was interested in the conservation and restoration of the house to its former glory. Um, so she was making all of these spindles for the staircase with a lathe. Um, and yeah, she actually got quite a lot done. Um, so she made all new windows for the house and fitted them. Um, she, uh, a friend of hers carved this um, bracket that she's putting in there. Um, yeah, and just as like a bit of background, um, a bit of context for the area as well. Um, the house is like built as this quite grand house. Um, but in what was for centuries, um, a very industrial area. So, um, <clears throat> the brewery, so the green circle, that's the house. Um, there's a, a brewery. Um, which um, was built in 1666. Uh, the wholesale market was opened in 1682. Um, uh, the house was built in 1705. And then the railway was put in in 1840. And um, the bottom right image is from the 90s. You know, you can see that the industrial character of the area created sort of noise, smell and mess. The wholesale market opens at like 2 and 2 a.m. in the morning um and so it remained a quite a, like a working class area until the closure of the market and the brewery in in the 90s uh the area has been characterized by successive waves of immigration um sort of um uh, signified by this building which is um i think that as far as i know uh, the only building in the UK that's been a synagogue 
a church, a church, a synagogue, and a mosque. Um, so it um, was built as a church um, for Huguenot immigrants who are French um, textile workers um, who um, came in the 18th century. Um, it was converted in a synagogue um, for a wave of Jewish immigration in the early 20th century. And then finally, it became a mosque with um, Bengali immigration um, in the 1960s. Um, and all of those successive waves of immigration have taken on the, the rag trade, the textile um, and fashion trade um, that characterized the area um, until recently. Um, and these buildings, so there's a few streets like this, um, they were, um, up until the 90s, um, they were, most of them were split into smaller individual flats or apartments, um, some of which would be workshops and some of which would be um, housing. Um, but since then, um, the area has been kind of gentrified and many of these houses have been bought by wealthy people who have then restored them back to their former glory as single family housing, which is a bit of a double edged sword because they're kind of looking after them. But at the same time, you know, they're um, really withdrawing those spaces, which were, you know, would have housed many families um, and businesses and now, you know, only house sort of one family in these huge buildings. Um, and this is the house in the 70s, which, yeah, which would have been um, split into flats. Um, so the project that we want to do um, here um, is um, to set up a place for those affected by and working for land rights and housing justice. Um, and it's kind of a, is because of who the, uh, the owners, the foundation, what they believe in, you know, what Aneta was campaigning for and what we uh, as Assemble also, um, you know, see and think about. Um, and um, yeah, the fact that really um, so much inequality is based on access to land and access to property, um, but it's such a big issue um, there's not a lot we can do with this one house. Um, so the idea is really to just open it up um, for the use of people who are working um, in that in that area. So uh, sort of to develop a range of spaces for kind of study and research, for meetings, for public events, um, but also to maintain access to an archive of Aneta's work um, and of um, kind of land justice works as well. Um, so sort of somewhere where, you know, there's a lot of these disparate com campaign groups across the city um, campaigning on kind of individual issues, you know, a particular housing estate or a particular shopping mall or something. Um, and it's to bring together those people into one place to have a conversation, to have a, to have a bigger conversation, um, I suppose. Um, but yeah, we, we want to maintain... Um, Annetta's kind of, uh, we want to continue Annetta's work, um, acknowledging her life and commitment to the building. Um, and yeah, I suppose there's um, much like when we got there, you know, there's still, um, you know, a lot of work, uh, a lot of work to be done, a lot of work to be done. Um, it's just some of the horsehair plaster, um, all of this kind of um, historic fabric, um, which we want to maintain. And you can also see um, on the left, I don't know if you can actually see it, um, but Aneta was making these amazing marquetry panels. Can you see it? Not really. Um, anyway, these like wooden wall panels, because these houses would have been uh, wood paneled. Um, um, and she was making these kind of amazing inlaid um, uh, panels, which must have taken her ages to make. And she had them all in storage in the house. Um, so the idea is to kind of like continue her work um, in that way. 
Um, and yeah, again, it's this idea of working in residence. So like the first thing we did was to move into the house, um, you know, even though like there's no heating or like electrics or anything. Um, but, you know, we used um, a few opportunities and platforms. We kind of applied for funding here and there for mini projects. Um, you know, we did exhibitions and things like that. Um, we got funding from uh, the um, uh, arts funding body in the UK. And we we used bits of those funding to like, you know, put in some lighting or put in some power sockets or put in some internet here and there, which slowly, um, you know, brought the house back into use, but only in the summer months, but, um, you know, um, so yeah, so this was like a, for example, this was like a local campaign, which was campaigning for a community led master plan for the area. Um, because there's actually a lot of um, potential for redevelopment of the area because the brewery, even though it closed in the 90s, the brewery buildings are still there. Um, yeah, so this this campaign was called Save Brick Lane as so we kind of participated into that, in that. Um, and yeah, just an example of some of these kind of minimal interventions um, to bring the back house into use in some way with you know with very little money because we want to we want the house to work but it's kind of multi-million dollar project so we need to um uh so the idea is to um bring it into use and develop the idea um things that are happening in the house further um which will then hopefully lead to um more money coming in <laughs> um so we sort of built this kitchen and um uh brought the garden back um and sort of opened the space for um for use really so there's an architectural exhibition there was a sort of women in construction workshop um and loads of things like that um and this is kind of the house today um we also set up a new organization um and these are all of our trustees um to um yeah to basically manage the house um so kind of putting in that infrastructure um and all oh, right okay oh, there's one slide missing anyway um <laughs> i did have a slide that just showed um but you can actually it actually just showed some recent instagram posts from house of Veneta. so have a look at house of Veneta on Instagram um, and you can have a look and see some of the recent events and things that have been going on. Um, yeah, it's been a really nice summer at the house and it's kind of like, it feels like the project's really building momentum. Um, but yeah, it's it's definitely a case of like much done, but much still to do. Um, so yeah, um, that's it. Thank you very much. Um, and yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Two very different kind of projects. Uh, very interesting to hear the, and see the arc and the history of those, both of those projects. Um, I think we now have some time for questions, like 10, 15 minutes. Do we have any questions online? I'm just checking first if we have some questions ready from there. Maybe we take one from online and then from the audience here. Thank you. Yes, so we have one question from online. And the question is, how could this kind of project be scaled up to other places or cities? It's a really good question. <laughs> it's a really good question. And I think partly, you know, the House of Veneta project, the purpose of that is to try to answer that question because I don't, it's by no means simple. You know, the Liverpool Granby project is so dependent on the context. There's no way you could have something like that happen in London. You don't, there's no areas where there's loads of empty houses that people are, can't give them away. It doesn't exist. And... So, and, and, you know, land justice and um, people's rights to housing and things like that are a massive problem in, you know, in London as well and in lots of other places where there's not loads of empty buildings. So I think um, although it can be um, 
it can be uh, a useful um, paradigm for places in similar contexts, it, it really relies on a particular context. And it also relies on the Community Land Trust were a group of individuals who are really committed and motivated and did so much work for free, you know, to make it happen. And you need people like that. Um, so, yeah, tough one. Thank you. Do we have some more questions maybe from the audience here as well, if there's anything you want to ask or comment also? I think it can be a, a shared comment or, or some dialogue if you don't have a question. Yes, we have here. Just a few seconds, get you a microphone. Hi, Louis. Um, thanks Hi. very much. I've followed your name, not your personal name, but a symbol name for years, but I've never heard the details, so this has been very fascinating. Um, in, in all of the cases, I assume, but in the two you've given us, you didn't mention how you... Um, worked with the community to learn what they wanted so what that dialogue was with how it how it was formed and how you progressed that dialogue with the community particularly Graham, because i guess this house in spitalsfield is rather more with the with the foundation than necessarily the local community yeah i mean well in granby again we were very dependent on the community land trust because they were the local community yeah, yeah. Yeah. They represented it and they they knew everybody. So, you know, we were very linked to it, you know. And I think a lot of the time when you get development projects, it's the complete opposite, you know. It's like someone's just bought some land and they want to do something and they're like, how do I get the community on board? What's the process? What's the secret, you know? And it's like, well, the secret is to just do something that people want, that they might like. And, um, you know, it's not, it's not about getting people on board with the project when your the project is, you know, giving people affordable housing. Like people are not going to complain about that. Does that make sense? Well, they might want a stake in it. Though. They might want to to, to shape it. Yeah, I and guess. I think I, the, I think in Granby you had something that was they were they were asking you for the conversation. Yeah, I think that's the difference, is it? Also, the community land trust model is a democratic model. Yes. So, like anyone can join the community land trust. You know, you pay one pound per year or whatever so mm. anyone can join and anyone can have a say so it's democratic so you know if if you set up a democratic organization then again you know that that's giving people it's not just giving people a say that's token it's giving people a real genuine stake in ownership um and i think often that's what's missing it's like it's not about consultation it's about ownership really thank you Thank you. Do we have more questions? Maybe, maybe I can ask one and yeah. people can still think if they have something more to ask. Maybe to ask um, a little bit more about the history, how the collective kind of came together. And yeah. is there something specific that in your working culture you have to take into consideration when you work with this kind of projects, which is maybe something different than if you, you would be like a commercial company or, or something yeah. different? Yeah, I mean, I we, we are a commercial company. Um, okay, you know, sorry. We're, we're not, yeah. yeah, no, no, okay, sorry. that's right. But we're not, I mean, I guess we're not like a big corporate firm, but yeah, you know, we but are. But the angle that you have to kind of. Yeah, but as a, as a sort of collective, um, yeah, I guess it is different because there isn't this kind of like single point of focus, like focused around an individual, like a figurehead. Um, and yeah, I mean, that, I guess has a lot of repercussions for how we work because um you know decision making like we're quite slow with decision making you know we're quite we are almost like a big company in that respect you know we can't just you can't just phone up the boss and like ask them to make a decision you know it, it needs to go we have a lot of very formal processes that we that we have to follow because when you don't have a single person in charge you need to have uh, sort of almost like a legal system do you know what I mean that everybody subscribes to um so so yeah I think that's um but yeah there's there's a whole we have a whole uh system you know to to um maintain the collective you know what happens when we get new people what happens when people leave you know how do we make decisions um it's uh yeah mm. and it's something that we've kind of 
had to develop over time because when we started we just like called ourselves you know just like group i was like yeah we're a collective you know mm -hmm. but then it's like well when people start working for you what are they in the collective or not like you mm -hmm. know do they are they coming suddenly like coming to all the meetings or some of the you know what i mean so right. um so we now have a system where um once you've been working for two years full time then you become a sort of partner and then the, the partners make all of the key decisions so that's how it works so it's not fully employee owned um but it's yeah it's partially employee owned yeah thank you do we have more questions or comments one in the back yes thank you hi louis thank hi, you carolina. so much <laughs> um i'm carolina Korpilahti from the finnish institute in the uk and ireland uh we met uh, in July yep, in London. <laughs> so um, I'm really um, interested in hearing some more about your studio space in London. I know you've just moved, but yes. at least what I saw was a community of different creatives working together and workshops, um, who, yep. people who are not necessarily part of your collective. Yeah, so yeah. I'd lo love to hear something about that. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, so this is a whole part of what we do that I have just not mentioned at all. But basically, um, uh, another part of our business is that um, we we run workspace, uh, kind of like industrial workspace. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so we have a uh, we have the lease on like a large industrial building, uh, and then we sort of sublet that building to a number of um industrial businesses so um but it's it's kind of like it tends to be like small scale um so and we tend to try to focus on people that we would want to work with to try to form a like mini sort of economy you know of like people who can help each other and give each other work so um yeah whether they're like carpenters furniture makers fabricators metal workers those kind of people um and yeah we've just moved um to a new site in bow uh which is in east london um and yeah i'm really excited about it it's it's basically like just some 1990s industrial buildings and then like a big piece of land like sort of big yard um uh where we can do like put together larger projects um and yeah and like work with those people who are sharing sharing the space um, so and it's part of a kind of you know it works for us on that level but it also you know we've been you know we see this kind of like erosion of industrial space in the city um and it's something that we're trying to fight against because we you know we really believe in um you know things being made like where they're used um and sort of keeping things local in that in that respect um you know rather than it all being you know somewhere you can't see um somewhere else another country another place you know bringing back like the noise and the mess and <laughs> mm -hmm. you know but it's not it's not like a beautiful space it's not like architecturally designed you know uh <laughs> um it's it's very it's a very sort of pragmatic um space yeah wonderful thank you very much thank you thoughts. yeah thank you thank you very much thank for you i appreciate it thank you very much Some more people joining us. Welcome. Okay, let's move on with uh, with the program. My big challenge is to try to keep with the schedule because there are so many interesting interesting things going on. Um, next, we will hear a presentation of a work that is also created for the for the Together Again Festival. 
Empathy Intervention with Enni Kukka Tuomala. Geography of Empathy by Finnish Empathy Artist Enni Kukka Tuomala invites participants to join a guided exploration of emotional landscapes around the city center of Helsinki and the Kurkimäki neighborhood in East Helsinki. Enni Kukka Tuomala is a Finnish empathy artist based in London. Her vision is to transform empathy from an individual feeling to a radical and collective power for social and environmental change to fight the growing global empathy deficit. Dear audience, let's welcome on stage Enni Kukka Tuomala. <laughs> Thank you very much, Yanni. Um, it's lovely to see you all. Um, first and foremost, I want to say a huge thank you um, to the Together Again team for inviting me to be a part of this brilliant festival. It's been so exciting and inspiring to see all the work. And I'm, I'm thrilled to be following Louis because I think the themes that you finished with around the use of space, especially in cities, um, the change in ownership of public becoming private. It's great to see you working on private becoming public again. So I feel like it's it's quite a good good program to to follow. So thank you for that. I'm Enni Kukka Tuomala and I'm an empathy artist. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that, what that means. But first and foremost, um, I'm here to introduce this new piece of work that was commissioned for the festival, Geography of Empathy. And Geography of Empathy really explores the themes of psychogeographics, which, psychogeography, which, which is um, a movement bo born in the 1950s by the letter letterists and the situationists that really explores the laws and the different effects of geographical spaces on how we as humans behave and especially what we feel. And that's really the first question I wanted to propose to you today. How does it feel to share public space? This is something I, I'm, I'm going to invite you to consider a little bit because we're sharing a public space or a semi-public space today. This is a space that's open to all. It's free. Thank you to the institutes for that. But it's also a space that we've defined here together today. So as Yanni beautifully said this morning, the space has sort of taken different shapes. The emotions in the space have evolved throughout the morning, throughout the day. So perhaps it's something we could all reflect on a little bit now and, and throughout the rest of the afternoon. How does it feel to share this space today? What are we each bringing into the space? What are we perhaps feeling around us? What are we open to receiving? Um, and maybe it's something we can track a little bit throughout the afternoon. But that's what really geography of empathy is about. It's about exploring the emotional imprints, the emotional landscapes of urban life, of urban experience, thinking about it both from the perspective of the built environment that, that Louis has, has talked a lot about, but also in terms of the natural environment that we do still have some, uh, some of natural environments left in, in cities and especially the sort of human connections, encounters, human to non-human connections and encounters that also really define our urban experience. Thinking about this notion of public space and share, uh, ownership of, of space, um, this is a theme that has been a big topic in my practice for years now. And it's interesting thinking about the themes of today, um, together alone and together again, we're born out of the pandemic, as we heard earlier. I don't think we've ever been more aware of shared space than we are today. And that's probably going to be something that is going to stick with us uh, for a long time, if, if not forever. Um, I've been exploring it as a part of my empathy practice um, even before the pandemic and really looking at how empathy manifests in spaces, but also how can we make more space for empathy? My practice is very multidisciplinary and, and comes to life in different me mediums, but space is a really big topic of it and a big focus of it. Um, so it's, it's really exciting to be sharing this piece of work with you today because I think This, this notion of space is something we, we simply encounter on a second by second everyday basis. We all have space, we take space, but the space we're able to occupy or inhabit really depends on the context, depends on where we are, depends on who we're with. And that's what the piece explores as well. But thinking about empathy and space and the relationship between empathy and space is, is, is quite 
a layered and multifaceted topic. And thinking about this, this idea of, of space and empathy, it's, it's almost impossible not to start with where this all began. Um, and I wanted to make a reference to Yanni, our, our brilliant host today. Um, a big part of my work, a, a growing body of work that started over five years ago now, explores the relationship between empathy and power. And I think power is something important to talk about when we're talking about space, um, because power ultimately exists in every space, however it's defined or undefined. Um, this is a body of work that started um, with a project in the Parliament of Finland, which we're actually situated across the square from today. And it started in collaboration with Yanni uh, when he was a, an MP at the time. Exploring the idea of, of empathy and power and how power impacts our ability to connect with ourselves, with each other and with our environment is, is key. And it feels especially poignant to be here at Audi today. The square outside is called Kansalai Story, which is the citizen's square. And we're only a few hundred meters away from the parliament that just began its session this week. So thinking about empathy, space, power feels especially poignant here today. I guess this idea of, of power and empathy really comes down to this, this fundamental question that the geography of empathy piece began from as well. Is there space for empathy in civic life? And I deliberately chose this, this language around civic life because it, I feel like it encompasses so much of, of even the things we've been talking about today. Public life, public spaces, communities, however we want to define that. Um, and I, I fundamentally, as an empathy artist, believe that empathy has such a key, absolutely fundamental, radical role in helping us both define shared spaces, but also perhaps redefine what shared spaces stand for. Geography of empathy began from this thought and began from a long piece of research uh, that I wanted to touch on because this is all what sort of led to the piece that you're, you're going to be experiencing hopefully today. Um, continuing these themes on empathy and power, um, I began earlier this year a new project called The Election Artist, starting to quite ambitiously map empathy all across Finland, right in the lead up to our general election, which took place in April. Um, in the final week before the election, I traveled across the 13 electoral districts of Finland, documenting the conversations, the debates, the spaces um, that were um, sort of revitalized or vitalized in the lead up to the election as, as political debate and civic life really uh, grew and, and became a huge, huge focus. And one of the things that really emerged in this project is, as I was documenting and researching this moment in time across the country, interviewing people, over 120 people in, in that one week, trying to understand how they felt about the country, how they felt about civic life, public discourse and dialogue in this moment. One of the things that really emerged specifically in relation to empathy was this question around empathy and privilege, which I think is important for us to consider as well. Fundamentally, we must ask, is empathy in itself a privilege? That is a question I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave you to ponder because it doesn't have a simple answer, but I feel like it's, it's absolutely essential. And as an empathy artist, I think it's vital for me to consider that in my own practice, in my work, but also in these spaces that we inhabit as we try and better understand each other, understand each other's experiences, needs, wants, our unique skills and talents and stories that we all bring to these shared spaces who actually gets to feel empathy and who gets to receive it? Um, these are big questions that the geography of empathy starts to ask. It by no means answers all of those questions, but it starts to ask them. And this leads me to geography of empathy, which really was born from an ongoing project that is taking place in the Kurkimaki suburbs in East Helsinki. This project began in April, and it's a continuation of a longer term project that I've been working on since 2019. Uh, the project began in London 
in East London, not too far from Bow, um, and continued in Cambridge during the pandemic. And this is the first time the project is in Finland. Um, it's realized in partnership with the Diakoness Foundation and the Rinnekodit Silta housing unit. And Rinnekodit Silta is a new housing unit offering supported living to Helsinki residents who've experienced long-term homelessness. And since April, I've been working in the Kurkimaki area with the new residents of Silta, as well as the existing residents, on together starting to explore what empathy means in the area, what empathy means to the people that have lived there for a long time, to the people that may have just moved there, but also to the non-humans that share these areas and spaces with us. And in this process, these themes around space, ownership of space, who's welcome in spaces, especially in public spaces, have become such, such big topics. And this really led to the original conversations um, around the piece for the festival to really start together examining, especially as we are in Audi today, which is in the center of Helsinki, um, certainly this cultural hub, uh, hub of culture, civic life, um, hub of commercial life. What does it mean to approach it from the perspective of this specific geography around the space that we're in today? But look at that in contrast, for example, the area that I've been working in for the last almost six months. How does our environment impact our emotions? I think that's the fundamental question. Um, research shows us that it impacts our emotions a lot, and I'm, I'm sure every one of you here would agree. But how does it impact us? And how does that shift in different locations, different spaces, but as we go on, even throughout our day, how does that impact our emotions? But also through that, our ability to be present, our, our ability to connect with one another, with ourselves, and with our environment. This is something that I, I wish we were more aware of and, and brought more into our day to day. And that's really what the geography of empathy piece invites you to examine. Um, the piece consists of a new sound work that is available on the Together Again website. Um, I'll share a QR code to it at the end. And that's a piece that you can do anywhere in the world, in your own time, in any public space of your choosing. Um, it's about 20 minutes long, and it's a series of guided explorations, little thought experiments to look at our relationship with the urban environment around us. Um, it really guides you through these, these little exercises, little activities in relation to the space that you're in. And I, I would really urge you and invite you all to, to give it a go if you, if you wish. Alongside of the sound piece um, is a series of two guided walks, the second of which is play taking place today after the festival. So if you haven't signed up yet, we still have a few places available. It starts at 5.30 at the end of the festival. And it's a one and a half hour long guided exploration of the area of the city centre, where we'll be doing similar little invitations and activities together. Coming back to this idea of public space and empathy. We're so focused in public space around moving around, getting from one place to another, that we often don't pay so much attention to the less obvious elements of our environments and our surroundings. And one of the things in this process of developing the peas, what I've been working on is starting to look at these areas in a way where we strip away all the preconceived notions, all the specific rules and laws that, that really govern how we interact with space and how in, we interact with each other in space. So I've been working on this series of maps that really strips it down to the basics of being able to navigate an area. And this is something we've been doing uh, with my collaborators in, in the Kurkimaki neighborhood over the last few weeks. So the similar exercises that we'll be doing on the walk today, we've been doing in Kurkimaki over the last couple of weeks. Here are some photos that we've actually taken in those explorations in trying to look at our neighborhoods and our areas through very literal different perspectives, which is what empathy is all about. And that's really what... Ultimately, um, I want to ask you to, to consider. We are increasingly living in urban environments um, and 
therefore must navigate these built environments, natural environments, as well as the people and the, the non-humans that we cohabit these spaces with, how does it actually feel from an emotional perspective? How does the city feel? How do these landscapes feel to us, to our fellow humans, to our fellow non-humans? I hope you'll join me in the walk later today to explore a bit of a blank canvas of the Helsinki city centre, hopefully from a new perspective, even if it's a very familiar area to you, um, and to hopefully notice things that you may have missed before, or maybe things that might deserve a second look. So ultimately, perhaps something to ponder, do you feel connected to your environment? Wherever you live, wherever you might work, wherever you might pass through, do you feel connected? Do you feel connected to those spaces? And do those spaces help or hinder you feel connected to yourself and to others? Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Enni Kukka. Can I maybe ask one more question that if there's somebody yes. and when I think there is still somebody who wants to join the walk, what yes. do we need to do if there's some spaces left? Perfect. So <laughs> we're leaving at 5.30 outside the library. So I think from the latest numbers, we have about four spots left. So if you want to join us, please meet us at 5.30 at the front entrance of the library and you'll be very welcome to join us. And here's a QR code to the sound piece as well. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, <laughs> Enni Kukka. Um, now we're going to have a short coffee break for 15 minutes. You can use the restrooms, have some coffee. We still have some snacks there and we continue uh, at 2.15 with the program. Thank you. The Institute in Athens is an academic institution with a mission to carry out and promote the study of Greek, archaeology, history, language and culture from ancient times to the present day. As an academic institute, the Finnish Institute of Athens is classified in Greece as an archaeological school. This status allows it to carry out archaeological work in Greece. Current projects focus on Magia Paraskevi of Parakamitai, Kotike, Retimna, Naxos of Sicily and Melikai. The institute also provides education. During the autumn, we organize an introductory course on ancient Greek culture for Finnish undergraduate students, traveling with the students for approximately five weeks around the sites of ancient Greece. Courses for teachers are also regularly offered, as well as courses for more advanced students. The Finnish Cultural Institute for the Benelux is based in Brussels. The institute builds bridges, between cultural practitioners and institutions in Finland and the Benelux. We foster new creative collaborations and our program is infused with contemporary, sustainable and cross-disciplinary cultural initiatives. We work with artistic projects as well as societal themes aiming for equity, anti-racism and sustainability. Highlights include commissioning dance performance for the first ever EU Sami Week organized in Brussels and supporting the work of Netherlands-based visual artist Park. In the next year, we will be developing our Masculinities program, bringing the Dutch theatre piece Boys Won't Be Boys to Finland and supporting a permanent sculptural work by a Finnish artist in Belgium. For Together Again, the Institute has collaborated with Fehme Collective, aka The Soft Collective. Their workshop, Safer Spaces for Unhad Conversations, held in Amsterdam in May, is a continuation of their previous work in London. The work, created together with Zulu Green, a black queer rapper, singer and songwriter from Amsterdam, references community caring. Finn Agora, the Finnish Institute in Budapest, works to create and promote connections between Finland and Hungary in the fields of culture, science and economics. The Institute's goal is to strengthen and create connections between Hungary and Finland. This is done by events, seminars, professional collaborations and projects. This year's highlights are the annual Finnish film festival Finn Film Napok and the launch of a new artist residency collaboration. This autumn, Pinagora will 
focus on creating new collaborations with art organizations in Budapest, organizing a workshop on minority languages and facilitating Finnish authors and artists visiting Budapest and being part of festivals and exhibitions. The Finnish Cultural Institute in Denmark is located in Copenhagen. The Institute offers Finnish expertise in the fields of contemporary art and performing arts, creating and nurturing dialogue between Finnish and Danish professionals and audiences. All of these news projects are executed in collaboration with Finnish and Danish partners. The Institute works with cultural exchange through exhibition projects, residency programs and other artistic projects. One of the highlights in the recent years has been a long-term collaboration with the artist Jan Marasuna and a Copenhagen-based artistic platform, Pride. This autumn, the Institute will be focusing on our residency programs for visual artists, as well as bringing Danish and international arts and culture professionals to Finland and introducing them to Finnish artists and the local art scene. The Finnish Institute in the UK and Ireland is located in London. The Institute enables progressive personal and societal change through art and culture by enriching and diversifying connections between cultural professionals in Finland, Ireland and the United Kingdom. The Institute runs two programs, arts and society. Recent highlights include Finnish art prize below zero, won by Nastya Sedenkönke and a festival celebrating Kura Nasa's queer heritage. This autumn, the Institute focuses on bringing British and Irish arts and culture professionals to study visits in Finland and producing an exhibition in London showcasing underrepresented Finnish artists and designers. For the Together Again project, the Institute worked with the artist Minna Hendrickson. Her work focused on the Finnish Writers Association Kiela and is largely forgotten feminist writers from the 1930s. The work was originally shown earlier this year as part of a larger exhibition called Editorial Tables, Reciprocal Hospitalities at the Showroom Gallery. The Ibero-American Institute of Finland is Finland's cultural institute working in Spain, Portugal and Latin America. Its main purpose is to promote Finnish culture and arts and dialogue in the areas where Spanish and Portuguese are spoken. The institute's projects focus on visual arts, architecture and design with a basis on human rights, gender equality and social inclusion. Recent projects include Sofia Andrews' social art installation in Uruguay with 223 footballs and teenagers, as well as art exploring new AI technologies. The Cultural Center and Art Gallery are in the heart of Madrid in the so-called Literary Quarter. The Institute works closely with local partners like festivals, museums and galleries. Like earlier this year, Klaus Harpanemi and Co's exhibition was held in Spain's National Design Museum. The Institute also collaborates with Nordic and European networks, especially in projects related to literature and film. For the Together Again project, the Ibero-American Institute worked with the Finnish Nigerian photographer Uwa Idoose in Portugal, Spain and Finland. During his six-week residency in Oporto, Uwa worked with and photographed local children. Through his portraits, Uwa addresses the intersection between dreams, aspirations and community in the growth process of young people. Uwa's works were exhibited in Oporto, Madrid and now are in Helsinki. The Finnish Cultural Institute in New York is located in New York City in the United States. The Institute works across the fields of contemporary art, design and architecture, creating dialogue between Finnish and American professionals and audiences. The Finnish Cultural Institute in New York organizes residency programs, projects and events that foster critical dialogue. Recent highlights include supporting EU City Bayer's solo exhibition at Noma, PSI 1, and the program Exercises in Togetherness, showcasing Finnish and American artists' work in notions of care and intimacy. This year, the Institute collaborates with the renowned Reforma Bayanio in realizing the new pavilion without the artist's program, which presents several new commissions by Finland based artists working on the intersections of visual and performative arts. Together again, the Finnish Cultural Institute in New York has commissioned a work in the form of a public seminar and a video piece by visual artist Matthew Ayer in collaboration with the 
of Vivi Learn, one of Finland's first female architects, both in collaboration with Waseda University. In the autumn, the Finnish Institute in Japan continues with the ongoing series of AI seminars and is co-organizing a large-scale exhibition of a prominent Finnish ceramic artist. Autumn is also the time for the traditional Finnish-Swedish week, Hello Tokyo. 
The Finnish Institute in Athens is an academic institution with a mission to carry out and promote the study of Greek, archaeology, history, language and culture from ancient times to the present day. As an academic institute, the Finnish Institute in Athens is classified in Greece as an archaeological school. This status allows it to carry out archaeological field work in Greece. Current projects focus on Agia Baraskeri of Arakamitai, Otike, Retinoma, Naxos in Sicily, and Melitaya. The institute also provides education. During the autumn, we organize an introductory course on ancient Greek culture for Finnish undergraduate students, traveling with the students for approximately five weeks around the sites of ancient Greeks. Courses for teachers are also regularly offered, as well as courses for more advanced students. Finnish Cultural Institute for the Benelux is based in Brussels. The institute builds bridges between cultural practitioners and institutions in Finland and the Benelux. We foster new creative collaborations and our program is infused with contemporary, sustainable and cross-disciplinary cultural initiatives. We work with artistic projects as well as societal themes aiming for equity, anti-racism and sustainability. Highlights include commissioning a dance performance for the first ever EU Sami Week organized in Brussels and supporting the work of Netherlands-based visual artist Arne Murphy. In the next year, we will be developing our Masculinities program, bringing the Dutch theatre piece Boys Won't Be Boys to Finland and supporting a permanent sculptural work by a Finnish artist in Belgium. For Together Again, the Institute has collaborated with Pehme Collective, aka The Soft Collective. Their workshop, Safer Spaces for Unhad Conversations, held in Amsterdam in May, is a continuation of their previous work in London. The work, created together with Zulu Green, a black queer rapper, singer and songwriter from Amsterdam, references community caring. Finn Agora, the Finnish Institute in Budapest, works to create and promote connections between Finland and Hungary in the fields of culture, science and economics. The Institute's goal is to strengthen and create connections between Hungary and Finland. This is done by events, seminars, professional collaborations and projects. This year's highlights are the annual Finnish film festival Finn Film Napok and the launch of a new artist residency collaboration. This autumn, Finagora will focus on creating new collaborations with art organizations in Budapest, organizing a workshop on minority languages and facilitating Finnish authors and artists visiting Budapest and being part of festivals and exhibitions. The Finnish Cultural Institute in Denmark is located in Copenhagen. The Institute offers Finnish expertise in the fields of contemporary art and performing arts, creating and nurturing dialogue between Finnish and Danish professionals and audiences. All of the Institute's projects are executed in collaboration with Finnish and Danish partners. The Institute works with cultural exchange through exhibition projects, residency programs and other artistic projects. One of the highlights in the recent years has been a long-term collaboration with the artist Jenna Sotela and a Copenhagen-based artistic platform Primer. This autumn, the Institute will be focusing on our residency programs for visual artists, as well as bringing Danish and international arts and culture professionals to Finland and introducing them to Finnish artists and the local art scene. The Finnish Institute in the UK and Ireland is located in London. The Institute enables progressive personal and societal change through art and culture by enriching and diversifying connections between cultural professionals in Finland, Ireland and the United Kingdom. The Institute runs two programs, Arts and Society. Recent highlights include Finnish Art Prize Below Zero, won by Nastya Sadarenke, and a festival celebrating Tuva Jansson's queer heritage. 
This autumn, the Institute focuses on bringing British and Irish arts and culture professionals to study visits in Finland and producing an exhibition in London showcasing underrepresented Finnish artists and designers. For the Together Again project, the Institute worked with the artist Minna Henriksson. Her work focused on the Finnish Writers' Association Kiila and its largely forgotten feminist writers from the 1930s. The work was originally shown earlier this year as part of a larger exhibition called Editorial Tables, Reciprocal Hospitalities at the Showroom Gallery in London. The Ibero-American Institute of Finland is Finland's cultural institute working in Spain, Portugal and Latin America. Its main purpose is to promote Finnish culture and arts and dialogue in the areas where Spanish and Portuguese are spoken. The Institute's projects focus on visual arts, architecture and design with a basis on human rights, gender equality and social inclusion. Recent projects include Sofia Andrews' social art installation in Uruguay with 223 footballs and teenagers, as well as art exploring new AI technologies. The Cultural Center and Art Gallery are in the heart of Madrid in the so-called Literary Quarter. The Institute works closely with local partners partners like festivals, museums and galleries. Like earlier this year, Klaus Harp and Emian Co's exhibition was held in Spain's National Design Museum. The Institute also collaborates with Nordic and European networks, especially in projects related to literature and film. For the Together Again project, the Ibero-American Institute worked with the Finnish-Nigerian photographer Uwa Idoase in Portugal, Spain and Finland. During his six-week residency in Oporto, Uwa worked with and photographed local children. Through his portraits, Uwa addresses the intersection between dreams, aspirations and community in the growth process of young people. Uwa's works were exhibited in Oporto, Madrid and now are in Helsinki. The Finnish Cultural Institute in New York is located in New York City in the United States. The Institute works across the fields of contemporary art, design and
I didn't ask for, for permission. I just started to talk. <laughs> Too impulsive. Let's start again. We are back. We are here. We are ready to continue with the program. Sorry to be so strict with the time, but we have so many interesting things, and I want to just guide the ship so that we can, we can all also leave here on time, but also get to experience all the wonderful presentations and discussions that we still have ahead of us. Um, next, we're going to uh, hear and see a presentation, a reading group with Minna Henriksson, Lily Hall and Karolina Korpilahti. On uh, Sunday, uh, 3rd of September, a reading circle took place here at Audi Library from 1 to 3 p.m. Taking as a starting point the Kiela Feminist Archive, it was a gathering of 10 peers who share a working focus across literary studies, literature and or visual art practice, each deeply embedded in the intersections of feminism and leftism. This was the second iteration of the reading circle following on from the first which took place earlier this year in London at the showroom in April 2023. The reading circle group are Yvonne Billimore, Monica Cadua, Lily Hall, Minna Henriksson, Eal Karhu, Carolina Kusia, Sara Maboba, Tuukka Salonen, Shubangi Singh and Marta Tuomala. What follows is a series of experts and texts selected by each member of the group, responding to two short stories by Iris Urto. Over the next 10 minutes, Minna Henriksson, Ivan Billimore, Lily Hall and Karolina Korpilahti, members of the Kila Feminist Archive Reading Circle, will, live, will deliver this performative reading. Please, the stage is yours with a big round of applause. Thank you. How can we build systems of care? if we don't even care for our own bodies and the bodies of others. A politics of refusal is an ancient tactic. Tricia Hersey, Rest is Resistance, a Manifesto 2022. Lock up your libraries, if you like. But there's no gates, no lock, no bolts that you can set upon the freedom of my mind. Virginia Woolf, A Room of One's Own, 1929. <clears throat> Let us never cease from thinking. What is the civilization in which we find ourselves? What are these ceremonies and why should we take part in them? As a woman, I have no country. As a woman, I want no country. As a woman, my country is the whole world. Virginia Woolf, Three Guineas, 1938. Nochnitsha was home to women who honored matter. They molded what was ephemeral, like words, into objects. Elshbieta Apshinska, Noahuta Bestiari, 2021. We wanted a holistic politics and we got a little stall in the vending booths of the academic world. And this is our little stall where our books are being sold and we also have our place. Hierarchies began to appear and being women was superseded by being faculty and being students. I feel personally that we took a lot from the lives of ordinary people from the street and we never gave back to the women from whom we took. And that really is what intellectuals typically do. Suddenly, all writing on ideology and politics ceased. And in fact, culture became an alibi for becoming non-political. Hamani Badgeri, in conversation with Linda E. Carty and Chandra Talpidi Mohanty in Feminist Freedom Warriors 2015. Intimacy is essential, as well as the terrain of pleasure and peak experience. Normative modes of intimacy often limit its potential, while our experiences and material conditions can make it hard to imagine 
let alone desire, our lives being any other way. Imagining that things could be radically different can be a way to reject the exploitation, oppression and violence in the world, helping us reimagine ourselves as capable of rebellion. Sophie K. Rosa, Radical Intimacy, 2023. To fully feel ourselves part of this interrelated world and translate this perception into social terms. Indeed, thinking of the art sector as a space for experimenting with new models and extensible prototypes, not for us, but for everyone. Elenia Chaleo, Recreate the Globe, 2022. In capitalist political economies, illness is seen as a drag on productivity. Frequent or prolonged illness is often seen as disqualifying or devaluing an individual's labor power. There is a rush to be over with ill health and get back to work as quickly as possible. Rest is scarce and all treatment under health capitalism is rationed along class lines. Beatrice Adler Bolton and Artie Fierkant, Health Communism 2023. Today, I was lying on the grass and pretended to be on the lake. Occasionally, I went inside to dip myself in the bathtub I have many bills to pay. This can't go on anymore. Fences, side by side. Nobody cares to take fences away. There they are, and they are built higher and higher on all sides. Why doesn't anyone come from outside? Why am I left inside the fence? Why do all those fences exist? Maya Elkaloff and CVM Reporty, Cleaners Report, 1970. And when she did not write at all, she was praised the more. It happened that by burying the others, it happened by burying the others, who wrote? It is Otto, A Nature's Wonder, 1937. Uh, now came the experience, the experience that I believe to be far commoner with women writers than with men. The line uh, raced through the girl's fingers. Her imagination had rushed away. It had sought the pools, the depths, the dark places where the largest fish slumber. And then there was a smash. There was an explosion. There was foam and confusion. The imagination had dashed itself against something hard. The girl was roused from her dream. She was indeed in a state of the most acute and difficult distress. To speak without figure, she thought of something. Something about the body, about the passions, which it was unfitting for her as a woman to say. Men, her reason told her, would be shocked. The consciousness of what men will say of a woman who speaks the truth about her passions had roused her from her artist's state of unconsciousness. She could not write anymore. The trance was over. Her imagination could work no longer. Virginia Woolf, Professions for Women, 1931. All of a sudden, he believed that the, he had created all that himself alone. Completely strange, he thought he had created, evoked with his gaze, all which he had analyzed in the newspaper. He had filled the assembly room with himself, spoke, clapped. He believed he had written over a hundred thousand names in the petition, that he had to run to the sixth floor, rang all those doorbells, asked all those names, created them all the way from Rovaniemi and Kajaani. He thought he had managed to create and publish eight books that year, 
proofread and finalized. He had acted in 10 plays, held 50 assemblies and left the re resolutions. He even thought he had been working in the factory and earned the money that had been collected at the box office. That small delirium, that kind of moment, it was just enthusiasm. He had lived everything so closely. Iris Urta, early spring 1936. For now, our orientation is against this. Against this is a point of possibility. And in the emptiness of never agreeing what we are for, with hands gripping the edge, wet and slipping, we will finally agree that against is habitable. Against has room for all of us. Against is not without conflict. It is not without pain. It is only brief respite before strategizing begins. Lola Ulafemi, Experiments in Imagining Otherwise, 2021. Thank you, Kila Feminist Archive Reading Circle. Next um, in the program, we have a screening. And um, to introduce the screening and tell what is ahead, um, please welcome on stage artist Matti Aikio. This is a little bit delayed in the program, but uh, uh, first I want to say I'm. Uh, uh, I want to thank the uh, Finnish Culture Institute in New York and Frame Finland and Veralist Center for Art and Politics to be able to be a fellow uh, at the Veralist Center for 2023 and uh, to be able to be part of this together again uh, project and the I wanted to use this opportunity to be uh, be able to do a little bit of research in New York and and to try to go back to try to uh, pull out an old topic that I've sort of hidden in my drawers for many many years because it's been too difficult and too painful to try to work with. Uh, and uh, so I, now I'm showing something which is a uh, part of uh, work in progress to try to find ways to, to approach a uh, um, topic that has a lot to do with structural racism and the self-determination, right to self-determination of the Sami people in Finland, as maybe some of you might have <coughs> noticed, it's been a topical topic in, in Finland again in the past couple of years, uh, connecting to the renewal of the, of the Sami Parliament Act. But uh, so I've done a couple of uh, attempts, artistic attempts to uh, try to um, work with this topic in 2016 at the E-Art uh, Biennial and um, also now <laughs> I have to think what was the other one. Uh, well, anyway, anyways, but it's it's been sort of a little bit resting and I've been working with a lot of different stuff and different and just collecting material, doing research and um, this uh, draft or of a project. I don't work so much with film. I work a lot with uh, with video installations and multimedia installations, and and sometimes I try to work with text. And as we all know, text is a super challenging uh, format to work with. And as an artist, I'm always like, uh, so I'm Sami. I come from indigenous background, and I often try to approach these topics uh, to try to make political art, which is somehow not uh, just uh, try to do it in a way that I would uh, try to avoid like um, uh, just uh, 
presenting political statements or or uh, so, but try to like find a way to twist the perspective, to find different entry points, to to open up uh, complicated topics and and uh, connections. So. I don't know if <laughs> this film that you are going to see gets super far in that, but uh, and it might leave some of you a little bit puzzled uh, if you're not familiar with the topics. But that's also intentional that I don't I try to avoid explaining too much, which is another challenge in the art. So I might also f fail in that. But let's see. I hope hope you will uh, enjoy it, and I I hope we can turn off the lights because uh, it might be difficult to see it in this kind of lighting but and if you have more questions uh, regarding this you can perhaps there's time to time for questions afterwards or we can maybe have space for some of these questions at the panel discussion afterwards so thank you mm.
Thank you, Matti Aikio, for this very powerful film. Thank you very much. Um, you mentioned questions and comments. Uh, we're going to start the talk, so then we're going to leave a Q&A for the end. So I think maybe then at that point people can also direct some questions straight to you if they have some comments or questions about the film. But thank you very much. So now we will move uh, to our next conversation or talk, Collective and Community-Based Art Practices and Their Political Potential. In this talk, Matti Aikio, Minna Henriksson and the Soft Collective discuss the possibilities of creating social change through collective and community-led art practices. With the lead of Ali Akbar Mehta, Aikio Henriksson and the Soft, Co Soft Collective discusses the ways in which their art practices and their projects realize as part of Together Again, engage with art's political potential. Please welcome on stage all of our speakers and our moderator, Ali Akbar Mehta. Hello. Yes. yes. Okay, super. Thank you, Yanni, for the introduction. And uh, we're just going to take maybe a minute for our speakers to get mic'd up. Um, take the opportunity, meanwhile, to thank Mati for the fantastic film and um, also Mina uh, and the feminist, um, the Kila feminist leading circle for the presentation. I think there's a lot to talk about, a lot to ask and uh, can't wait to get started. Um, maybe if you would like to sit already, hi. <laughs> Settle down, have a glass of water. Well, we're very comfortable with uncomfortable silences, so I'm not very worried. I forgot to mention before the screening that I was going to show a silent film. So <laughs> some of you wonder if we have sound Yes, welcome. Um, thank you very much for staying for so long. Uh, it's been a very intense day already, and I can't wait to get started with, with this conversation. Um, I have questions, but maybe before we really begin, could I ask, that maybe we introduce ourselves, uh, possibly in the context of uh, the work that we are all doing in, in terms of community and collective practices, and we can then kind of take our conversation forward from there. Yes. My name is Meriam Trabelsi. I'm part of the Soft Collective. Yes. <clears throat> My name is Caroline Suner, and also part of the Soft Collective. And I think that... Um, well, we've been doing our work together now for uh, closer to maybe seven years. And um, we kind of started out from a podcast where we started to talk about what it's like to live in Finland while being fat and queer and brown and uh, just different levels of marginalization and found kind of uh, a common, common ground to build on uh, through those topics. And uh, then after that, for a few years, we kind of shifted into this kind of uh, educating and and we went to schools and universities and, and different companies to kind of teach and have these kind of sessions where we talk about the effects of marginalization or 
or about uh, what it's like and why why is it wrong wrong to uh, be racist simple questions like that and we kind of felt that we were banging our head to the wall um, it was it's a slow process to try to affect things through kind of educating and then we as still having to deal with the effects of those marginalizations so kind of felt like okay we're trying to lose we're tr uh, starting to lose our mojo here and and it's not fun anymore so then we decided quite intentionally that we're going to shift our focus and on, on our work into joy and into our own community which we by then had slowly started to build and fi find uh, like-minded uh, Q-Pipoc people here in Helsinki especially and um, and yeah, through that we kind of shifted our attention to community work and and art uh, that is based on communities and and uh, yeah, yeah, <clears throat> yeah, definitely. And then I think that one uh, specific aspect out of that community, that uh, building and kind of the joy uh, centering, has been in this project uh, very present. That is the that is the kind of meeting and searching and scouting like-minded uh, people and people who need the same kind of services as we do. So it is very self-centered practice and art that we create and we uh, consider that to be fine. There is space for that in this world. Um, and definitely from a, a biggest thing for me personally is the representation questions because for me Personally, my journey has been always uh, going alongside art journey, so but I never kind of got my foot in there. So sadly, but factually, I got my foot in there by talking about marginalization and talking about intersection and talking about racism. And now on that journey, hopefully not for long. <laughs> Maybe that's like a, a small opening to what we've been doing. But this this uh, specific project that we were working in Amsterdam now called Safer Spaces for Unhad Conversations was the second part of uh, this um, method using workshop that we have been now doing. The first part we did in London, also in collaboration with uh, uh, the Institute. So it has been a wonderful journey. And Sorry, just to maybe also put it out there that this work is uh, in ex on exhibition mm. yes. here in Odi. So um, maybe after 5.30 when we're done with conversations, if you have not already managed to see the work, please go see the work. It's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. And also we are going to put it online so you can go go and see it. I will try to know how to put a collaborated post with the Institute so <laughs> you can also find it from there. But we are Behme Oge on uh, Instagram. So from from, from in a, in a after panel, yes. <laughs> it will be there. Yeah. Hello, I'm Minna Hendrickson and um, let's say the, the collective or the community that uh, I have been working on uh, is, um, is, uh, goes back in history uh, to 1930s. And so it is, um, I've been uh, working on uh, um, uh, women writers who were there to found uh, the Kila organization. Uh, which is uh, Kila is a leftist uh, uh, art workers organization founded in 36 um, uh, when in Finland was a very fascist and right wing times. So as a, as a, as a, um, uh, uh, an opposition to that, uh, and yeah, as an anti-fascist and leftist uh, group and. Uh, when I yeah, uh, and it is still ongoing, as Ali, you know very well as well. You are part of it, as I am as well. And um, when I joined Kila uh, soon, yeah, then I got interested in its history, and I learned that um, actually majority of the founding members of Kila were women, and that was something quite incredible to me because somehow um, you don't see a trace of. Um, of any women's issues 
in Gila, and uh, and uh, so I started to to yeah to look into that early history, and I've been reading um, books by these uh, these writers, uh, female writers who were there to found Gila, and um, yeah, and and also uh, have been looking at the ways that they have been marginalized and. Uh, pushed away from the canon and and so on and so uh, so i'm building an archive it's called kila feminist archive out of that material and luckily there is space for that because um, the archives of kila from when it was founded in 1936 until 1945 have gone missing so so there is that there's no archives of that time in Kila. And then the history of Kila has been written from a very male perspective uh, after the Second World War. Um, so, so me as a current member in this uh, leftist art workers organization, uh, which has over the years gradually, in the past years, have has gradually uh, gotten more and more feminist actually which is amazing so so but i i think that i yeah as a member in that group i can also contribute in compiling that archive uh, from my perspective and interests and uh, as part of this um, there was an exhibition in london uh, earlier this year in the very beginning of this year at the showroom, which was um, uh, done in collaboration with Frame and the Finnish Institute in the UK and Ireland. Um, and um, it, it was called Editorial Tables, where there were various um, uh, contributors uh, from here and then from UK as well. And uh, so I brought there, the, the Kila Feminist Archive, and uh, in that context, we also had um, a reading circle, um, which was uh, really interesting, and it was there focusing on uh, on the questions that were up in the air in London at that time, which were very much about um, uh, worker struggles, unionizing, um, uh, what would have feminist uh, form of unionizing look like, for example. Well, that was our question in the reading circle. And so on. Um, and, and now that uh, that um, Kila Feminist Archive is taking place here within the context of this festival, we again had a reading circle, um, which was last Sunday. And, and what you heard just uh, just before Matti's film was um, a compilation or like little extracts of, of texts of each text that we 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 had in the reading circle. So so I invited okay. ten people into this reading circle and everybody and, and as a starting point I gave two texts by Iris Urto, who was one of these uh, founders of Kila. Um, uh, really amazing writer who has been um, kind of um, unfortunately is very little known uh, in uh, today in Finland in the literary circles even and um, so yeah so so then people were responding to that with other texts that they contributed with so I guess you got an idea of what kind of things we were reading and discussing and if I say again the names of the people who were in the reading circle, uh, so there was Yvonne Billimore, there was Monica Katu, Lily Hall, myself, there was E.L. Karhu, Karolina Kutsia, Sara Mahbuba, Tukka Salonen, Shupangi Singh and Marta Tuomala. And um, uh, yeah, uh, Apart from that, there is. A, I also have another intervention as part of this festival, which um, is here upstairs um, in the books section of the Audi Library, which is the third floor, and then also in Ricardin Library, 
which is also very central. It's another public Helsinki City Library. And um, so uh, I have inserted little booklets which, um, which have extracts of, of these books by, by these um, founding members of Kila um, uh, in locations where these books would be if, if they would be available uh, in these libraries. Um, yeah, so, and, and then also uh, in Rikanikatu, uh, there, there is a display of, of uh, Lainokat illustrations to these um, extracts. So, yeah. Yeah, hi everybody. My name is Matti Aikio. I'm a Sami from the Finnish side of the border. I come from a family of uh, reindeer herders, and uh, or sometimes I say academic reindeer herders, but that's another story. I won't go too deep into that. But I've been practicing uh, reindeer herding in my in my life, not so actively in the last in the past three years, as I would like to, but uh, but this but this is a practice that is very uh, essential part of my identity and my uh, that and also also some of the topics or themes or questions that I work with in my art. So I'm a, I'm an artist. I work a lot with uh, multimedia, multidisciplinary. Uh, Projects have uh, recently been doing a lot of, uh, or some um, video installations or installations where I combine text, video, photography, objects, sometimes sculptural elements, and so on. And uh, uh, I'm my sort of uh, in the recent years, my main question uh, or topic in the arts has been. Uh, indigenous relationship with nature and how can if we talk about that what does it mean does it exist if it exists what does it mean what is uh, its relation to the let's say modern society's relationship with nature why do they seem to be in conflict what is the conflict uh, sign off and so on and so on but this uh, <clears throat> silent film that we just watched is is not directly, but uh, but it is still also connected to to uh, this sort of. There are topics that come together at some in some interesting points, and I, I uh, uh, maybe in the future there will be some projects more dealing with that. But I, wa I won't talk talk too long. That's a short <laughs> introduction of me as an artist. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> um, yeah, no, so <coughs> maybe just to get our conversation started, I have uh, a question that maybe can orient the conversation. Um, to begin with the notion or the idea, the title of collective and community-based art practices and their political potential, uh, one has to unpack the notion of community, no? uh, not as a singular, but as a diverse or a plurality of often intersecting communities where any people or community is a contingent group. Um, I can explain this maybe with an example uh, that by saying that there exists a group of people uh, designated X, uh, another group is automatically created that which is not X. Uh, so any attempt to define a group, uh, a community, or a people creates a, a process of othering by default. Every contingent group creates another, comprising those not included. So if membership is an inevitable act of exclusion, uh, then any kind of deline delineation of a people uh, is a status symbol. And this is something that is articulated by uh, political theorist Ashila Mbembe. Uh, and just thinking about this idea of inclusion and exclusion in a way also from on the basis of the introductions that 
uh, you have all given where a certain idea of the dynamics of inclusion and exclusion are present, a dynamic of a certain kind of um, a structural hierarchy. Uh, Mati, you talked about structural racism in your film as well. Uh, and just this notion of vertical identity that uh, that we are kind of, in a way, uh, entangled with today. Uh, these are already then seeds of the political, which is maybe also part of the, uh, the political potential. Uh, whereas beings occupying a plurality of times, spaces, and identities, there are inevitable differences requiring equivalent corrections. Um, so maybe this is not a question yet, um, but maybe I could propose some kind of an answer and we can kind of move forward from there. If the political potential that we are talking about is to arrive at a moment where we, um, this we who is not the same, um, uh, can be who, where we can be cognizant of our differences, our diversity, our plurality, but also highlight our affinities, our intersections, our togetherness, in order to counter alienation by providing spaces for familiarization. In your own experiences, uh, what are the ways in which collective and community-based art practices could do this? And maybe this is a, a question to all of you, and maybe we can take it forward from there and talk about it. Well, I can uh, start with a short comment about the fact that this is not like usually when we talk about these things, it's not a conversation about inclusion and exclu exclusion. It's a conversation about access of whiteness mm. or access of power into spaces and who is allowed to what information. There is, if we talk about spaces where only white people decide things, we are not talking about exclusion and inclusion. Mm. We are talking about the norm. <laughs> so. Um, when it comes to separatist practice practices, and especially when it's to when we are talking about marginalized groups and um, people who experience oppression, uh, it is not the same conversation. Mm. Definitely, and I think that um, when kind of being for so long in ex your yourself being excluded from spaces and conversations and, and knowledge and language. Um, then realizing the power of separatist spaces and the power of like you get to have those conversations in a safe atmosphere with people who you know that like relate to the issue and uh, share maybe even share the issue and you get to kind of like ruminate collectively and then I feel like the potential after that is then you get to turn to the rest of the who are not the ex who were uh, counted out from the ex group uh, you get to turn to them and kind of be like okay well these are our needs this is what we need to survive in this society or or to thrive in this society. I think that uh, survival is the base level, but to thrive in this society. And, and then oftentimes through that you get to have these tools of how to navigate in the system. And then after that you get to share those tools and you have the possibility to share those tools and maybe even invite them other people into the discussion, but you need to have the kind of baseline of knowing that, okay, I'm not alone, or there are people who share this kind of uh, issues, or, or and, I, and when I say issues, I'm not necessarily talking about negative things necessarily, but of course those things too. But also just in, ger in general, just to share a joy. And, um, and that's why I feel like the potential to then broaden the conversation and and make it more accessible and more useful comes from there. Ali, can you repeat the question? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, yeah, I can. <laughs> Maybe I just need to read it That's again. the last. Yeah. Um, if the political potential that we're talking about is to arrive at a moment where we, uh, this we who is not the same, can be cognizant of our differences, our diversity, our plurality, but also highlight our affinities, our intersections, our togetherness, in order to, pro pro in order to counter alienation by providing spaces for familiarization. 
Uh, the question is then in your own experiences, uh, what are the ways in which community and collective practices can do this? Hmm. Well, if I take Kila as an example, although it's not my art practice, well, part of my art practice is this Kila feminist archive, but Kila is a, is a, is a group where many of us here may be also a part of. Uh, yeah, well, uh, I think it's really necessary in these times to 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 align with something. It is uh, uh, it's impossible to to stay neutral, and uh, so yeah, I think that is. Uh, otherwise, there is no political potential if you don't align. Mm. As simple as that, perhaps. <laughs> it's an interesting and com uh, complex question, uh, and I, I have to think how to approach it. But, but like, um, then again, uh, of course, I always then think about it from indigenous perspective and uh, Sami perspective, and uh, uh, with, uh, for example, like in, uh, I, I think. In Finland, the Sami people who represent the living Sami culture that's not being assimilated yet are such a small and marginal group that it's it's somehow like I, I feel like whatever we do, it's kind of difficult for the majority uh, representatives of the majority people in Finland to sort of become familiar with Sami culture. Uh, and I don't know, like, because I, I feel like it's been, uh, like, we've been sort of t talking about this since 1950s and 1960s and 1970s and so on. And I, I feel like that, uh, like, I don't know if there's, there's a big difference. And at the same time, if we talk about, like, inclusion and exclusion, uh, then again, from that perspective, like, like in in this discourse rega regarding uh, who is Sami, who is not, I feel like that the, the the picture is often twisted or turned upside down, and there's difficulties to understand sort of why, if we talk about, for example, indigenous uh, uh, identity as a legal concept in international law, that there also the <laughs> the exclusion is important mm. for a certain purpose and and that in some level it's it's like even though we we want to be inclusive but as as a, it's also an exclusive position and it's hard to go around it which doesn't mean that we need to be sort of uh, alienated from mm. the rest of the society for okay but just to, i i i hope this was some, some sort of answer to your question and i didn't go too much sideways but no, I think, um, yeah, I think it's very important also to maybe reframe or rethink the question that I had in the beginning in the context of what uh, you've, you've all been talking about, where perhaps I inclusion is not always desirable um, and, and perhaps inclusion is also not the same as assimilation in a way that can we think about inclusion uh, keeping in mind the differences, keeping in mind the pluralities and um, the the uh, closed identity, not closed, but uh, the, the identity of being Sami as being itself something that is included in the diverse... Or when we're talking about diversity in a certain kind of a contextualization, uh, as opposed to a kind of a singular monolithic monoculture kind of an idea, I think that is in a way what you are talking about as well that uh, it is important for Sami to be Sami and yet be included in a certain kind of a narrative of social st structure. Yeah. Um. Yeah, sorry, I'm very bad at <laughs> asking questions. But <laughs> yeah. Could this be a question? <laughs> um, uh, but but yeah, I think uh, maybe this is um, 
very naturally leads us to the <clears throat> the political environment that we are actually in today. Uh, I think a lot of what you have all talked about is very much signaling um, what is what has been going on in Finland the last couple of weeks, um, culminating in the protests that actually happened just last Sunday uh, as one of the, you know, maybe something else also happened after that, but I was not well, sorry. Um, but just thinking about the political environment of the government to actually uh, create a kind of um, organizing of identities, organizing of uh, people uh, within the articulation of certain kind of cultural identities, but also working identities and also citizen ident citizenship identities. So these kind of vertical, uh, vertical identities created, which is in a way also talking about a certain kind of a colonial present. Uh, how would we maybe think about artistic practices as being able to respond to that kind of a provocation by the system? Sorry. Another tough, not, not another <laughs> tough, yeah. good yeah. but tough question. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um. Maybe somebody from yeah. the audience would like yeah. to. Because this is an open conversation as well. Uh, it, it perhaps is not. Well, I guess we have to, as artists, it's our responsibility. Or like, yeah, we have to, of course, not go with that and uh, not to strengthen these kind of ideas, but to to show that all of these are artificial constructions, mm -hmm. uh, even like uh, nationhood, uh, and yeah, and bring examples from different times and places uh, when people thought differently about these things. I think. Yeah. Yes, and I think that also to remember that uh, as this is a capitalist society we're living in, art is not free from capitalism. We have to kind of still work with capitalism to be able to um, to be able to secure funds and to be able to survive in general. So at the same time, you need to kind of hold those two, like the potential that art has to show us new perspectives and new ways of thinking, but at the same time to remind ourselves that we're not free from it yet. And that still affects how we see things and how we work and how we approach things. Yeah, it's an aggravating question. Because you want to just go like, well, I don't know, do you guys know the solution for this like, situation? Because I believe I've done this work for 10 years and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, going back and forth with different kind of practices and different kind of storytelling, different kind of uh, uh, motives. And um, then for me, the most effect effect effective way uh, to cre create chan change is... Uh, force an emotional uh, kind of um, connection. So then I, m what my head says is like, we need to manipulate the system <laughs> or yes. we have to break the system. Yes, and, and that is not a conversation that we ever are having. <laughs> so then, uh, well, maybe. Uh, maybe that's my artistic point of view. Mm. Yeah, was the yeah. <laughs> Let's have that conversation. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we have time for my um, <laughs> individual... Um, Your dreams of and demolishing. My dreams of demolishing <laughs> the society. <capitalist> society. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I think that um, when I was reading these questions even, um, and this is coming from a personal place, now sharing with you, so take it with heart and... Uh, go home with it and remember that this was personal. Uh, I had a full-on panic attack uh, last night and I was up until six o'clock in the morning because I was thinking how will I come in this space and have these conversations in this climate, in this, uh, in this uh, space, in this uh, country when we walk around the streets and we still listen to yelling, we still like and how people are getting braver and braver by day. 
um, so how will I come here and talk about, from an artist's perspective, how we can make a change? When I don't believe that at the moment the most important thing is for us to focus what kind of art we can create. Even art is activism, even art is in a, uh, in, in, uh, bound with how, how, how we live in this world and it affects a lot of how, what we do. But now we need more acute, uh, acute moves, so I don't know what to... <laughs> really, truly. I, I think that uh, as an artist, uh, I think that um, an artistic approach or the role of the art or the artist is even in a situation like that. I mean, or there can be a million different roles. And I would always like to think that art doesn't have to be anything or do anything. And this, but like how I uh, reflect on that as an artist, I think that art can always function as this tool to to do something in society to shift the perspective or shake it or to, to find uh, different entry points to discourse on these kind of situations, these kind of uh, conflicts or problems or issues or topics that that we find really. We, we see, for example, that uh, journalism struggles to, because it functions in a different logic, than art, for example, that it, it struggles to really go, it struggles to to successfully open up these kind of questions and issues. And academic research is often uh, very slow and, and it also can be difficult for that to grasp it. I mean, it's very, both are really important and artists. But so that's that's what I think I was also thinking when I was uh, taking up your question and listening to the rest of you that that uh, again I, I hope I don't bore you with always saying that as a, starting my answer by saying as Sami or as indigenous but but uh, for me personally I if I think about how the situation and the atmosphere has been shifting since 1980s, since 1990s, the turn of 90s, 2000. I'm totally not surprised of the situation, the political situation at the moment of, of having the kind of government and the kind of political atmosphere that we have at the moment. And you also, you mentioned capitalism and I, I like to think that uh, it's also, of course, the, the part of the problem is that we live in this kind of capitalistic system that like destroys most people's cultural identity and suddenly we have more in every society uh, globally or at least in the so-called west uh, we have more and more people whose who's sort of like uh, identity and culture become gets more and more like stripped down to uh, that's uh, to just being part of the capitalistic system where we kind of lose more and more of the other elements and this be creates much more frustration and much more more like I feel that this is like I don't know if you if I could explain this so well but maybe you 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 can follow my point but this is one of the uh, factors that feeds into the uh, also to the rise of the racism, in my my opinion, that there's so, like, if, if you follow me. Do you mean a certain kind of simplification of identities to a point that there is only uh, otherness? For example, for, for example, yes. Uh, and that, uh, yeah. I like, in a way, Thank you for what you said. I will address it, but I'm just processing right now also what Marty said in the beginning that perhaps um, art practices can only, uh, to summarize it, get a conversation started. But not only, but that's one one function, and also right. not just get it started, but to do something that shifts the perspective in a way that that 
that you get the conversation started in a whole different way if it's all stuck in this kind of like, you're racist, no, you're a racist kind of situation. Hmm. Uh, but which I'm just kind of thinking what to do when people actually are not interested in having conversations. Because in a way that is, I think, what the anxiety is also uh, in what you talked about also that um, where is then the power of our practices to actually, I mean, in a sense that it's it's a kind of a passive provocation. I mean, we can't really kind of, you know, actively force people to engage. So how does then an art practice or a kind of a co collective practice in a way uh, get a certain kind of activation? And in that, just thinking about what you all talked about in your introduction, that the, the idea that you all were feeling that you were breaking your head against the wall when speaking to institutions, but then turning to communities that already had organically began uh, or, or gathered around the work and then centering joy and centering self and centering your own care for your own. Uh, and what does it then mean to actually do that kind of work as a, 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 um, a kind of a micro local work but then which then must be reproduced across multiple levels and scales. Well, I think that that, that is a, like a, um, for example, one of the manifestations of this turning into joy and uh, centering joy is we, we uh, when the pandemic started, we had uh, just gotten our first uh, office and we started to have these kind of like, community nights where like-minded by queer people would come and we would just hang out and have, you know, do dance, sing, and just be with each other. And then the pandemic came and, and we kind of had to cut that down. And then that got us uh, thinking that, uh, that that was so important, that how can we kind of like do that more regularly and maybe open it up because we know that obviously we're not reaching, uh, you know, the circles are limited. We're not reaching everybody who needs this kind of space. So how can we kind of turn it more outwards? So we started a club with uh, one of our friends, Sofia Vekesa, uh, a, a BIPOC queer club, a lesbian club. Um, and I, I feel like through that, I've noticed the kind of difference of like, okay, I'm going to these institutions and schools to kind of do that, force people to listen and they have to be there. It's their work time and their employee has ordered that they have to come and listen to this workshop. And you can see that nobody wants to hear what you're saying and nobody wants to understand. And they're just like, you're just um, putting yourself in a situation where you yet again have to explain why, why is it okay for you to exist as you are. So, but then through having this club, which first you think that, okay, it's a club night, so people get drunk and they go to party and what, how is that revolutionary or what does, how can that kind of support a conversation, not just with other BIPOC queers, but then for the majority of the population. But what we've noticed has been, it has been that first when these, when we open up the club, people flooded in there because they felt safe. And also, if we talk about just like white straight people who was not the, who were not the focus group of our club, they came there, they started to come there because also they felt safe. And then you could see that the clock started turning in their head and they're like, oh, okay. So this is what it means to be safe. And this is what it means when we are all embracing each other and we are holding each other accountable. And we have a set of rules of how we function, even though this is a challenging space of like, having to deal with drunk people and having to deal with excited people and and having fun so but still how can we manage the feeling or like sustain the feeling of safety so that we can get the most out of it and how can that happen so that uh, the focus is still on the BIPOC queers and the BIPOC lesbians but everybody else can also come and enjoy and join us and I feel like that has opened up the kind of like, it is possible. It is possible not to bang your head in the wall and not to force people to listen, but th then shift kind of your focus. And then all of a sudden the answers are there. So I feel like that has been like a kind of prime example of that that is possible, even though, because otherwise I don't know how to make people listen. I don't know. I mean, 
I think it's fantastic that um, I, I think we do definitely need ways in which we reconfigure ways in which uh, narratives are restructured for the times that we are in. And I think in a way, just thinking about um, the work, I mean, I personally would love to know more and support it in ways and we can talk about that. Um, just thinking about this idea of rescripting um, tools and strategies and also uh, histories, I'm just thinking about the the archive, Mina. And what strikes me is that an organization that is statedly anti-fascist is a combative organization comprising of uh, workers, writers, now artists as well. Uh, where there is a certain kind of a co consciousness of equality as a kind of a working methodology across years, where certain kind of hierarchies still do creep in, which is why you need a kind of a rereading of the archive through a feminist case, through a uh, through um, a different kind of an equalizing gaze, and just thinking that if. An, an archive like Kila's needs that kind of reading against the green of a feminist restructuring, um, then what are the kind of ways in which other organizations, especially institutions and larger power structures of the state, need to actually undergo the same kind of rereading against the green and restructuring? And perhaps when you're talking about, Mati, you're, when you're talking about uh, the power of art actually to kind of um, have different kind of conversations, perhaps th these are also ways in which art practices can become templates for what needs to be done. Um, but sorry, again, this was not a question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but We're running out of time. So ah, we need to finish. Right, yeah. Um, but I can maybe open it up if you would like to respond to this. If not, no pressure. We can also have questions from the audience since yeah. we are running out of time a bit. Well, I can just briefly say that, yeah, you're absolutely right. That, you know, somehow like, yeah, Kila in its beginning, it was kind of, yeah, embraced equality in a way and like was to about uh, diminishing the class structure and so on, but but still, I guess there were, uh, well, I've been wondering why did all these women take part in founding Kila and in fact were in maturity in finding, founding it. And uh, so I guess they were like, uh, yeah, like this, like next to leftism and anti-fascism, they also wanted a feminist approach, which then was, I guess, too much in that time in the 1930s uh, for for the for the more loud male voices in Kila um, yeah and and hopefully yeah there are other times when when we can kind of reread that material from different perspective like I hope now um, yeah but I also don't think that it is artists uh, job to 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 make this world a better place, or like I don't think that we can do it with art. And and uh, if we take Kila as an example again, the early history of Kila, actually during the Second World War, 40% of Kila members were put to prison, uh, and they were deemed as um, as uh, nation traitors because they were active in the leftist movement, and uh, and and many those also who were not put to prison like yeah many more were in the in the resistance uh anti war resistance so so yeah and they were so they were not active only through their art but but in many other ways I'm sorry I have to disagree to what you just said that you can't make a change with uh, with arts I think it's a bit with arts <laughs> yeah yeah thanks uh, yeah, sorry. My name is Netta Varga. I'm from the um, uh, 
Madrid, Finnish Madrid uh, Institute, uh, just representing um, the institute in Colombia, but actually I'm living in Finland now. And a lot of ideas are uh, being said and, and also like, a lot of emotions are coming up. Um, I think art is exactly the, the way to make a difference and change, and it's on many levels. Um, I think uh, as, as, a, as an artist you have your own statement. Um, you are making changes, transformations in yourself, and through that you affect on, on other people and societies. And then on the other hand, it is like Pehme Collective, you create, uh, you create, um, how you say, <laughs> Communities. Communities. And then on the other hand, I think art should infiltrate everywhere in, in all the different layers in society. Um, in, through pedagogy. Uh, we know that in Finland, for example, the past 20 years, they're all the time diminishing uh, arts, or arts subjects in schools. And um, yeah, it's, it's just on all, all, all the le levels. And uh, that has been the conflict for hundreds of years. Art, artists are always struggling with that. They observe the society in a different way and they see that Oh, these um, ignorant animals <laughs> living here. Like some uh, ph philosopher Schiller said that like 200 years ago. So, I mean, it's always the struggle there. But what you said, uh, you have to do it with uh, through joy. And, you know, you make the, the change, the difference in, in you. And through that, you reflect and ripple in the society. Sorry for having such a long talk. Can I just... Yeah, may maybe I meant to say that it is like artists don't need to take on that responsibility to do that. Not alone. That yeah. Mm. yeah. <coughs> Not well, but together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, and other I think questions? we need to finish no? now. We, we, we're running out of time, okay. I'm sorry to be... Because we're still... <laughs> I want to be here? respectful for, yes. for everybody's time, so... Yes. Um, Thank you for your time and conversations. We are here. Please, if you would like to talk to us, we can. I'd be happy to talk to you. <laughs> Thank uh, you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, so um, um, we're running a little bit behind, but we're still going to have a short coffee break because I think everybody needs to move around a little and, and have their own time. And we're going to continue with the pro program 10 past 4. So like 15 minutes. Sorry, 15 past. So 15 past 4. 4.15. Thank you. With a mission to carry out and promote the study of Greek, archaeology, history, language and culture from ancient times to the present day. As an academic institute, the Finnish Institute at Athens is classified in Greece as an archaeological school. This status allows it to carry out archaeological field work in Greece. Current projects focus on Agia Paraskevi of Arakamitai, Potike, Retimnon, Naxos on Sicily and Melitaya. The institute also provides education. During the autumn, we organize an introductory course on ancient Greek culture for Finnish undergraduate students, traveling with the students for approximately five weeks around the sites of ancient Greece. Courses for teachers are also regularly offered, as well as courses for more advanced students. The Finnish Cultural Institute for the Benelux is based in Brussels. The institute builds bridges between cultural practitioners and institutions in Finland and the Benelux. We foster new creative collaborations and our program is infused with contemporary, sustainable and cross-disciplinary cultural initiatives. We work with artistic projects as well as societal themes aiming for equity, 
anti-racism and sustainability. Highlights include commissioning a dance performance for the first ever EU Sami Week, organized in Brussels, and supporting the work of Netherlands-based visual artist Ar Murphy. In the next year, we will be developing our Masculinities program, bringing the Dutch theatre piece Boys Won't Be Boys to Finland and supporting a permanent sculptural work by a Finnish artist in Belgium. For Together Again, the Institute has collaborated with Pehme Collective, aka The Soft Collective. Their workshop Safer Spaces for Unhad Conversations, held in Amsterdam in May, is a continuation of their previous work in London. The work, created together with Zulu Green, a black queer rapper, singer and songwriter from Amsterdam, references community caring. Finn Agora, the Finnish Institute in Budapest, works to create and promote connections between Finland and Hungary in the fields of culture, science and economics. The Institute's goal is to strengthen and create connections between Hungary and Finland. This is done by events, seminars, professional collaborations and projects. This year's highlights are the annual Finnish film festival Finn Film Napok and the launch of a new artist residency collaboration. This autumn, Finagora will focus on creating new collaborations with art organizations in Budapest, organizing a workshop on minority languages and facilitating Finnish authors and artists visiting Budapest and being part of festivals and exhibitions. The Finnish Cultural Institute in Denmark is located in Copenhagen. The institute offers Finnish expertise in the fields of contemporary art and performing arts, creating and nurturing dialogue between Finnish and Danish professionals and audiences. All of the institute's projects are executed in collaboration with Finnish and Danish partners. The institute works with cultural exchange through exhibition projects, residency programs and other artistic projects. One of the highlights in the recent years has been a long-term collaboration with the artist Jenna Sotela and a Copenhagen-based artistic platform Primer. This autumn, the Institute will be focusing on our residency programs for visual artists, as well as bringing Danish and international arts and culture professionals to Finland and introducing them to Finnish artists and the local art scene. The Finnish Institute in the UK and Ireland is located in London. The Institute enables progressive personal and societal change through art and culture by enriching and diversifying connections between cultural professionals in Finland, Ireland and the United Kingdom. The Institute runs two programs, Arts and Society. Recent highlights include Finnish Art Prize Below Zero, won by Nastya Sederrönke, and a festival celebrating Tuva Jansson's queer heritage. This autumn, the Institute focuses on bringing British and Irish arts and culture professionals to study visits in Finland, and producing an exhibition in London showcasing underrepresented Finnish artists and designers. For the Together Again project, the Institute worked with the artist Minna Henriksson. Her work focused on the Finnish Writers' Association Kiela and its largely forgotten feminist writers from the 1930s. The work was originally shown earlier this year as part of a larger exhibition called Editorial Tables, Reciprocal Hospitalities at the Showroom Gallery. The Ibero-American Institute of Finland is Finland's cultural institute working in Spain, Portugal and Latin America. Its main purpose is to promote Finnish culture and arts and dialogue in the areas where Spanish and Portuguese are spoken. The institute's projects focus on visual arts, architecture and design with a basis on human rights, gender equality and social inclusion. Recent projects include Sofia Arngrud's social art installation in Uruguay with 223 footballs and teenagers, as well as art exploring new AI technologies. The Cultural Center and Art Gallery are in the heart of Madrid in the so-called Literary Quarter. The institute works closely with local partners Partners like festivals, museums and galleries. Like earlier this year, Klaus Harpen and Co's exhibition was held in Spain's National Design Museum. 
the Institute also collaborates with Nordic and European networks, especially in projects related to literature and film. For the Together Again project, the Ibero-American Institute worked with the Finnish-Nigerian photographer Uwa Idoose in Portugal, Spain and Finland. During his six-week residency in Oporto, Uwa worked with and photographed local children. Through his portraits, Uwa addresses the intersection between dreams, aspirations and community in the growth process of young people. Uwa's works were exhibited in Oporto, Madrid and now are in Helsinki. The Finnish Cultural Institute in New York is located in New York City in the United States. The Institute works across the fields of contemporary art, design and architecture, creating dialogue between Finnish and American professionals and audiences. The Finnish Cultural Institute in New York organizes residency programs, projects and events that foster critical dialogue. Recent highlights include supporting EU Sosiraya's solo exhibition at MoMA PSI 1 and the program Exercises in Togetherness, showcasing Finnish and American artists' work through notions of care and intimacy. This year, the Institute collaborates with the renowned Performa Biennial in realizing a Finnish Pavilion Without Walls program, which presents several new commissions by Finland-based artists working in the intersections of visual and performative arts. For Together Again, the Finnish Cultural Institute in New York has commissioned a work in the form of a public seminar and a video piece by visual artist Matti Aikio in collaboration with Vera List Center for Art and Politics and Frame Contemporary Art Finland. Aikio's work explores intersections of modern Western society and indigenous cultures, the Sami culture in particular. The Finnish-Norwegian Cultural Institute promotes cultural exchange between Finland and Norway. Our aim is to strengthen cooperation, dialogue and mobility between professional art and cultural practitioners. The Institute is based in Oslo, but has activities throughout Norway. Currently, the Institute runs the program NORD, Cultural Bridges. The objective is to strengthen networks and activities between cultural practitioners in northern Norway, northern Finland and Sami. This includes collaboration with Hiljaisos Festivali at the multidisciplinary festival Festspielen in Nord Norge and community arts project Vadsø Megacity. This autumn, the institute focuses on bringing Finnish artists to residences in Norway. In September, a performing arts group will attend a residency in Dabvi, Center for Performing Arts in Hammerfest, in collaboration with Svenska Kulturfunden. For the Together Again project, the Institute commissioned a third season of the podcast, The Middle Eastern Vlog, produced and directed by the Post Theatre Collective. The podcast reflects on the global pandemic through the eyes of people belonging to cultural and linguistic minorities. Writers for the new season are Norway-based Nelly Winterhalden and Finland-based Louis Arvas. The Finnish Institute in France is an independent and multidisciplinary platform between Finland and France. In collaboration with different international institutions, academia and creatives, the Institute engages actively with critical discourse through its on-site and off-site programming. In the most recent exhibition, called Imagine Every Day, Outsider Art Finland, the Institute presented a group of outsider artists exhibiting for the first time in Paris. Since 2022, the Institute also showcases Finnish gastronomy in the heart of Paris by offering a program of culinary events at the Café Ma. This autumn, the Institute's gallery has the honor of presenting the creations of an exceptional duo of designers, Yushlin Maumua. The Institute continues its collaboration with Alta University by organizing a showroom during Paris Fashion Weeks. For the Together Again project, the Institute continues to work with the artist Arbo Nikkanen, whose project looks at the ecological issues of garment production. Arbo Nikkanen worked with Lea Dominguez in a multidisciplinary project where they dwelled into the challenges of the fashion industry through discussions, workshops and artworks. The project's first forum, called Have Need, was held in Paris in June. The Finnish Institute in Estonia maintains, develops and strengthens Finnish-Estonian cultural cooperation in different fields of art, education and society. The Institute also keeps track of the societal developments in Estonia and participates in it through its programs.
Recent highlights include Elina Simonen's exhibition From Word to Image, which combines poetry, fashion design and photography. The exhibition was shown in eight different places in Estonia, Latvia and Finland. We also work on establishing the Finnish timeout Eratauko method developed to advance more constructive dialogues. This autumn we are excited to tell you about our new Erasmus Plus project which aims to give a chance for the youth of Helsinki and Tallinn to wrap together in workshops organized by two suburban youth centers. The Finnish Institute in Japan, located in Tokyo, promotes Finnish science, culture and higher education and the collaboration of these fields between Finland and Japan. The Institute identifies cooperation needs and opportunities and helps potential partners to find each other. The program consists of seminars and lectures, exhibitions and residences, just to name a few. The Institute's current research project compares Japanese Sansu and Finnish artists' homes. And in May, we held the 150th anniversary exhibition of Vivi Learn, one of Finland's first female architects, both in collaboration with Waseda University. In the autumn, the Finnish Institute in Japan continues with the ongoing series of AI seminars and is co-organizing a large-scale exhibition of a prominent Finnish ceramic artist. Autumn is also the time for the traditional Finnish-Swedish week, Hello Tokyo! The Finnish Institute in Athens is an academic institution with a mission to carry out and promote the study of Greek, archaeology, history, language and culture from ancient times to the present day. As an academic institute, the Finnish Institute at Athens is classified in Greece as an archaeological school. This status allows it to carry out archaeological field work in Greece. Current projects focus on Agia Paraskevi of Arakamitai, Potike, Retimnon, Naxos of Sicily and Melitaya. The institute also provides education. During the autumn, we organize an introductory course on ancient Greek culture for Finnish undergraduate students, traveling with the students for approximately five weeks around the sites of ancient Greece. Courses for teachers are also regularly offered, as well as courses for more advanced students. The Finnish Cultural Institute for the Benelux is based in Brussels. The institute builds bridges between cultural practitioners and institutions in Finland and the Benelux. We foster new creative collaborations and our program is infused with contemporary, sustainable and cross-disciplinary cultural initiatives. We work with artistic projects as well as societal themes aiming for equity, anti-racism and sustainability. Highlights include commissioning a dance performance for the first ever EU Sami Week organized in Brussels and supporting the work of Netherlands-based visual artist Aro Murphy. In the next year, we will be developing our Masculinities program, bringing the Dutch theatre piece Boys Won't Be Boys to Finland and supporting a permanent sculptural work by a Finnish artist in Belgium. For Together Again, the Institute has collaborated with Pehme Collective, aka The Soft Collective. Their workshop, Safer Spaces for Unhad Conversations, held in Amsterdam in May, is a continuation of their previous work in London. The work, created together with Zulu Green, a black queer rapper, singer and songwriter from Amsterdam, references community caring. Finn Agora, the Finnish Institute in Budapest, works to create and promote connections between Finland and Hungary in the fields of culture, science and economics. The Institute's goal is to strengthen and create connections between Hungary and Finland. This is done by events, seminars, professional collaborations and projects. This year's highlights are the annual Finnish film festival Finn Film Napok and the launch of a new artist residency collaboration. This autumn, Finagora will focus on creating new collaborations with art organizations in Budapest, organizing a workshop on minority languages and facilitating Finnish authors and artists visiting Budapest and being part of festivals and exhibitions. The Finnish Cultural Institute in Denmark is located in Copenhagen. 
The Institute offers Finnish expertise in the fields of contemporary art and performing arts, creating and nurturing dialogue between Finnish and Danish professionals and audiences. All of the Institute's projects are executed in collaboration with Finnish and Danish partners. The Institute works with cultural exchange through exhibition projects, residency programs and other artistic projects. One of the highlights in the recent years has been a long-term collaboration with the artist Jenna Sotela and a Copenhagen-based artistic platform Primer. This autumn, the Institute will be focusing on our residency programs for visual artists as well as bringing Danish. The forest to the trees forgot what I was chasing. Spent so many nights living out at sea that my heart is gone vacant. And everybody who was close to me all stayed on dry land. So now I'm driving back on in the state west. I just gotta feel something. Not gonna wait till the morning because something's gonna change my mind. I don't wanna change my mind Oh, I wanna stay right here, right here Chilling with my friends for another year Apologetic text, he says to come over Well, the whole damn town has been waiting for the day When you would come back here There was dancing and talking and steaks on the grill And I think that I will be alright And my ex from high school still looks just the same As she did back in 2009 Not gonna wait till the morning Let's never put the night on night Never put the night on ice Oh, I wanna sit right here, right here Chilling with my friends for another year I would walk away from the spotlight For the good life oh, Come on, turn your hate into poetry Pain into power And I miss your friends and your minutes into hours I would walk away from the spotlight For the good life, for the good life And they all said I was crazy Okay, dear audience, if I can ask you to take your seats so we can uh, move on with our final conversation. It's been a long and uh, fruitful day. And um, if we can one more time focus on the stage and, and get ready for our final chapter of the day. Final um, discussion, talk, 
a little bit maybe a different perspective than what we've had until now. So talk number three, collaborative practices for an arts organizational angle. The final talk of the day sheds lights on the art organizational point of view of supporting and presenting collaborative artistic work. In the discussion led by Lily Hall, Yvonne Bellimore, Giovanna Esposito, Yusuf and Elina suo Uria share their experiences of working with collaborative and or community-led projects and what these processes require from the side of the ARC organization. Please, our talkers, moderator, the stage is yours. Enjoy. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you so much. And <laughs> Take a clap. Thank you all for being with us at this end of the day as well, this incredible program coming together. Um, so my name's Lily Hall. Um, I'm based in London. I work at an organisation called The Showroom. Um, and really first I wanted to say thank you so much to the entire Together Again team who've been working behind the scenes to bring everything together. Um, and thank you to Carolina Corpilati and to Elena for inviting myself and us to come together for this conversation at the at the end of the day so um so for this final discussion i'll just map out um how we're gonna approach it together um for the next 45 minutes we'll be offering an introduction to the working practices of four public arts organizations based in london new york and helsinki we'll have a focus on the processes involved in collaborative programming from the perspective of the work that we do both behind the scenes and in public from within our respective organisations. Um, and I'll begin just by really briefly introducing the showroom for anyone who doesn't know about the work that we do. Um, and then I'll invite you, um, Yvonne and Elena and Giovanna, uh, to speak to just for a few minutes to situate the approaches that you take when it comes to thinking through and enacting collaborations in your current work. And then we'll have a short discussion between us and open out to, to everyone here, the audience, um, for final conversation. So, so the showroom's a uh, public contemporary art organisation. We're based in the northwest of London. Um, we've been running for 40 years now. It's our 40th anniversary. We were originally artist founded and led, but have since become a publicly funded and resourced organisation in the UK. Um, so yeah, we operate under that model. And our, fo our program's focused on collaborative modes of production. Um, and that might include exhibitions, events, workshops, um, as well as publishing. And each would be developed through new commissions or collaborations, which are held both at a very local and embedded way um, in our neighborhoods in Northwest London and then more widely in London, as well as nationally and internationally. So, um, for example, we've been working in partnership with the Finnish Institute in the UK and Ireland over the past two years now, and then further in collaboration with Frame here in Helsinki for four years, like pre the pandemic and through it and beyond, um, to enable new research, artistic practice and publishing, with a focus there in particular on intersecting feminist and decolonial practices. So those have taken shape with kind of reciprocity at the core of the thinking, both in London and now in Helsinki. Um, and then, yet yeah, from both of those locations, these have included many voices internationally and translocally online and in print. So, so as we had a conversation in preparation together before, before this afternoon and talked about when... Um, the way in which collaboration always involves work that is more than the sum of its parts. And perhaps especially when starting from a position of a commitment to feminist modes of organising. Um, and maybe this is this classic model of an iceberg or iceberg economies, um, where, that, where what becomes visible and public on the surface is always just a very fraction of the processes and relationships and exchanges that have been involved in bringing something into being. So not least the Together Again Festival, I'm sure is an example of that. Um, so to start with, I wanted to invite you, Yvonne, to speak about, um, maybe think about your plans and the possibilities that you see ahead in your new role with the Bio Art Society in Helsinki. 
Um, as you put it, questioning how to make visible the ways in which, as humans, we're inherently collaborative, counter to the individualism and competition that we're often channeled towards. So through connecting to post-humanist thinking, how to make visible these inherent connections and interdependencies that do exist between us as bodies through your collaborative programming. Mm. Thank you. Um, yes, and maybe actually I, I guess I, maybe I kind of approach this from a wee bit of a storytelling which does the work of visibilising some of those connections. Um, really nice to be here in conversation with you all and hosted by the Together Again Festival and um, everybody involved in that. I have had the pleasure of uh, crossing and collaborating and connecting with everybody here at some point. <laughs> um, Lely, we, uh, as you mentioned, uh, collaborated through um, my role at rehearse, um, uh, uh, as the Associate Curator for Rehearsing Hospitalities, which is Frame Contemporary Art Finland's public programme for 2019 to 2023, which just culminated this June. And um, in that I think actually that's where most of our collaborations and exchanges kind of sit. Um, but yes, so we worked together on this exhibition and public programme at the showroom in London, which took place in January to March this year, um, called Editorial Tables, which featured Mina Henriksen's work, amongst others. Uh, it specifically um, featured the Kila Feminist Archive work. Um, and was a Together Again collaboration project with the uh, Finnish Institute in the UK and Ireland. Alina, we've also kind of crossed paths on several occasions through the Rehearsing Hospitalities programme and in another Together Again project uh, in collaboration with the Vera Least Centre for Art and Politics in New York. Um, where we developed a fellowship and um, public programme with Matty Eiko, um, who you also saw earlier. Um, and actually throughout the Rehearsing Hospitalities programme, we had various collaborations. Maybe Rehearsing Hospitalities is actually more about rehearsing collaborations in some way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it seems more fitting. But yes... Um, Back in 2021, we also uh, collaborated on a um, project which was part of our annual gathering series um, that year, which was focused on care and security and safety. And we quite nicely found ourselves in collaboration with artists and audiences and plants and horses. <laughs> yes. um, and actually to go right back to the beginning of that project uh, in 2019, you presented work on your PhD um, on feminist new materialist curatorial practices. Yes, <laughs> we have a long history. <laughs> yeah. Yes, we are actually, uh, Giovanna, you also presented um, a project that you were working with Auti Pieski and Eva Christina Harlan on um, repatriation. Yeah. And so this project was actually called, or this program, this sort of day long marathon that we had. Um, at the Bio Art Society, Sulu space, um, so full of, I guess, presentations and performative actions, quite similar to uh, today's program. Um, maybe to take that full circle, it's quite nice because that's now where I uh, recently joined the team as the artistic director. So yes. Um, for those that don't know about um, BioArt Society, it's an association based here in Helsinki, but actually kind of working uh, across Finland and Sabmi and, uh, and um, within the Nordic region and also internationally. Um, it's, uh, I guess its kind of main purpose is to 
foster and platform and present uh, practices that are working at the intersection between art and natural sciences with an emphasis on uh, biology and ecology and life sciences. It's, a, as I mentioned, a membership organised... No, I didn't mention. It's an association. It's a membership organisation with over 130 members, but a more expansive network where... Um, uh, of kind of partners and collaborators and um, friends, uh, as I mentioned, kind of uh, mostly within the Nordic and Baltic context, but also internationally. Um, and I would say at BioArt Society, we are always and inherently in collaboration with others, both human and more than human. And maybe just to mention a little bit about my my own practice, which uh, is grown and very much growing with others and also leaks into my uh, organisational roles because they are always quite entangled, these m multiple uh, yeah, kind of identities <laughs> that we take on. Um, yes, I've been very much interested and working with... Um, different forms of collectivity in my work, um, particularly in the last few years where I kind of developed a project and methodology um, of what I would call feminist collective research practices, which um, on one hand really explores different formations of collectivity and collaboration, not always necessarily becoming collective, but finding other ways to do that um, and then uh, it also equally you know seeks to visualize that we're never never really thinking or doing um, learning or living alone but always with and alongside and through other beings and in relation to other beings and bodies uh, which I would say is very much a project and a life practice of deconstructing this myth of the individual <laughs> and uh, trying to recognise instead that we are uh, kind of very much dependent on these interdependencies across our bodies and uh, lives. Uh, and yeah, maybe just to end on that, that I was very, <laughs> like I thought it was a nice... Uh, um, way to situate this kind of practice of doing collaboration and really kind of visibilizing these often invisible connections. Um, yeah, and share just some examples of that in practice. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, Elena, um, we talked about how you'd like to approach this conversation, and we thought maybe coming full circle around to the end of this day of Together Again, you might speak a bit about the thinking um, of developing this festival, which has had, you know, like this kind of ten many tentacles, many different parts over time. Um, but how, maybe to speak a bit about how you and the team have been working across contexts and also time frames and geographies, like through all of these complexities to bring us all together and connect here in person in Helsinki as well as online, but in and thinking about how to approach that, yeah, in ways that feel meaningful or, or genuine points of connection. Um, and then within that, how you've been thinking about the, these relationships between, you know, really think about the language of collaborative, collective, or this, this word community-led, which we treat with care um, in this context. Yes, um, thank you, Lily. And mm. yeah, I mean, I kind of at this point want to just thank our audience as well like it's been a long day very heavy with content so round of applause for the audience <laughs> um, yeah it's yeah uh, yeah I'm really happy that you've stayed with us so long um, yeah we kind of um, yeah so how, how Lily already already kind of introduced me so I I work at the Finnish Cultural Institute in New York as the 
director of programs, and now I'm sitting here and speaking more like in my role as part of the curatorial team, alongside my colleague at the UK and Ireland Institute, Karolina Korpilahti, and also Monica, who is hiding <laughs> somewhere <laughs> there. So um, yeah, that's the kind of position that I'm speaking of now about this process. And um, yeah, when planning this day, Carolina and I felt like um, there should be some sort of light shed also on the background of how this pro program came to be and like where these ideas of communities, col collectivity and collaboration came from and not kind of hide, hide behind the program and let the artists uh, uh, do the work, so to say, of today, but also, yeah, shed some light on how, how we have worked on this project. So just to um, give some background, so Jaakko gave a really lovely introduction to, to the project itself in the morning, and um, kind of to add a few things to that, so... So Together Again has actually from the very beginning been like a very collaborative um, project. So as, as Jaakko mentioned, uh, there are 16 independent Finnish cultural institutes around the world. And uh, the Together Alone project, what it was called uh, in the first stages, was actually the first project all of the institutes worked on together. Um, so working across these institutes, like how you kind of uh, uh, set this my my um, this little talk out. So it was very much about working across um, these d institutes with actually quite different agendas, strategies, and organizational models. Uh, you know, on different continents, different countries, different time zones. Uh, it's been, I would say, very much a learning experience for us. Um, it's also been like an, quite an amazing opportunity to learn about how colleagues work at the other institutes. As mentioned, they are all independent. We all have our own ways of working. So, yeah, I've, I've learned a lot about the other institutes during this time. And, um, yeah, just learning about how... Uh, how how the institutions work and how we work with artists as well. So yeah, during this this time, I've been thinking a lot about like um, about the conditions, uh, what the what the conditions are for a collective and productive collaboration to happen, like both on like an organizational level and then also on the on the level of the projects. And uh, this is maybe something we can then get back to later, if we have the time. Um, but yeah, and I think like now, on the, in the light of also what's been said today, I think there's been a lot of lot discussion about this kind of between the lines, like what are the what are the things that are uh, required, and it's not just the kind of obvious notions or maybe obvious notions of like trust, uh, shared I ideologies or shared aims and goals, but also a lot these relations between ownership and engagement that are maybe not as straightforward as as one might um, think. But yeah, maybe something to get back to later on together. Um, but maybe uh, a bit more background, we have 10 minutes left. How, <laughs> is, how is that possible? <laughs> um, okay, I will be super, super quick. Uh, so thinking about the process, um, how this happened. Uh, so, um, so related both to the kind of new collaborational model of the institutes, uh, it was also obviously the uh, isolation caused by the the pandemic, um, which, uh, may, yeah, so it made sense to focus on coming together and doing things together in this final stage of this this project. Um, and we wanted to, what we really wanted to do with this, this uh, Together Again uh, program was to bring forth various approaches and aspects to collaborative and collective work, as well as practices that are explicitly invested in communities. Um, and I would say, like, based on what we've heard uh, and seen today, all these fantastic talks and presentations, I kind of 
dare to say we've succeeded in bringing forth these different ways of working. So I'm really happy about that. Um, and also, the, in the in the morning, there were some questions about like what the institutions have learned or like how we've been able to um, maybe change uh, in the course of this project. And I would say one thing uh, that has been really good for the institutes has been the um, focus on like more long term work and thinking about like different kinds of strategies of supporting artists because uh, in the institutes work in a very project oriented way and this has been like even having like a two year program to work with an artist is a luxury for most of us i would i would dare to say so so yeah maybe since we don't have so much time uh, i would like to hand this over to giovanna just to kind of again uh, from uh, from the curatorial and production team point of view when we wanted to include this last panel so we were kind of thinking about people in helsinki who are, who have all this amazing experience and knowledge on working with with collaborative and uh, collective uh, models and you were one of the first people that were on my on our model so we are really happy that you were also able to join us. So yeah, thank you. Um, just a, just a quick check on the timing. Do we have ten minutes only, or because we started a bit later for the till the Q and A? Wonderful. Thanks. Over to you. Yeah. Thank you, and thank you so much for the invitation, for everyone who is joining us today, and for everyone who is on the technical side making this happen. Um, I will, since I am also here, uh, not only as myself, but representing a space, uh, I will tell a bit about it. And as with so many stories, it begins with a group of friends and an urgency. And like so many stories, it modulates according to who tells it, and in this case, the person who's telling it is me. At the time of its inception, the Museum of Impossible Forms was a frontal response to the omission of primarily BIPOC, queer, immigrant and diaspora voices within the art institutions of Finland. The lack of col collaborative models and the need to forefront spaces and practices that could radically question the power mechanisms and asymmetries sustained in the field. Museum of, Impo oh, Museum of Impossible Forms has addressed these gaps by foregrounding criticality, reflexivity and collaboration, taking the task to create situations that allow for improbable encounters and transdisciplinary modes of doing. Uh, we, the space opened its door in 2017 as a fluid, low threshold space that through softness and care could embrace the complexities of our subjectivities. As a space, it has sliding boundaries and flickering edges that enable frameworks for curating and instituting where things mutate, invert or are contaminated by new relationships, uses and meanings. By positioning itself in Kontula Shopping Center, which is in East Helsinki, Museum of Impossible Forms defined the hegemony of a presumed center, challenged the marginalization of space, time, and bodies, learned with the embodied margins that can be found inside our social spaces, and continuously claim for the redistribution of who is being heard. In our engagements, we destabilize the narrowing frame of identity politics being national, gender, racial, caste, and class categories by bringing to the juncture historical and geographical entanglements as much as geopolitical and social intricacies. We center and think with those who have moved from one place to another, who are constantly negotiating their within and without, and permanently shifting status, a polyphony of embodied knowledges and belongings. As a result, our constantly shifting programs are driven by indiscipline, collectivity, insurgent learning, and speculative imagining, and they unfold in multiform ways through cinematic, somatic, performatic, and sonic practices, discursive activations, uh, exhibitions, archive building, and on-site residencies. Over the years, we have developed a mix, long, a mix of long-lasting and always-in-process collaborations with diverse agents, from art institutions and artists to anti-authoritarian and non-dominant communities. Crucial to this approach is an ethic of care and a willingness to locate our expertise alongside the knowledge and the expertise of others, whose lived experience, knowledges, and diverse understanding can challenge us and the institutions we collaborate. And I think, for me, coming um, to Finland in the beginning, I think like one 
one part that I think we're still lacking is how to collaborate in sustainable ways and also how we can have, because I think that we are asked so much to collaborate as, as persons who come to the field as from diaspora, from other positions, we're always invited to collaborate, but we're never allowed to enter the institution and challenge them from within. So there's also problematic in this question of, of permanent collaboration, of permanent uh, uh, collectivity of practices and so forth. So I think we need to deeply also question what these collaborations do and how we can uh, form and, and shift practices also from within. Because so far we still see that most of the institutions here are um, very white, uh, that they don't enable people from diverse backgrounds, practices and positions to enter them, challenge them. And also like we're seeing mostly what happens is diversity is included from the programming out but it's not included on the way that the structures are being taken, how decision-making, how funding, all these necessary parts that would actually enable change. So I think that for me, like, I think that we, we do need and we, are, um, we work a lot with collaborative practices and we collaborate with many people who have shaped what MIF is and the possibilities of what it can become. Um, but we still need to do a lot of work in how to have an institutional response. And just to, because one part of a, of a question that was left um, in the previous panel of what can art do to change things? What can institutions do? to change things and what are you actually doing to, to make that change possible? Because it's always relegated to somebody else and it's constantly relegated to artistic practices. So, yeah. Also, when we were preparing for this conversation, we were talking to some extent about questions of scale. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's come a lot, up a lot today. There was a question earlier in response to the presentation around Assemble's practice around how might you scale this up, like to a sort of maybe like a national level or to, to transplant, like to widen this out in different contexts or, or then the role of, you know, the one-to-one -one and the empathetic within that in order to genuinely enact change, but how that can hold firm for the long term. And especially, Alina, when you say like, you know, it's a luxury to have projects in this kind of capitalist mode of production that are two years in duration rather than a few months? Like, what are the conditions that, that are needed to enable those kind of one-to-one -one ways of workings, but then embed them, embed them at a deep level so that they can hold firm? We're talking about the differences in, say, like in the landscape or the ecologies in London, where you have quite a lot of different scales of organisations mm -hmm. from the really grassroots through to like the showroom sort of like now 40 years old, but still like small to medium scale in that sense. It's like this long history, but also as a team, as a core team, we're, uh, we're four. So, um, but then perhaps you were saying, Giovanna, in, in, here in, in Helsinki, maybe this is that kind of leap between the a space such as MIF um, to then the larger scale institutions and what's this yeah. kind of like maybe in between spaces for, yeah, for, for this ecology to also to grow but have, have that kind of porosity um, to really implement change. Yeah, I think that there is a, like a problem within the structure quite deeply that it doesn't enable, we don't have mid-sized institutions in Finland as you would have in many other places and that enables different people to enter and practice. What we have is uh, artists run association run spaces and then we have the big museums and there's a huge gap in between and what we're seeing, for example, what is clear with me, for example, as a space is that we uh, are not finding, not the funding structures, not the possibilities from uh, city spaces and so forth that would enable us to make that leap. So what you have is, is something that, uh, that is always in this balance of the ones who are properly funding and the ones who are costed, content, constantly struggling and having precarized practices. Mm -hmm. Because what we have in the space is like, I mean, I, I, I work part-time 
a job, like doing a job that is 150%. No, and that has been constantly through the persons who have been running the space before me. So it's not a cost, like a situation new, but it's just people who want to pursue and, and move practices forward. And we see that constantly in the field. And this myth is not like the exception, it's just part of the rule no, of, of that structure. So what can there be of in, in terms of these models? How can we uh, generate uh, an actual ecology in the field that uh, that is healthy uh, to 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 enable practices to flourish you know because what we have now it's is just also deeming in ways that becomes super competitive and super difficult to then enable proper collaborations mm -hmm. because what we see a lot with collaborations is that when the collaborations come and the funding come then a lot of things break through you know and they they break relationships and so forth so so there are several problems there that um, that need to be more properly addressed but we are lacking the let's say the support from both sides no and also from from i think from a larger part in in, in understanding what uh the the role of arts can be in this society no and i think like for us it's very important or at least for me working uh like taking to what mina was saying like to have spaces that position themselves i mean as, as like uh, the space where where i work is a space that positions itself as a cultural center that works along practices that are anti-colonial, anti-patriarchal, and non-fascist. And those are the, the practices we strive and we want to nurture and the communities we seek to engage with. No? And I think in the global, uh, global and also very local context in which you are, like as, as spaces uh, and context of practice, to take a position mm. and to kind of like uh, give also our space um, and also our allyship and our solidarity with other practices to, to enable uh, these spaces to, to, to continue to pop up is absolutely necessary. No? So I think that our collaboration needs to be with, with other uh, spaces that need to arise and with other practices that are there, but we also need to find other ways to engage uh, with, the diff with the different uh, models that we're embedded with that actually make the possibility of a change, no? Because so far we're seeing that there is, there is this space where we constantly fall off, no? Mm -hmm. And and how to how to operate with that? Like who who of the institutions uh, at large is doing is being in solidarity with artist-run spaces and artistic practices that are enabling uh, diversity? And uh, and then they come and take all the programming, no, it's, we, we serve very much for that, no, but then like actually the support to make these spaces uh, long lasting, mm. as long lasting as they need it, no, and spaces we always need to reconfigure ourselves and, and challenge and shift and directors is, directorships of these spaces need to constantly shift because what we're saying is that we have the same people directing institutions. So there's a lot of, of situation there that need to be pointed, mm -hmm. pointed mm -hmm. and addressed. But there's also, yeah, but I probably, I can go on <laughs> a really long time, so maybe I just shut up. <laughs> but yeah. I think, I mean, earlier on we were talking, uh, I think Mena, you were saying about, you know, like to, to, to take a position and to, and to make that uh, transparent or clear, both yeah. as institutions um, and the way that we organise and the way, that, yeah. To, to really foreground um, the, the, the positions that we take and, and to make those visible. It's like looping back to where we started with the conversation, Yvonne, around like the the ways of of making those visible, if that's, and, and, and maybe that go beyond and include, you know, public like statements of intent, mm. but then the lived reality of how, you know, how the words meet the actions and a kind of like and a, you know this this age old <laughs> phrase of actions speak louder than words mm -hmm. but how to sort of implement it across our our practice of instituting which yes. is like a verb and i i um totally skipped over your question at the very beginning <laughs> which was how was bio art society working in that way maybe i sort of mm, was yeah, I, I'm very new, so I started like a month ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I, I, it's actually, you know, um, a small team, we're all part time. <clears throat> uh, and it's, I, I think, to return to this question of, you know, this economic, you know, like 
collaboration being pushed on us as an economic solution when actually it's never half the work, it's never a third the work, it's always more. Uh, it really takes time to work collectively and to make decisions together, um, to think together and to to actually even just envision the ways that we can get around a table to do that in the first place. Um, and the way that um, BioArt society is currently kind of um, structured or is financially structured is that we do a lot of EU collaboration projects, uh, which are multi-year collaboration mm -hmm. projects. And of course, we also have this way in to get some funding and resources from this kind of uh, um, thread around science and research. Um, but in these kinds of, I have to say, I've also have a, I've been very privileged in the past working on these multi-year projects. Um, I, I have worked on uh, rehearsing hospitalities, was uh, a five-year project. Um, uh, previous to that, uh, I worked at an organisation called the Scottish Sculpture Workshop, and we also did these EU collaboration projects. Um, and they're so important for this possibility for long-term engagement with also places as much as people and artists. But they also come with a lot of administration. Uh, and so they're not necessarily a very good economic model. And this idea also of scaling up, I mean, I really would like to just attend to the fact that growth is not always up, it can also be out. Mm. And we don't need more resources to do more. We need more resources to do what we're already doing. And actually, we need more resources to do less, even. Um, yes, that's, that's all I have to say about mm -hmm. that, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. On yeah. that note of more resources to do less, I'm aware also of the timing, but um, and that I don't know if Elena you wanted to no, add something there, but also to open it out if anyone wanted to to put some questions to us and and to think about the timing that we yeah that we've all spent together here. But um, I only mm. had like a tiny comment that it's um, yeah it's interesting how the collaboration directly links to funding mm. and the increasing amount of work. It's really yeah, it's interesting. We could talk about that <laughs> over a glass of wine maybe later. But yeah, yeah. If there are any questions, have a look out. This one up at the at the top. Uh, hey, thank you, uh, everyone, very much. Um, my name is Terike Hapo. I'm, I'm an artist, but uh, full disclosure, I've been on the board of the Finnish Institute until recently. <laughs> Haven't been involved in the programming. I really appreciate what you've done here. And um, I, one thing that came up, and I'm trying to also find a way <laughs> to make it a question and not just a, a ra rant, <laughs> uh, but like, um, I really appreciate, Giovanna, what you were saying about this. Um, uh, lack of um, um, that that this divide that's been going, that's been existing for so long is still exists so strongly uh, is really uh, outrageous and it shouldn't be so and I really appreciate that you brought it up and and one thing I was thinking of was that there is this difference between the state-funded organizations as, such as the institutes and the big museums that I think are now facing increasing pressure to take a stand. And now we see we have this incredibly uh, um, vile right-wing government and we can start to see what new, that neutral positions are not actually possible anymore, all the kinds of they neutral positions. Huh? Sorry? Yeah. yeah. They have never been. They have never been, exactly, <laughs> yeah. They have never been, but, that, but that what, what starts to happen now is that like 10 years ago there was a sort of a jokish um, um, uh, provocation that uh, you should, we, you know, the government shouldn't fund postmodernist fake art, you know, and that was easy to sort of then push aside. And now we can see that there's a real threat that 
uh, that art institutions uh, that are taking e explicit uh, anti-racist uh, stance or anti-fascist stance are threatened with uh, cutting their funding. And so, and I think that there's a traditional, um, um, I don't know, like like the big institutions uh, I've seen, you know, being involved in all kinds of different positions in the field that there's a um, maybe a cultural, um, like a re refusal or a resistance to for for state state funded big organizations to to think that they have the mandate or that they have the ability or like a freedom to actually have a political stance and. Um, and this is maybe like the open question now, or like, is it a question? And I, 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 we were doing this, you know, strike for the Kiasma funding, you know, and, and then we faced this issue that um, the, the, the museum was very clearly stating that they are a space for all kinds of voices. And, you know, and then the question is, well, really? Like, <laughs> all kinds of voices, what does that mean? Like, all kinds of hate speech, or like, how do we define that? But also, like, where does that, um, where, where, what kind of stance uh, can a big state-funded, uh, state-governed institution take? So I think this is like we're at a point where the questions I think were, that you, Giovanna, brought up about taking, and also what Minna brought up about taking a stance that that's the political necessity, and that there is a kind of difference between organizations that are not bound to the state in, the, in a particular way that underlines these conversations on what can be done and what should be done. And I'm not... A, I'm not working in an institution, so maybe this is an open question to a lot of the directors who are here in the room and people who are, you know, actually, uh, you know, keep in key positions to tackle with this issue of uh, of how to make these gestures of standing for something like more than, like you said, programming or like really have like a structural um, commitment to those. I hope you can somehow dig up a question from this. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Okay, I feel like I? it's a yeah, it's a question really to the room and for the long term as well. That it's not we'll, we'll, we won't resolve it in the space of this panel, but it also feels like this creates a context in which to bring these forward and to make, make visible to, or to vocalise some of these the questions for them to be carried forward beyond the scope of the here and now and of today. Um, and I mean, unless anyone do, does anyone want to do any respond to the to that. I guess it's thinking much about the sort of yeah the larger I scale. We have some people in the yes. in the space yes. that would and yeah. There's maybe can like we can hand. continue yeah. from that. Yeah. yeah. After that. But thanks, Derike. Thank you. I, I wanted to address Tariqa's really important intervention here. Uh, I'm Nitin Sahani, I'm a professor at Alto University, and uh, something a tactic that we have used, and it took some effort was to convince our own president of Alta University to make a bold statement, which he did a few days ago, uh, outlining Alta's position and principles and values. And it took many months of me harassing, well, it wasn't just me, it was many of us trying to encourage him to take that stance, but it took a coordinated effort then by the communications team at Alta, by the president then to come out with these values and principles and saying that we will not uh, and which is really unusual for a Finnish ac ac academic institute, according to what my colleagues tell me. So I think that strategy could work with Kiasma, with all the other institutions where we, as, as members of that community, in some form or fashion, can ask them to get ahead of this and put out a statement of principles. Hmm. So that when that does happen, they said, well, we're violating our own principles. We can't do that. So I, I think we have to be proactive here hmm. and not wait for this to, to come down. I'll leave it at that. Mm. I, Mina I could just say quickly that I think this returns to some of our earlier kind of thoughts on the invisible labour that gets done and who does that work. And, you know, I'm, there's also a lot of work being ha happening behind the scenes by institutions. But I think this culture of not making that public creates a situation of distrust. Uh, at the same time, I, I'm very aware of how much work it took behind the scenes to do uh, to lobby for change with the Chiasma strike and with all uh, various other kind of um, artist-led 
uh, provocations. It's a lot of work, and so I think that that responsibility is on people in the institutions uh, to do that work. And well. as you say, the conditions that it takes to get people around the table together in the first place, and maybe even like the sort of the precedent of not only the statement that was made and put, pu made public, but how you got to the point of mm. that statement being made and making that process public too. Because it's that kind of, yeah, again, the, it's the, the beneath the tip of the iceberg, yeah. which is the statement is like, what does it involve? The reproductive labor, the unseen labor, you know, the, the, the caring conditions to get to that point. And I think that's, yeah, like mm. very useful. Was there another, yeah, Mena? Yeah, I wanted to bring another example to this yeah, as a response to what Terike was saying as well. So, and, and which is from here, this building actually, Audi. So, yeah, and although like having worked in Audi and Ricardo Gatu now recently and learned how incredibly neoliberal the, the Helsinki City library system has become with algorithms and AI determining which books stay in the shelves and which go away and, and so on and so on. So nevertheless, um, coming here in uh, late Ju July to this library, here are these revolving doors. Next to these, there was a table uh, with a collection of books. Uh, there was a little, yeah, uh, and, and most of these books were about Holocaust and the Nazis. And there was a little text above it saying Auschwitz did not fall suddenly from the sky. And among these books uh, was a lot of books uh, about the true Finns. Uh, yeah. And well, yeah, then I came again a few days later. All of these books about the true Finns had disappeared from this table. Only the these historical Nazi books were there. But yeah, anyway, to me, it, it spoke about that uh, some people here in Audi as well really wanted to make a statement. Mm sort of agency of the workers within mm. and against that kind of algorithmic situation that we're sort of, yeah. Um, are there any other questions? This, yeah. No, no, we don't have no? time. No we're time. already running over. Okay, minutes, thank you. Okay. Almost, so no. okay. Okay. Well, thank you so much, <laughs> Giovanna and Elena and thank Yvonne, you. for this thank you. time talking together. And thank you all again for, for being here, for listening. Um, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, um, thank you so much, and sorry to, to cut the conversation. I know it's important, but I'm, I'm trying to stick with the schedule, as we promised, what time we finish. And we also have the empathy walk coming up, so I want to make sure that people who are going to join the walk um, have the opportunity to do that. Uh, we're approaching the end, but it's still my great privilege to invite on stage... Um, let me get my paper straight so I know where I am. So I'm going to invite on stage to give the closing words for the whole day. A person who's done a great, big, huge job with her team in order for us to be here on this day and that we've had the opportunity to enjoy all this amazing program and talks and conversations. So please welcome on stage Monica Gatua. <laughs> Yeah. Um, um, yeah. This is my Oscar moment, I guess. <laughs> um, it's uh, everyone's been thanking everyone already, so I feel like a little bit of um, a copy paste or a copycat coming and being like, "So I want to thank this and this institute and these these and these funders," even though in a way, um, just to kind of um, honor our. Um, our panels today, I don't really want to thank any institution or any funder because that is their job. Yeah. Because... <laughs> and that was my personal comment. On the behalf of the Finnish Institute Network, <laughs> I want to thank all of our um, artists, but I really want to thank all of our audiences all the, everyone here uh, online everyone because you're also part of to get coming together again um, and I hope that 
this is not the last one I and I think we should just like move forward also like let's not dwell on oh let's get together but let's move on what then and and this is also a question for the institutions funders um what now because we have been saying all these things for so many years this is not something special um it's nice like we have all the colors and everything now and and everything but but just to kind of note that now we need to go forward but what's next um that that we have to figure out together Ugh. <laughs> so i also wanted to say that um this day has been like a very big, I wouldn't say challenge, but this has been a, a big step for the institutes as well. Um, we have had people, Yako saying and all the others saying that um, when the pandemic came, um, new types of um, work modes or new types of um, uh, support needed to happen for, um, for culture and arts to stay above above the the depths um and now we kind of need to um need to go further from there as well like we floating is not enough we need to we need to stay on ground and we need we need that support and and the institution uh, the institutes have have done their best um i have a wonderful wonderful team that's been um standing not behind me but um next to me i have um wonderful wonderful artists that have been so active and so willing to come and discuss um i've had members of audience contacting me and being like oh what time is it when can i get there it says the tickets are sold out how can i come and and come on in come on in because i think that that's also part of part of how the institutes work um, in the countries that they are in. Come on in, um, come and have a dialogue with us. Um, come find us, because um, we want to find you, but there's so many of you, so who, who do we reach out? Come, come, um, yeah. And all the thank yous to, yeah, our funders. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Finnish Cultural Foundation. Thank you, Yen Yanantivihore Foundation. Uh, thank you, Biennale 23, Fotografia do Porto, Frame Contemporary Art Finland. Thank you, Showroom. Thank you, Veris Center for Arts and Politics and all the other partners. We consist of, of 16 uh, institutes around the world. And like I said, we are all unique, but our, still our aim in this world is, is to also make the world a little bit of better place with the tools that we have. Um, so let's come, uh, come together and make more tools and, and, and try, to, try to work from there. And I want to remind you, as Yanni already did, the geography of empathy is going to start from the, the front of, of Audi at 5.30. And I want to personally invite you, I'm looking everyone into their eyes, personally invite you to come and dance with us tonight the official after party at AUG in Alpila Valila. Um, you've, you'll find all the information in our website. Also go through our web website. There's wonderful, wonderful material that you couldn't see today here, but it's there. Um, you'll enjoy it at least till the end of the year since mm, funders and funding. Um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you for coming and thank you for enjoying and thank you for staying and thank you for all the questions, everything. Thank you. It's been a full day, uh, so I only will say 10 words, I would say. It's been a quiet journey from 10 o'clock in the morning until this moment and all the emotions and experiences we've had. I think I felt anger, sadness, happiness, joy, inspiration, anger again, <laughs> frustration, and wanting to do something new. So thank you all for participating and let's meet again somewhere someday. Thank you very much. Thank you.